Chapter One of A Silent Witness. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. Chapter One The Beginning of the Mystery. The history upon which I am now embarking abounds in incidents so amazing that, as I look back on them, a something approaching to scepticism contends with my vivid recollections and makes me feel almost apologetic in laying them before the reader. Some of them, indeed, are so out of character with the workaday life in which they happened that they will appear almost incredible. But none is more fraught with mystery than the experience that befell me on a certain September night in the last year of my studentship and ushered in the rest of the astounding sequence. It was past eleven o'clock when I let myself out of my lodgings at Gospel Oak. A dark night, cloudy and warm, and rather inclined to rain. But, despite the rather unfavourable aspect of the weather, I turned my steps away from the town, and walking briskly up the Highgate Road, presently turned into Millfield Lane. This was my favourite walk and the pretty winding lane, meandering so pleasantly from Lower Highgate to the heights of Hampstead, was familiar to me under all its aspects. On sweet summer mornings, when the cuckoos called from the depths of Ken Wood, when the path was spangled with golden sunlight, and saucy squirrels played hide-and-seek in the shadows under the elms, though the place was within earshot of Westminster, and within sight of the dome of St. Paul's, on winter days, when the heath wore its mantle of white, and the ring of gliding steel came up from the skaters on the pond below. On August evenings, when I would come suddenly on sequestered lovers, to our mutual embarrassment, and hurry by with ill-feigned unconsciousness. I knew all its phases, and loved them all. Even its name was delightful carrying the mind back to those more rustic days when the wits foregathered at the old flask tavern, and John Constable tramped through this very lane with his colour-box slung over his shoulder. It was very dark after I had passed the lamp at the entrance to the lane. Very silent and solitary, too. Not a soul was stirring at this hour, for the last of the lovers had long since gone home, and the place was little frequented, even in the daytime. The elms brooded over the road, shrouding it in shadows of palpable black, and their leaves whispered secretly in the soft night breeze. But the darkness, the quiet, and the solitude were restful after the long hours of study and the glare of the printed page, and I strolled on past the ghostly pond and little thatched cottage, now wrapped in silence and darkness, with a certain wistful regret that I must soon look my last on them for I had now passed all my examinations but the final fellowship, and must soon be starting my professional career in earnest. Presently a light rain began to fall. Foreseeing that I should have to curtail my walk, I stepped forward more briskly, and, passing between the posts, entered the narrowest and most secluded part of the lane. But now the rain suddenly increased, and a squall of wind drove it athwart the path. I drew up in the shelter of one of the tall oak fences by which the lane is here enclosed, and waited for the shower to pass. And as I stood with my back to the fence, pensively filling my pipe, I became for the first time sensible of the utter solitude of the place. I looked about me and listened. The lane was darker here than elsewhere, a mere trench between the high fences. I could dimly see the posts at the entrance and a group of large elms overshadowing them, in the other direction, where the lane doubled sharply upon itself, was absolute inky blackness, save where a faint glimmer from the wet ground showed the corner of the fence and the projecting stump or tree root jutting out from the corner and looking curiously like a human foot with the toes pointed upward. The rain fell steadily with a soft, continuous murmur. The leaves of the elm trees whispered together and answered the falling rain. The scotch pines above my head stirred in the breeze with a sound like the surge of the distant sea. The voices of nature, hushed and solemn, oblivious of man like the voices of the wilderness, and over all and through all, 
a profound enveloping silence i drew up closer to the fence and shivered slightly for the night was growing chill it seemed a little lighter now in the narrow trench-like lane not that the sky was less murky but because the ground was now flooded with water the posts stood out less vaguely against the background of wet road and the odd-looking stump by the corner was almost distinct and again it struck me as looking curiously like a foot a booted foot with a toe pointing upwards the chime of a church clock sounded across the heath a human voice this penetrating the desolate silence then after an interval the solemn boom of big ben came up faintly from the sleeping city midnight and time for me to go home it was of no use to wait for the rain to cease this was no passing shower but a steady drizzle that might last till morning i relit my pipe turned up my collar and prepared to plunge into the rain and as i stepped out the queer-looking stump caught my eye once more it was singularly like a foot and it was odd too that i had never noticed it before in my many rambles through the lane a sudden childish curiosity impelled me to see what it really was before i went and the next moment i was striding sharply up the sudden path of course i expected the illusion to vanish as i approached but it did not the resemblance increased as i drew nearer and i hurried forward with something more than curiosity it was a foot i realized it with a shock while i was some paces away and as i reached the corner i came upon the body of a man lying in the sharp turn of the path and the limp sprawling posture with one leg doubled under told its tale at a glance i laid my finger on his wrist it was clammy and cold and not a vestige of a pulse could i detect i struck a wax match and held it to his face the eyes were wide open and filmy staring straight up into the reeking sky the dilated pupils were insensitive to the glare of the match the eyeballs insensitive to the touch of my finger beyond all doubt the man was dead but how had he died had he simply fallen dead from some natural cause or had he been murdered there was no obvious injury and no sign of blood all that the momentary glimmer of the match showed was that his clothes were shiny with the wet a condition that might easily in the weak light mask a considerable amount of bleeding when the match went out i stood for some moments looking down on the prostrate figure as it lay with the rain beating down on the upturned face professional interest contending with natural awe of the tragic presence the former prompted me to ascertain without delay the cause of death and indeed i was about to make a more thorough search for some injury or wound when something whispered to me that it is not well to be alone at midnight in a solitary place with a dead man perchance a murdered man had there been any sign of life my duty would have been clear as it was i must act for the best with a due regard to my own safety and reaching this conclusion i turned away with a last glance at the motionless figure and set forth homeward at a rapid pace as i turned out of millfield lane into highgate rise i perceived a policeman on the opposite side of the road standing under a tree where the light from a lamp fell on a shining tarpaulin cape i crossed the road and as he civilly touched his helmet i said i'm afraid there is something wrong up the lane constable i've just seen the body of a man lying on the pathway the constable woke up very completely do you mean a dead man sir he asked yes he is undoubtedly dead i replied whereabouts did you see the body inquired the constable in the narrow part of the lane just by the stables of mansfield house that's some distance from here said the constable you had better come with me and report at the station you're sure the man was dead sir yes i have no doubt about it i am a medical man i added with some pride I had been a medical man about three months, and the sensation was still a novel one. "'Oh, are you, sir?' said the officer, with a glance at my half-fledged countenance. "'Then I suppose you examined the body?' "'Sufficiently to make sure that the man was dead, but I did not stay to ascertain the cause of death.' "'No, sir, quite so. We can find that out later.' 
As we talked, the constable swung along down the hill, without hurry, but at a pace that gave me very ample exercise, and I caught his eye from time to time, travelling over my person with obvious professional interest. When we nearly reached the bottom of the hill, there appeared suddenly on the wet road ahead a couple of figures in waterproof capes. Ah, said the constable, this is fortunate. Here is the inspector and the sergeant. That will save us the walk to the station. He accosted the officers as they approached, and briefly related what I had told him. "'You're sure the man was dead, sir?' said the inspector, scrutinizing me narrowly. "'But, there, we needn't stay here to discuss that. You run down, sergeant, and get a stretcher, and bring it along as quickly as you can. I must trouble you, sir, to come with me and show me where the body is. Lend the gentleman your cape, sergeant. You can get another at the station.' I accepted the stout cape, thankfully, for the rain still fell with steady persistency, and set forth with the inspector to retrace my steps, and as we splashed along through the deep gloom of the lane, the officer plied me with judicious questions. "'How long did you think the man had been dead?' he asked. "'Not long, I should think. The body was still quite limp.' "'You didn't see any marks of violence?' "'No, there were no obvious injuries.' "'Which way were you going when you came on the body?' "'The way we're going now, and, of course, I came straight back.' "'Did you meet or see anyone in the lane?' "'Not a soul,' I answered. He considered my answers for some time, and then came the question that I had been expecting. "'How came you to be in the lane at this time of night?' "'I was taking a walk.' I replied, as I do nearly every night. I usually finish my evening's reading about eleven, and then I have some supper and take a walk before going to bed, and I take my walk most commonly in Millfield Lane. Some of your men must remember having met me. This explanation seemed to satisfy him, for he pursued the subject no farther, and we trudged on for a while in silence. At length, as we passed through the posts into the narrow part of the lane, the inspector asked, "'We're nearly there, aren't we?' "'Yes,' I replied. "'The body is lying in the bend just ahead.' I peered into the darkness in search of the foot that had first attracted my notice, but was not yet able to distinguish it. Nor, to my surprise, could I make it out as we approached more nearly. And when we reached the corner, I stopped short in utter amazement. The body had vanished. "'What's the matter?' asked the inspector. "'I thought this was the place you meant.' "'So it is,' I answered. "'This is the place where the body was lying, here, across the path, with one foot projecting round the corner. Someone must have carried it away.' The inspector looked at me sharply for a moment. "'Well, it isn't here now,' said he. "'And if it has been taken away, it must have been taken along towards Hampstead Lane. We'd better go and see.' Without waiting for a reply, he started off along the lane at a smart double, and I followed. We pursued the windings of the lane until we emerged into the road by the lodge gates, without discovering any traces of the missing corpse or meeting any person, and then we turned back and retraced our steps. And as we once more approached the crook in the lane where I had seen the body, we heard a quick, measured tramp. "'Here comes the sergeant with the stretcher,' observed the inspector. "'And he might have saved himself the trouble.' Once more the officer glanced at me sharply, and this time with unmistakable suspicion. "'There's no body here, Robson,' he said, as the sergeant came up, accompanied by two constables carrying a stretcher. "'It seems to have disappeared.' "'Disappeared?' exclaimed the sergeant, bestowing on me a look of extreme disfavour. "'That's a rum go, sir. How could it have disappeared?' "'Ah, that's the question,' said the inspector. "'And another question is, was it ever here?' "'Are you prepared to make a sworn statement on the subject, sir?' "'Certainly I am,' I replied. "'Then,' said the inspector, "'we will take it that there was a body here. "'Put down that stretcher. "'There's a gap in the fence farther along. "'We will get through there and search the meadow.' The bearers stood the stretcher up against a tree, and we all proceeded up the lane to the place where the observant inspector had noticed the opening in the fence. The gravel, though sodden with the wet, took but the faintest impressions of the feet that trod it, 
and, though the sergeant and the two constables threw the combined light of their lanterns on the ground, we were only able to make out very faintly the occasional traces of our own footsteps. We scrutinized the break in the fence and the earth around with the utmost minuteness, but could detect no sign of any one having passed through. The short turf of the meadow, on which I had seen sheep grazing in the daytime, was not calculated to yield traces of any one passing over it, and no traces of any kind were discoverable. When we had searched the meadow thoroughly and without result, we came back into the lane and followed its devious course to the kissing gate at the Hampstead Lane entrance, and still there was no sign of anything unusual. True, there were obscure footprints in the soft gravel by the turnstile, but they told us nothing. We could not even be sure that they had not been made by ourselves on our previous visit. In short, the net result of our investigations was that the body had vanished and left no trace. "'It's a very extraordinary affair,' said the inspector, in a tone of deep discontent as we walked back. "'The body of a full-grown man isn't the sort of thing you can put in your pocket and stroll off with without being noticed, even at midnight.' Are you perfectly sure the man was really dead, and not in a faint? I feel no doubt whatever that he was dead, I replied. With all respect to you, sir, said the sergeant, I think you must be mistaken. I think the man must have been in a dead faint, and after you came away the rain must have revived him, so that he was able to get up and walk away. I don't think so, said I, though with less conviction, for, after all, it was not absolutely impossible that I should have been mistaken, since I had discovered no mortal injury, and the sergeant's suggestion was an eminently reasonable one. "'What sized man was he?' the inspector asked. "'That I couldn't say,' I answered. "'It was not easy to judge the height of a man when he's lying down, and the light was excessively dim. But I should say he was not a tall man, and rather slight in build.' "'Could you give us any description of him?' "'He was an elderly man, about sixty, I should think, "'and he appeared to be a clergyman or a priest, "'for he wore a Roman collar with a narrow dark stripe up the front. "'He was clean-shaven, and, I think, wore a clerical suit of black. "'A tall hat was lying on the ground close by, "'and a walking-stick which looked like a malacca, "'but I couldn't see it very well, as he'd fallen on it, "'and most of it was hidden.' "'And you saw all this by the light of one wax match,' said the inspector. "'You made pretty good use of your eyes, sir.' "'A man isn't much use in my profession if he doesn't,' I replied, rather stiffly. "'No, that's true,' the inspector agreed. "'Well, I must ask you to give us the full particulars at the station, "'and we shall see if anything fresh turns up. "'I'm sorry to keep you hanging about in the wet, but it can't be helped.' "'Of course it can't,' said I, and we trudged on in silence until we reached the station, which looked quite cheerful and homelike, despite the grim blue lamp above the doorway. "'Well, doctor,' said the inspector, when he had read over my statement and I had affixed my signature, "'if anything turns up, you'll hear from us. But I doubt if we shall hear anything more of this. Dead or alive, the man seems to have vanished completely. Perhaps the sergeant's right after all.' and your dead man is at this moment comfortably tucked up in bed. Good night, doctor, and thank you for all the trouble you've taken. By the time that I reached my lodgings, I was tired out and miserably cold, so cold that I was fain to brew myself a jorum of hot grog in my shaving pot. As a natural result, I fell fast asleep as soon as I got to bed, and slept on until the autumn sunshine poured in through the slats of the Venetian blind. End of chapter 1and, as my wits returned with a rapidity that is natural to the young and healthy, the surprising events of the previous night reconstituted themselves, and once more set a-going the train of speculation. 
Vividly I saw with my mind's eye the motionless figure lying limp and inert, with the pitiless rain beating down on it, the fixed pupils, the insensitive eyeballs, the pulseless wrist, and the sprawling posture. And again I saw the streaming path, void of its dreadful burden, the suspicious inspector, the incredulous sergeant, and the unanswerable questions formulated themselves anew. Had I, after all, mistaken a living man for a dead body? It was in the highest degree improbable, and yet it was not impossible. Or had the body been spirited away, without leaving a trace? That also was highly improbable, and yet not absolutely impossible. The two contending improbabilities cancelled one another. Each was as unlikely as the other. I turned the problem over again and again as I shaved and took my bath. I pondered upon it over a late and leisurely breakfast. But no conclusion emerged from these reflections. The man, living or dead, had been lying motionless in the lane all the time that I was sheltering, and probably for some time before. In the interval of my absence he had vanished. These were actual facts despite the open incredulity of the police. How he had come there, what had occasioned his death or insensibility, how he had disappeared, and whither he had gone, were questions to which no answer seemed possible. The fatigues of the previous night had left me somewhat indolent. There was no occasion for me to go to the hospital today. It was vacation time, the school was closed, the teaching staff were mostly away, and there was little doing in the wards. I decided to take a holiday and spend a quiet day rambling about the heath, and, having formed this resolution, I filled my pipe, slipped a sketchbook into my pocket, and set forth. Automatically my feet turned towards Millfield Lane. It was, as I have said, my usual walk, and on this morning, with last night's recollections fresh in my mind, it was natural that I should take my way thither. Very different was the aspect of the lane this morning from that which I had last looked upon. The gloom and desolation of the night had given place to the golden sunshine of a lovely autumn day. The elms, clothed already in the sober livery of the waning year, sighed with pensive reminiscence of the summer that was gone. The ponds repeated the warm blue of the sky, and the lane itself was a vista of flickering sunlight and cool, reposeful shadow. The narrow continuation beyond the posts was wrapped, as always, in a sombre shade, save where a gleam of yellow light streamed through a chink between the boards of the fence. I made my way straight to the spot where the body had lain and stooped over it, examining each pebble with the closest scrutiny. But not a trace remained. The hard, gravelly soil retained no impression either of the body or even of our footsteps, and as for the stain of blood, if there had ever been any, it would have been immediately removed by the falling rain for the ground here had a quite appreciable slope, and must have been covered last night by a considerable flowing stream. I went on to the break in the fence, it was on the right-hand side of the path, and was at once discouraged by the aspect of the ground, for even our rough tramplings had left hardly a trace behind. After an aimless walk across the meadow, now occupied by a flock of sheep, I returned to the lane and walked slowly back past the place where I had sheltered from the rain. And then it was that I discovered the first hint of any clue to the mystery. I had retraced my steps some little distance past the spot where I had seen the body, when my eye was attracted by a darkish streak on the upper part of the high fence. It was quite faint, and not at all noticeable on the weather-stained oak, but it chanced to catch my eye, and I stopped to examine it. The fence which bore it was the opposite one to that in which the break occurred, and, since I had sheltered under it, the side of it which looked towards the lane must have been the lee side, and thus less exposed to the rain. I looked at the stain attentively. It extended from the top of the fence, which was about seven feet high, halfway to the ground, fading away gradually in all directions. The colour was a dull brown, and the appearance very much that of blood which had run down a wet surface. The board which bore the stain was traversed by a vertical crack near one edge, so that I was able to break off a small piece without much difficulty, and, on examining that portion of the detached piece which had formed the side of the crack, I found it covered with a brownish-red, shiny substance, which I felt little doubt was dried blood, here protected by the crack, and so less altered by contact with water. 
Naturally, my next proceeding was to scrutinize very carefully the ground immediately beneath the stain. At the foot of the fence, a few tussocks of grass and clumps of undergrown weeds struggled for life in the deep shade. The latter certainly had, on close examination, the appearance of having been trodden on, though it was not very evident. But while I was considering an undoubted bruise on the stalk of a little dead nettle, my eye caught the glint of some bright object among the leaves. I picked it out eagerly and held it up to look at it. And a very curious object it was. Evidently an article of jewellery of some kind, but quite unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It appeared to be a little elongated gold case with eight sides and terminating at either end in a blunt octagonal pyramid with a tiny ring at its apex so that it seemed to have been part of a necklace. Of the eight flat sides, six were ornamented with sunk quatrefoils, four on each side. The other two sides were plain, except that each had a row of letters engraved on it. A. M. D. G. on one side, and S. V. D. P. on the other. There was no hole mark, and, as far as I could see, no means of opening the little case. It seemed to have been suspended by a thin silk cord, a portion of which remained attached to one ring, and showed a frayed end where it had broken or chafed through. I wrapped the little object and the detached fragment of the fence in my handkerchief, for I had broken off the latter with the idea of testing it chemically for blood pigment, and then resumed my investigations. The appearances suggested that the body had been lifted over the fence, and the question arose, what was on the other side? I listened attentively for a few seconds, and then, hearing no sound of footsteps, I grasped the top of the fence, gave a good spring, and hoisting myself up, sat astride and looked about me. The fence skirted the margin of a small lake much overgrown with weeds, amidst which I could see a couple of water-hands making off in alarm at my appearance, and beyond the lake rose the dark mass of Kenwood. The ground between the fence and the lake was covered with high, reedy grass which, immediately below my perch, bore very distinct impressions of feet, and an equally distinct set of tracks led away towards the wood, or from the wood to the fence, it was impossible to say which, but in any case, as there were no other tracks, it was certain that the person who made them had climbed over the fence. I dropped down on the grass, and, having examined the ground attentively without discovering anything fresh, set off to follow the tracks. For some distance they continued through high grass in which the impressions were very distinct. Then they entered the wood, and here also, in the soft humus, lightly sprinkled with fallen leaves, the footprints were deep and easy to follow. But presently they struck a path, and, as they did not reappear on the farther side, it was evident that the unknown person had proceeded along it. The path was an old one, well made of hard gravel, and, where it passed through the deeper shade of the wood, was covered with velvety moss and grey-green lichen, on which I made out with some difficulty the imprints of feet. But these were no longer distinct. They did not form a connected track, nor was it possible to distinguish them from the footprints of other persons who might have passed along the path. Even these I soon lost, where I had halted irresolutely under a noble beech that rose from a fantastic coil of roots, and was considering how, if at all, I should next proceed, when there appeared round a curve of the path a man in court breeches and gaiters, evidently a keeper. He touched his hat civilly, and ventured to inquire my business. "'I am afraid I have no business here at all,' I replied, for I did not think it expedient to tell him what had brought me into the wood. "'I suppose I am trespassing.' "'Well, sir, it is private property.' he rejoined, and being so near London we have to be rather particular. Perhaps you would like me to show you the way out on to the heath. I accepted his offer with many thanks for his courteous method of ejecting a trespasser, and we walked together through the beautiful woodland until the path terminated at a rustic turnstile. That will be your way, sir, he said, as he led me out, indicating a track that led down to the Vale of Health. I thanked him once more, and then asked, is that a private house, or does it belong to your estate? I pointed to a small house or a large cottage that stood within a fenced enclosure not far from the edge of the wood. That, sir, he replied, was formerly a keeper's lodge, 
it is now let for a short term to an artist gentleman who is making some pictures of the heath but i expect it will be pulled down before long as there is some talk of the county council taking over that piece of land to add to the public grounds good morning sir and the keeper with a parting salute turned back into the wood as i took my way homeward by the highgate ponds i meditated on the relation of my new discoveries to the mystery of the preceding night it was a strange affair and sinister withal that the tracks led from the lane to the wood and not from the wood to the lane i felt firmly convinced and equally so that the body of the unknown priest or clergyman had undoubtedly been spirited away but whither had it been carried presumably to some sequestered spot in the wood and what better hiding-place could be found there buried in the soft leaf mould it might lie undisturbed for centuries covered only the deeper as each succeeding autumn shed its russet burden on the unknown grave and what i wondered was the connection between this mysterious tragedy and the queer little object that i had picked up perhaps there was none its presence at that particular spot might be nothing but a coincidence i took it from my handkerchief and examined it afresh it was a very curious object as to its use or meaning i could only form vague surmises perhaps it was some kind of a locket enclosing a wisp of hair the hair perhaps of some dead child or wife or husband or even lover it was impossible to say of course this question could be settled by taking it to pieces but i was loath to injure the pretty little bauble besides it was not mine in fact i felt that i ought to notify publicly that i had found it though the circumstances did not make this very advisable but if it had any connection with the tragedy what was the nature of that connection had it dropped from the dead man or from the murderer as i assumed the other man to be either was equally possible though the two possibilities had very different values then the question arose as to what course i should pursue clearly it would be my duty to inform the police of the mark on the fence and the tracks through the grass but should i hand over the mysterious trinket to them it seemed the correct thing to do and yet there might after all be no connection between it and the crime in the end i left the matter to be decided by the attitude of the police themselves i called at the station on my way home and furnished the inspector with an account of my new discoveries of which he made a careful note assuring me that the affair should be looked into but his manner expressed frank disbelief and was even a trifle hostile and his emphatic request that i would abstain from mentioning the matter to any one left me in no doubt that he regarded both my communications as wild delusions if not as a deliberate hoax consequently though i frequently reproached myself afterwards with the omission i said nothing about the trinket and when i left the station i carried it in my pocket no communication on the subject of this mysterious affair ever reached me from the police that they did actually make some perfunctory investigations i learned later as will appear in this narrative but they gave no publicity to the affair and they sought no further information from me for my own part i could naturally never forget so strange an experience but time and the multitudinous interests of my opening life tended to push it farther into the background of memory and there it might have remained for ever had not subsequent events drawn it once more from its obscurity end of chapter two chapter three of a silent witness by r austin freeman this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by anna simon chapter three who is sylvia the winter session had commenced at the hospital but at hampstead the month of october had set in with something like a return to summer it is true that the trees had lost something of their leafy opulence and that here and there amidst the sober green patches of russet and gold had made their appearance as if nature's colour orchestra were tuning up for the final symphony but meanwhile the sun shone brightly and with a genial heat and if day by day he fell farther from the zenith there was nothing to show it but the lengthening noonday shadows the warmer blue of the sky and the more rosy tint of the clouds that sailed across it 
other and more capable pens than mine have set forth the charm of autumn and the beauties of hampstead queen of suburbs the world's metropolis therefore will i refrain and only note as relevant to the subject the fact that on many a day when the work of the hospital was in full swing i might have been seen playing truant very agreeably on the inexhaustible heath or in the lanes and fields adjacent thereto in truth i was taking the final stage of my curriculum rather lazily having worked hard enough in the earlier years and being still too young by several months to be admitted to the fellowship of the college of surgeons promising myself that when the weather broke i would settle down in earnest to the winter's work i have mentioned that millfield lane was one of my favourite haunts indeed from my lodgings it was the most direct route to the heath and i passed along it almost daily and never now without my thoughts turning back to that rainy night when i had found the dead or unconscious man lying across the narrow footway one morning as i passed the spot it occurred to me to make a drawing of the place in my sketch-book that i might have some memorial of that strange adventure the pictorial possibilities of the lane just here were not great but by taking my stand at the turn on the very spot where i had seen the body lying i was able to arrange a simple composition which was satisfactory enough i am no artist a neat and intelligible drawing is the utmost that i can produce but even this modest degree of achievement may be very useful as i had discovered many a time in the wards or laboratories indeed i have often been surprised that the instructors of our youth attach such small value to the power of graphic expression and it came in usefully now though in a way that was unforeseen and not fully appreciated at the moment i had dealt adequately with the fence the posts the tree trunks and other well-defined forms and was beginning a less successful attack on the foliage when i heard a light quick step approaching from hampstead lane intuition if there is such a thing fitted the footstep with a personality and for once in a way was right as the newcomer reached the sharp bend of the path i saw a girl of about my own age simply and serviceably dressed and carrying a pochard box and a small camp-stool she was not an entire stranger to me i had met her often in the lane and on the heath so often in fact that we developed that profound unconsciousness of one another's existence that almost amounts to recognition and had wondered vaguely who she was and what sort of work she did on the panels in that mysterious box as i drew back to make way for her she brushed past with a single quick inquisitive glance at my sketch-book and went on her way looking very much alive and full of business i watched her as she tripped down the lane and passed between the posts out into the sunlight beyond to vanish behind the trunks of the elms then i returned to my sketch and my struggles to express foliage with a touch somewhat less suggestive of a birch broom when i had finished my drawing i sauntered on rather aimlessly speculating for the hundredth time on the meaning of those discoveries of mine in this very lane was it possible that the man whom i had seen was not dead but merely insensible i could not believe it the whole set of circumstances the aspect of the body the blood-stain on the fence the tracks through the high grass and the mysterious gold trinket were opposed to any such belief yet on the other hand one would think that a man could not disappear unnoticed this was no tramp or nameless vagrant he was a clergyman or a priest a man who would be known to a great number of persons and whose disappearance must surely be observed at once and be the occasion of very stringent inquiries but no inquiries had apparently been made i had seen no notice in the papers of any missing cleric and clearly the police had heard nothing or they would have looked me up the whole affair was enveloped in the profoundest mystery dead or alive the man had vanished utterly and whether he was dead or alive the mystery was equally beyond solution these reflections brought me almost unconsciously to another of my favourite walks the pretty footpath from the heath to temple fortune i had crossed the stile and stepped off the path to survey the pleasant scene when my eye was attracted by a number of streaks of alien colour on the leaves of a burdock stooping down i perceived that they were smears of oil paint and inferred that someone had cleaned a pallet on the herbits an inference that was confirmed a moment later by what looked like the handle of a brush projecting from a clump of nettles when i drew it out however it proved to be not a brush but a very curious knife with a blade shaped like a diminutive and attenuated trowel evidently a painting knife and also evidently home-made 
at least in part, for the tang had been thrust into a short, stout brush-handle and secured with a whipping of waxed thread. I dropped it into my outside breast-pocket and went on my way, wondering if by chance it might have been dropped by my fair acquaintance, and the thought was still in my mind when its object hove in sight. Turning a bend in the path, I came on her quite suddenly, perched on a little camp-stool in the shadow of the hedge, with the open sketching-book on her knees, working away with an industry and concentration that seemed to rebuke my own idleness. Indeed, she was so much engrossed with her occupation that she did not notice me until I stepped off the path and approached with the knife in my hand. "'I wonder,' said I, holding it out and raising my cap, "'if this happens to be your property. I picked it up just now among the nettles near the barn.' She took the knife from me and looked at it inquisitively. "'No,' she replied. "'It isn't mine, but I think I know whose it is. I suspect it belongs to an artist who has been doing a good deal of work about the heath. You may have seen him.' "'I've seen several artists working about here during the summer. What was this one like?' "'Well,' she answered with a smile, "'he was like an artist. Very much like. Quite the orthodox get-up. White-brimmed head, rather long hair and a ragged beard. And he wore sketching spectacles, half-moon-shaped things, you know, and kid gloves, which were not quite so orthodox. "'Very inconvenient, I should think.' "'Not so very.' I work in gloves myself in the cold weather, or if the midges are very troublesome. You soon get used to the feel of them, and the man I am speaking of wouldn't find them in the way at all, because he works almost entirely with painting knives. That is what made me think that this knife was probably his. He had several, I know, and very skilfully he used them, too. You have seen his work, then? Well, she admitted, I am afraid I descended once or twice to play the snooper. You see, his method of handling interested me. "'May I ask what a snooper is?' I inquired. "'Don't you know? It's a student's slang name for the kind of person who makes some transparent pretext for coming off the path and passing behind you to get a look at your picture by false pretenses.' For an instant there flashed into my mind the suspicion that she was administering a quiet backhander, and I rejoined hastily, "'I hope you are not including me in the genus Snooper.' She laughed softly. "'It did sound rather like it. But I'll give you the benefit of the doubt in consideration of your finding the knife, which you'd better keep in trust for the owner.' "'Won't you keep it? You know the probable owner by sight, and I don't, and meanwhile you might experiment with it yourself.' "'Very well,' she replied, dropping it into her brush tray. "'I'll keep it for the present at any rate.' There was a brief pause, and then I ventured to remark, "'That looks a very promising sketch of yours, and how well the subject comes.' "'I'm glad you like it,' she replied, quite simply, viewing her work with her head on one side. "'I want it to turn out well, because it's a commission, and commissions for small oil paintings are rare and precious.' "'Do you find small oil pictures very difficult to dispose of?' I asked. "'Not difficult. Impossible as a rule.' But I don't try now. I copy my oil sketches in watercolour, with modifications to suit the market. Again there was a pause, and as her brush wandered towards the palette, it occurred to me that I had stayed as long as good manners permitted. Accordingly, I raised my cap, and, having expressed the hope that I had not greatly hindered her, prepared to move away. "'Oh, not at all,' she answered. "'And thank you for the knife, though it isn't mine. Or, at any rate, wasn't.' Good morning. With this, and a pleasant smile and a little nod, she dismissed me, and once more I went my idle and meditative way. It had been quite a pleasant little adventure. There is always something rather interesting in making the acquaintance of a person whom one has known some time by sight, but who is otherwise an unknown quantity. The voice, the manner, and the little revelations of character which confirm or contradict previous impressions are watched with interest as they develop themselves and fill in, one by one, the blank spaces of the total personality. I had, as I have said, often met this industrious maiden in my walks, and had formed the opinion that she looked a rather nice girl, an opinion that was probably influenced by her unusual good looks and graceful carriage, and a rather nice girl she had turned out to be, very dignified and self-possessed, but quite simple and frank, 
though, to be sure, her gracious reception of me had probably been due to my sketchbook. She had taken me for a kindred spirit. She had a pleasant voice and a faultless accent, with just a hint of the fine lady in her manner, but I liked her none the less for that, and her name was a pretty name too, if I had guessed it correctly, for on the inside of the lid of her box, which was partly uncovered by the upright panel, I had read the letters S.Y.L., the panel hid the rest, but the name could hardly be other than Sylvia. And what more charming and appropriate name could be bestowed upon a comely young lady who spent her days amidst the woods and fields of my beloved Hampstead? Regaling myself with this somewhat small beer, I sauntered on along the grassy lane between hedgerows that in the summer had been spangled with wild roses, and that were now gay with the big oval berries, sleek and glossy and scarlet, like overgrown beads of red coral. Away, across the fields to Golders Green, and thence by Millfield Lane, back to my lodgings at Gospel Oak, and to my landlady, Mrs. Blunt, who had a few plaintive words to say respecting the disastrous effects of unpunctuality, and the resulting prolonged heat, on mutton cutlets and fried potatoes. It had been an idle morning, and apparently void of significant events, but yet, when I look back on it, I see a definite thread of causation running through its simple happenings, and I realize that, all unthinking, I had strung on one more bead to the chaplet of my destiny. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 4 Septimus Maddock, deceased. It was getting well on into November when I strolled one afternoon into the hospital museum, not with any specific object, but rather vaguely in search of something to do. During the last few days I had developed a slight revival of industry, which had coincided, oddly enough, with a marked deterioration of the weather. And, pathology being my weakest point, the museum had seemed to call me, though not very loudly, I fear, to browse amongst its multitudinous jars and dry preparations. There was only one person in the great room, but he was a very important person, being none other than our lecturer on medical jurisprudence, Dr. John Thorndyke. He was seated at a small table whereon was set out a collection of jars and a number of large photographs, of which he appeared to be making a catalogue. But intent as he was on his occupation, he looked up as I entered, and greeted me with a genial smile. "'What do you think of my little collection, Jardine?' he asked, as I approached deferentially. Before replying, I ran a vaguely inquiring eye over the group of objects on the table, and was mighty little enlightened thereby. It was certainly a queer collection. There was a flat jar which contained a series of five differently coloured mice, another with a similar series of three rats a human foot, a hand manifestly deformed, a series of four fowl's heads, and a number of photographs of plants. "'It looks,' I replied at length, "'like what the auctioneers would call a miscellaneous lot.' "'Yes,' Dr. Thorndyke agreed. "'It is a miscellaneous collection, in a sense. But there is a connecting idea. It is illustrates certain phenomena of inheritance which were discovered and described by Mendel. Mendel? I exclaimed. Who is he? I never heard of him. I dare say not, said Thorndyke, though he published his results before you were born. But the importance of his discoveries is only now beginning to be appreciated. I suppose, said I, the subject is too large and complex for a short explanation to be possible. The subject is a large one, of course, he replied. But, put in a nutshell, Mendel's great discovery amounts to this, that, whereas certain characters are inherited only partially and fade off gradually in successive generations, certain other characters are inherited completely and pass unchanged from generation to generation. To take a couple of illustrative cases, if a negro marries a European, the offspring are mulattoes, forms intermediate between the negro and the European. If a mulatto marries a European, 
the offspring are quadroons, another intermediate forms, and the next generation gives us the octoroon, intermediate again between the quadroon and the European. And so, from generation to generation, the Negro character gradually fades away and finally disappears. But there are other characters which are inherited entire or not at all, and such characters appear in pairs which are positive or negative to one another. Sex is a case in point. A male marries a female, and the offspring are either male or female, never intermediate. The sex character of only one parent is inherited, and it is inherited completely. The characters of maleness or femaleness pass down unchanged through the ages with no tendency to diminish or to shade off into one another. That is a case of Mendelian inheritance. I ran my eyes over the collection, and they presently lighted on the rather abnormal-looking foot, hanging, white and shriveled, in the clear spirit. I lifted the jar from the table, and then, noticing for the first time that the foot had a supernumerary toe, I inquired what point the specimen illustrated. "'That six-toed foot,' Thorndyke replied, "'is an example of a deformity that is transmitted unchanged for an indefinite number of generations.' This brachydactylous hand is another instance. The brachydactyly reappears in the offspring either completely or not at all. There are no intermediate conditions. He picked up the jar, and, having wiped the glass with a duster, exhibited the hand which was suspended within. And a strange-looking hand it was, broad and stumpy, like the hand of a mole. There seem to be only two joints to each finger, I said. Yes. The fingers are all thumbs, and the thumb is only a demi-thumb. A joint is suppressed in each digit. It must make the hand very clumsy and useless, I remarked. So one would think. It isn't exactly the type of hand for a list or a paganini. And yet we mustn't assume too much. I once saw an armless man copying pictures in a Luxembourg, and copying them very well, too. He held his brush with his toes, and he was so handy with his feet that he not only painted really dexterously, but managed to take his hat off to a lady with quite a fine flourish. So you see, Jardine, it is not the hand that matters, but rather the brain that actuates it. A very indifferent hand will serve if the motor centres are of the right sort. He replaced the jar on the table, and then, after a short pause, turning quickly to me, he asked, "'What are you doing at present, Jardine?' "'Principally idling, sir,' I replied. "'And not a bad thing to do, either,' he rejoined with a smile. "'If you do it thoroughly and don't keep it up too long, how would you like to take charge of a practice for a week or so?' "'I don't know that I should particularly care to, sir,' I answered. "'Why not? It would be a useful experience.' and would bring you useful knowledge, knowledge that you have got to acquire sooner or later. Hospital conditions, you know, are not normal conditions. General practice is normal medical practice, and the sooner you get to know the conditions of the great world, the better for you. If you stick to the wards too long, you'll get to be like the nurses, who seem to think that all the world's the hospital and men and women only patients. I reflected for a few moments. It was perfectly true. I was a qualified medical man, and yet of the ordinary routine of private practice I had not the faintest knowledge. To me, all sick people were either inpatients or outpatients. "'Had you any particular practice in your mind, sir?' I asked. "'Yes. I met one of our old students just now. He is at his wit's end to find a locum tenens. He has to go away to-night or to-morrow morning, but he can't get anyone to look after his work. Won't you go to his relief?' It's an easy practice, I believe. I turned the question over in my mind, and finally decided to try the venture. That's right, said Dr. Thorndyke. You'll help a professional brother at any rate, and pick up a little experience. Our friend's name is Batson, and he lives in Jacob Street, Hampstead Road. I'll write it down. He handed me a slip of paper with the address on it, and wished me success. I started at once from the hospital, already quite elated as is the way of the youthful, at the prospect of a new experience. Dr. Batson's establishment in Jacob Street was modest to the verge of dinginess. 
but Jacob Street itself was dingy, and so was the immediate neighbourhood, a district of tall, grimy houses that might easily have seen better days. However, Dr. Betts and himself were spruce enough, and in excellent spirits at my arrival, as was evident when he bounced into the room with a jovial greeting, bringing in with him a faint aroma of sherry. "'Delighted to see you, doctor!' he exclaimed in his large, brisk voice. That doctor was a diplomatic hit on his part. They don't call newly qualified man doctor at the hospital. I met Thorndyke this morning and told him of my predicament. A busy man is the great unraveller, but never too busy to do a kindness to his friends. Can you take over tonight?' "'I could,' said I. "'Then do. I want particularly to be off by the 8.30 from Liverpool Street. Drop in and have some grub about 6.30. I shall have polished off the day's work by then, and you'll just come in for the evening consultations. "'Are there any cases that you'll want me to see with you?' I asked. "'Oh, no,' Batson replied, rather airily, I thought. "'They're all plain sailing. There's a typhoid, he's doing well, fourth week, and there's a tonsillitis, and a psoas abscess. That's rather tedious, but still, it's improving. And an old woman with a liver. You won't have any difficulty with them. There's only one queer case, a heart.' valvular i asked no not valvular i can tell you that much i know what it isn't but i'm hanged if i know what it is chappy complains of pain shortens of breath faintness and so on but i can't find anything to account for it heart sounds all right pulse quite good no dropsy no nothing seems like malingering but i don't see why he should malinger i think i'll get you to drop in this evening and have a look at him are you keeping him in bed i asked yes said batson i am now not that his general condition seems to demand it, but he's had one or two fainting attacks, and yesterday he must needs fall down flop in his bedroom when there was nobody there, and, by way of making things more comfortable, he drops his medicine bottle and falls on the fragments. He might have killed himself, you know, Batson added in an aggrieved tone. As it was, a long splinter from the bottom of the bottle stuck into his back and made quite a deep little wound. So I've kept him in bed since, out of harm's way." and there he is, deuced sorry for himself. But, as far as I can make out, without a single tangible symptom. No facial signs, nothing unusual in his colour or expression. Batson laughed and tapped his gold-rimmed spectacles. Ah, there you are. When you've got minus 5D and some irregular astigmatism, and a pair of glasses that don't correct it, all human beings look pretty much alike. A trifle sketchy, don't you know? I didn't see anything unusual in his face, but you might. Time will show. Now you cut along and fetch your traps, and I'll skip round and polish off the sufferers. He launched me into the outer gradiness of Jacob Street, and bounced off in the direction of Cumberland Market, leaving me to pursue my way to my lodgings at Gospel Oak. As I threaded the teeming streets of Camden Town, I meditated on the new experience that was opening to me, and, with youthful egotism, I already saw myself making a brilliant diagnosis of an obscure heart case. Also, I reflected with some surprise on the calm view that Batson took of his defective eyesight. A certain type of painter, as I had observed, finds in semi-blindness a valuable gift which helps him to eliminate trivial detail and to impart a noble breadth of effect to his pictures. But to a doctor, no such self-delusion would seem possible. Visual acuteness is the most precious item in his equipment." I crammed into a large Gladstone bag the bare necessaries for a week's stay, together with a few indispensable instruments, and then mounted the jingling horse-tram of those pre-electric days, which, in due course, deposited me at the end of Jacob Street, Hampstead Road. Dr. Batson had not returned from his round when I arrived, but a few minutes later he burst into the surgery, humming an air from the Mikado. "'Ha! Here you are, then, punctual to the minute!' He hung his hat on a peg laid his visiting list on the desk of the dispensing counter, and began to compound medicine with the speed of a prestidigitator, talking volubly all the time. "'That's for the old woman with the liver, Mrs. Much, Cumberland Market. You'll see her prescription in the day-book. Suppose you don't know how to wrap up a bottle of medicine. Better watch me. This is the way.' He slapped the bottle down on a square of cut paper, gave a few dexterous twiddles of his fingers, and held out for my inspection a little white parcel like the mummy case of a deceased medicine bottle. "'It's quite easy when you've had a little practice,' he said, deftly sticking the ends down with sealing wax. "'But you'll make a frightful mucker of it at first. Which prophecy was duly fulfilled that very evening. "'What time had I better see that heart case?' said I. 
Oh, you won't have to see it at all. Man's dead. Message left half an hour ago. Pity, isn't it? I should have liked to hear what you thought of him. Must have been fatty hard. I'll write out the certificate while I think of it. Maggie, where's that note that Mrs. Samway left? The question was roared out vaguely through the open door to a servant of unknown whereabouts, and resulted in the appearance of a somewhat scraggy housemaid bearing an opened note. "'Here we are,' said Batson, snatching the note out of its envelope and opening the book of certificate forms. "'Septimus Maddock was the chappie's name. Age fifty-one. Address, twenty-three Gayton Street. Cause of death? That's just what I should like to know. Primary cause, secondary causes. I wish these infernal government clerks had got something better to do than fill printed forms with silly conundrums. I shall put morbus cordis. That ought to be enough for them.' Mrs. Samway, that's his landlady, you know, will probably call for the certificate during the evening. "'Aren't you going to inspect the body?' I asked. "'Lord, no, why should I? It isn't necessary, you know. I'm not an undertaker. Wish I was. Dead people a good deal more profitable than live ones.' "'But surely,' I exclaimed, "'the death ought to be verified. Why, the man may not be dead at all.' "'I know,' said Batson, scribbling away like a minor poet. But that isn't my business. Business of the law. Law wastes your time with a heap of silly questions that don't matter, and leaves out the question that does. Asks exact time when I last saw him alive, which doesn't matter a hang, and doesn't ask whether I saw him dead. Bumble was right. Law's an ass. But still, I persisted, leaving the legal requirements out of consideration, oughtn't you, for your own sake, and as a public duty, to verify the death? "'Supposing the man were not really dead?' "'That would be awkward for him,' said Batson, "'and awkward for me, too, if he came to life before they buried him. "'But it doesn't really happen in real life. "'Premature burial only occurs in novels.' "'His easy-going confidence jarred on me considerably. "'How could he, or anyone else, know what happened?' "'I don't see how you arrive at that,' I objected. "'It could only be proved by wholesale disinterment.' and the fact remains that, if you don't verify a reported death, you have no security against premature burial, or even cremation. Batson started up and stared at me, his wide-open, pale blue eyes looking ridiculously small through his deep, concave spectacles. "'By Jove!' he exclaimed. "'I'm glad you mentioned that, about cremation, I mean, because that is what will probably happen. I witnessed the chappie's will a couple of days ago.' and I remember now that one of the clauses stipulated that his body should be cremated. So I shall have to verify the death for the purpose of the cremation certificate. We'd better pop round and see him at once. With characteristic impulsiveness, he sprang to his feet, snatched his head from its peg, and started forth, leaving me to follow. "'Beastly nuisance, these special regulations,' said Batson, as he ambled briskly up the street. "'Give a lot of trouble and cause a lot of delay.' "'Isn't the ordinary death certificate sufficient in a case of cremation?' I asked. "'For purpose of law it is, though there is some talk of new legislation on the subject. But the company are a law unto themselves. They have made the most infernally stringent regulations, and as there is no crematorium near London excepting the one at Woking, you have to abide by their rules. And that reminds me—' Here Batson halted and scowled at me ferociously through his spectacles. "'Reminds you?' I repeated. "'That they require a second death certificate, signed by a man with certain special qualifications.' He stood a while frowning and muttering under his breath, and then suddenly turned and bounced off in a new direction. "'Going to catch the other chappie and take him with us,' he explained, as he darted out into the Hampstead Road. "'Be off my mind, then. A fellow named O'Connor, assistant physician to the North London Hospital. He'll do if you can catch him at home. If not, you'll have to manage him.' Batson looked at his watch, holding it within four inches of his nose, and broke into a trot as we entered a quiet square. Halfway up he halted at a door which bore a modest brass plate inscribed Dr. O'Connor, and seizing the bell-knob, worked it vigorously in and out as if it were the handle of an air-pump. "'Doctor in?' he demanded briskly of a startled housemaid, and, without waiting for an answer, he darted into the hall, down the whole length of which he staggered, executing a sort of sword-dance having caught his toe on an unobserved doormat. The doctor was in, and he shortly appeared in evening dress with an overcoat on his arm, and apparently in as great a hurry as Batson himself. 
"'Won't it do tomorrow?' he asked, when Batson had explained his difficulties and the service required. "'Might as well come now,' said Batson persuasively. "'Won't take a minute, and then I can go away in peace.' "'Very well,' said O'Connor, wriggling into his overcoat. "'You go along, and I'll follow in a few minutes. I've got to look in on a patient on my way up west, and shall be late for my appointment as it is. Write the address on my card here.' He held out a card to my principal, and when the letter had scribbled the address on it, he bustled out and vanished up the square. Batson followed at the same headlong speed, and again overlooking the mat, came out on the pavement like an ill-started sprinter. Gayton Street, at which we shortly arrived, was a grey and dingy side street exactly like a score of others in the same locality, and number 23 differed from the rest of the seedy-looking houses in no respect, save that it was perhaps a shade more dingy. The door was opened in answer to Batson's indecorously brisk knock by a woman, or perhaps I should say a lady, who at once admitted us, and to whom Batson began, without preface, to explain the situation. "'I got your note, Mrs. Samway. I was going to bring my friend here round to see the patient. Very unfortunate affair. Very sad. Unexpected, too. Didn't seem particularly bad yesterday. What time did it happen?' "'I can't say exactly,' was the reply. He seemed quite comfortable when I looked in on him the last thing at night, but when I went in about seven this morning, he was dead. I should have let you know sooner, but I was expecting you to call. Hmm, yes, said Batson. Very unfortunate. By the way, Mr. Maddock desired that his remains should be cremated, I think. Yes, so my husband tells me. He is the executor of the will, you remember, in the absence of any relatives. All Mr. Maddock's relations seem to be in America. "'Have you got the certificate forms?' asked Batson. "'Yes. My husband got all the papers from the undertaker this afternoon.' "'Very well, Mrs. Samway. Then we'll just take a look at the body. Have to certify that I've seen it, you know.' Mrs. Samway ushered us into a sitting-room where she had apparently been working alone, for an unfinished mourning garment of some kind lay on the table. Leaving us here, she went away and presently returned with a sheaf of papers and a lighted candle— when we rose and followed her to a back room on the ground floor. It was a smallish room, sparely furnished, with heavy curtains drawn across the window, and by one wall a bed on which was a motionless figure covered by a sheet. Our conductress stood the candlestick on a table by the bed and stepped back to make way for Batson, who drew back the sheet and looked down on the body in his peering, near-sighted fashion. The deceased seemed to be a rather frail-looking man of about fifty, but beyond the fact that he was clean-shaven, I could form very little idea of his appearance, since, in addition to the usual bandage under the chin to close the mouth, a tape had been carried round the head to secure a couple of pads of cotton wool over the eyes to keep the eyelids closed. As Batson applied his stethoscope to this chest of the dead man, I glanced at our hostess not without interest. Mrs. Samway was an unusual-looking woman, and I thought her decidedly handsome, though not attractive to me personally. She seemed to be about thirty, rather over the medium height, and of fine Junesque proportions, with a small head very gracefully set on the shoulders. Her jet-black hair, formerly parted in the middle, was brought down either side of the forehead in wavy but very smooth masses, and gathered behind in a neat, precisely plaited coil. The general effect reminded me of the so-called Clithia, having the same reposefulness, though not the gentleness and softness of that lovely head but the most remarkable feature of this woman was the colour of her eyes, which were of the palest grey or hazel that I have ever seen, so pale, in fact, that they told as spots of light, like the eyes of some lemurs, or as those of a cat seen in the dusk, a peculiarity that imparted a curiously intense and penetrating quality to her glance. I had just noted these particulars when Batson, having finished his examination, held out the stethoscope to me. "'May as well listen, as you're here,' said he, and turning to our hostess, he added, "'Let us see those papers, Mrs. Samway.' As he stepped over to the table, I took his place on a chair by the bedside, and proceeded to make an examination. It was, of course, only a matter of form, for the man was obviously dead. But having insisted so strongly on the necessity of verifying the death, I had to make a show of becoming scepticism. Accordingly, I tested, both by touch and with a stethoscope, the region of the heart. Needless to say, no hard sounds were to be distinguished, nor any signs of pulsation. Indeed, the very first touch of my hand on the chilly surface of the chest was enough to banish any doubt. 
no living body could be so entirely destitute of animal heat i laid down the stethoscope and looked reflectively at the dead man lying so still and rigid with his bandaged jaws and blindfolded eyes and speculated vaguely on his personality when alive and on the hidden disease that had so suddenly cut him off from the land of the living and insensibly by habit i suppose my fingers strayed to his clammy pulseless wrist the sleeve of his nightshirt was excessively long almost covering the fingers and i had to turn it back to reach the spot where the pulse would normally be felt in doing this i moved the dead hand slightly and then became aware of a well-marked rigor mortis or death stiffening in the arm of the corpse a condition which i ought to have observed sooner at this moment happening to look up i caught the eye of mrs samway fixed on me with a very remarkable expression she was leaning over Batson as he filled up the voluminous certificate, but had evidently been watching me, and the expression of her pale, cat-like eyes left no doubt in my mind that she strongly resented my proceedings. In some confusion, and accusing myself of some failure in outward decorum, I hastily drew down the dead man's sleeve and rose from the bedside. "'You noticed, I suppose,' said I, "'that there is fairly well-marked rigor mortis.' "'I didn't,' said Batson but if you did it'll do as well better mention it to o'connor when he comes you ought to be here now who's o'connor asked mrs samway oh he's the doctor who's going to sign the confirmatory certificate again a gleam of unmistakable anger flashed from her hostess's eyes as she demanded then who is this gentleman this is dr humphrey jardine said batson apologize for not introducing him before Dr. Jardine is taking my practice while I am away. I am off to-night for about a week. Mrs. Samway withered me with a baleful glance of her singular eyes, and remarked stiffly, "'I don't quite see why you brought him here.' She turned her back on me, and I decided that Mrs. Samway was somewhat of a tartar, though, to be sure, my presence was a distinct intrusion. I was about to beat a retreat when Batson's apologies were interrupted by a noisy rat-tat at the street door. "'Ah, here's O'Connor.' said Batson, and, as Mrs. Samway went out to open the door, he added, "'Seem to have put our foot in it, though I don't see why she need have been so peppery about it. And O'Connor needn't have banged at the door like that, with death in the house. He'll get into trouble if he doesn't look out.' Our colleague's manner was certainly not ingratiating. He burst into the room with his watch in his hand, protesting that he was three minutes late already, and he added, "'If there's one thing that I detest, it's being late at dinner. Got the forms?' "'Yes.' replied Batson. Here they are. That's my certificate on the front page. Yours is overleaf. Dr. O'Connor glanced rapidly down the long table of questions, muttering discontentedly. Made careful external examination? Hmm. Have you made a post-mortem? Oh, of course I haven't. What an infernal rigmarole. If cremation ever becomes general, there'll be no time for anything but funerals. Who nursed the deceased? I did, said Mrs. Samway. My husband relieved me occasionally, but nearly all the nursing was done by me. My name is Letitia Samway. Was the deceased a relation of yours? No, only a friend. He lived with us for a time in Paris, and came to England with us. What was his occupation? He was nominally a dealer in works of art. Actually, he was a man of independent means. Have you any pecuniary interest in his death? He has left us about seventy pounds. My husband is the executor of the will. I see. Well, I'd better have a few words with you outside, Batson, before I make my examination. It's all a confounded farce, but we must go through the proper forms, I suppose. Yes, by all means, said Batson. Don't leave any loophole for queries or objections. He rose and accompanied O'Connor out into the hall, whence the sound of hurried muttering came faintly through the door. As soon as we were alone, I endeavoured to make my peace with Mrs. Samway by offering apologies for my intrusion into the house of mourning. For the time being, I concluded, I am Dr. Batson's assistant, and as he seemed to wish me to come with him, I came without considering that my presence might be objected to. I hope you will forgive me. My humility appeared entirely to appease her. In a moment her stiff and forbidding manner melted into one that was quite gracious, and she rewarded me with a smile that made her face really charming. "'Of course,' she said. "'It was silly of me to be so cantankerous and rude, too. "'But it did look a little callous, you know, "'when I saw you playing with his poor dead hand. "'So you must make allowances.' 
She smiled again, very prettily, and at this moment my two colleagues re-entered the room. "'Now then,' said O'Connor, "'let us see the body, and then we shall have finished.' He strode over to the bed, and, turning back the sheet, made a rapid inspection of the corpse. "'Ridiculous farce,' he muttered. "'Looks all right. Would, in any case, though. Parcel of wrapped tape. What's the good of looking at the outside of a body? Post-mortem's the only thing that's any use. What's this piece of tape plaster on the back?' "'Oh,' said Batson. "'That is a little cut that he made by falling our broken bottle. I stuck the plaster on because you can't get a bandage to hold satisfactorily on the back. Besides, he didn't want a bandage constricting his chest.' "'No, of course not,' O'Connor agreed. "'Well, it's all regular and straightforward. Give me the form and I'll fill it up and sign it.' He seated himself at the table, looked once more at his watch, groaned aloud, and began to write furiously. "'The Egyptians weren't such bad judges after all,' he remarked as he laid down the pen and rose from his chair. "'Embalming may have been troublesome, but when it was done, it was done for good. The deceased was always accessible for reference in case of a dispute, and all this red tape was saved. Good night, Mr. Samway.' He buttoned up his coat and bustled off, and a minute or so later we followed. "'By Jove!' exclaimed Batson. "'This business has upset my arrangements finally.' I shall have to buck up if I'm going to catch my train. There's all the medicine to be made up and sent out yet, to say nothing of dinner. But dinner will have to wait until the business is all settled up. Don't you hurry, Jardine. I'll just run on and get to work. He broke into an elephantine trot and soon disappeared round a corner, and, when I arrived at the surgery, I found him posting up the day-book with the speed of a parliamentary reporter. Batson's dexterity with medicine bottles and wrapping paper filled me with admiration and despair. I made a futile effort to assist, but in the end he snatched away the crumpled paper in which I was struggling to enswath a bottle, dropped it into the waste paper basket, snatched up a clean sheet, and slap, bang, in the twinkling of an eye, he had transformed the bottle into a neat little white parcel as a conjurer changes a cocked hat into a guinea pig. It was wonderful. My host was a cheerful soul but restless. He got up from the table no less than six times to pack some article that he had just thought of, and after dinner, when I accompanied him to his bedroom, I saw him empty his trunk no less than three times to make sure that he had forgotten nothing. He quite worried me. Your over-quick man is apt to wear out other people's nerves more than his own. I began to look anxiously at the clock, and felt a real relief when the maid came to announce that the cab was at the door. "'Well, good-bye. Doctor?' he sang out cheerily, shaking my hand through the open window of the cab. "'Don't forget to keep the stock bottles filled up. Saves a world of trouble. And don't take too long on your rounds. Ta-ta!' The cab rattled away, and I went back into the house, a full-blown general practitioner. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of A Silent Witness》by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon.《Chapter Five: The Lethal Chamber*. A young and newly qualified doctor emerging for the first time into private practice is apt to be somewhat surprised and disconcerted by the new conditions. Accustomed to the exclusively professional and scientific atmosphere of the hospital. The sudden appearance of the personal element as the predominant factor rather takes him aback. He finds himself in a new and unexpected position. No longer a mere impersonal official, a portion of a great machine, he is the paid servant of his patients, who are not always above letting him feel the conditions of his service. The hospital patient, drilled into a certain respectful submissiveness by the discipline of the wards, has given place to an employer, usually critical, sometimes trisolent, and occasionally addicted to a disagreeable frankness of speech. The locum tenens, moreover, is peculiarly susceptible to these conditions, especially if, as in my case, his appearance is youthful. Patients resent the substitution of a stranger for the familiar medical attendant, and are at no great pains to disguise the fact. The old woman with the liver, to adopt Batson's pellucid phrase, hinted that I was rather young, adding encouragingly that I should get the better of that in time, while the more morose typhoid bluntly informed me that he hadn't bargained for being attended by a medical student. 
Taken as a whole, I found private practice disappointing, and soon began to wish myself back in the wards, and to sigh for my quiet, solitary rambles on Hampstead Heath. Still, there were rifts in the cloud. Some of the patients appreciated the interest that I took in their cases, evidently contrasting it with the rather casual attitude of my principal, and some were positively friendly. But, in general, my reception was such as to make me slightly apprehensive whenever a new patient appeared. On the fourth evening after Batson's departure, Mrs. Semway was announced, and I prepared myself for the customary snub. But I was mistaken. Nothing could be more gracious than her manner towards me, though the object of her visit occasioned me some embarrassment. "'I have called, Dr. Jardine,' she said, "'to ask you if you could let me have the account for poor Mr. Maddock. My husband is the executor, you know, and as we shall be going back to Paris quite shortly, he wants to get everything settled up.' I was in rather a quandary. Of the financial side of practice I was absolutely ignorant, and I thought it best to say so. But, I added, Dr. Batson will be back on Friday evening, if you can wait so long. Oh, that will do quite well, she replied. But don't forget to tell him that we want the account at once. I promised not to forget, and then remarked that she would, no doubt, be glad to be back in Paris. No, she answered. I shall be rather sorry. Of course, Camden Town is not a very attractive neighbourhood, but it is close to the heart of London and then there are some delightful places near, and quite accessible. There is Highgate, for instance. Yes, but it's getting very much built over, isn't it? Unfortunately it is, but yet there are some very pleasant places left. The old village is still charming, so quaint and old world. And then there's Hampstead. What could be more delightful than the Heath? But perhaps you don't know Hampstead. "'Oh, yes, I do,' said I. "'My rooms are at Gospel Oak, quite near the Heath, and I think I know every nook and corner of the neighbourhood. I am pining for a stroll on the Heath at this very moment.' "'I dare say you are,' she said sympathetically. "'This is a depressing neighbourhood if you can't get away from it. We found it very dismal, at first, after Paris.' "'Do you live in Paris?' I asked. "'Not permanently,' she replied. "'But we spent a good deal of time there.' My husband is a dealer in works of art, so he has to travel about a good deal. That is how we came to know Mr. Maddock. He was dealer too, wasn't he? I inquired. Yes, in a way. But he had means of his own, and his dealing was a mere excuse for collecting things that he was not going to keep. He had a passion for buying, and then he used to sell the things in order to buy more. But I am afraid I am detaining you with my chatter. No, not at all, I said eagerly only too glad to have an intelligent, educated person to talk to. You are the last caller, and I hope I have finished my day's work. Accordingly, she stayed quite a long time, chatting on a variety of subjects, and finally on that of cremation. I dare say, she said, it is more sanitary and wholesome than burial, but there is something rather dreadful about it. Perhaps it is because we are not accustomed to the idea. Did you go to the funeral? I asked. Yes, Mr. Maddock had no friends in England but my husband and me, so we both went. It was very solemn and awesome. The coffin was laid on the catafalque while a short service was read, and then two metal doors opened, and it was passed through out of our sight. We waited some time, and presently they brought us a little terracotta urn, with just a handful or two of white ash in it. That was all that was left of our poor friend Septimus Maddock. Don't you think it is rather dreadful?' "'Death is always rather dreadful,' I answered. "'But when we look at the ashes of a dead person, "'we realise the total destruction of the body, "'whereas the grave keeps its secrets. "'If we could look down through the earth "'and see the changes that are taking place, "'we should probably find the slow decay more shocking "'than the swift consumption by fire. "'Fortunately we cannot, "'but we know that the final result is the same in both.' "'Mrs. Semway shuddered slightly "'and drew her wraps more closely about her. "'Yes,' she said with a faint sigh. "'The same end awaits us all, but it is better not to think about it.' We were both silent for a while. I sat with my gaze bent rather absently on the casebook before me, turning over her last somewhat gloomy utterance, until, chancing to look up, I found her pale, penetrating eyes fixed on me with the same strange intentness that I had noticed when she had looked at me as I sat by the body of Maddock. As she met my glance, she looked down quickly, but without confusion, and with a return to her habitual reposefulness. 
half unconsciously I returned her scrutiny. She was a remarkable-looking woman, a beautiful woman, too, but of a type that is, in our time and country, rare, an ancient or barbaric type in which womanly beauty and grace are joined to manifest physical strength. I felt that some unusual racial mixture spoke in her inconsistent colouring, her clear pink skin, her pale eyes, and the jet-black hair that rippled down either side of her low forehead in little crimpy waves, as regular and formal as the archaic curls of early Greek sculpture. But predominant over all other qualities was that of strength. Full and plump, soft and almost ultra-feminine, lissom and flexible in every pose and movement, yet, to me, the chief impression that her appearance suggested was strength, sheer muscular strength, not the rigid bulldog strength of a strong man, but the soft and supple strength of a leopard. I looked at her as she sat almost limply in her chair, with her head on one side, her hands resting in her lap and a beautiful soft womanly droop of the shoulders, and I felt that she could have started up in an instant, active, strong, formidable, like a roused panther. I was going on, I think, to make comparisons between her and that other woman who was wont to trip so daintily down Millfield Lane, when she raised her eyes slowly to mine, and suddenly she blushed scarlet. "'Am I a very remarkable-looking person, Dr. Jardine?' she asked quietly, as if answering my thoughts. The rebuke was well merited. For an instant a paltry compliment fluttered on my lips, but I swallowed it down. She wasn't that kind of woman. "'I'm afraid I've been staring you out of countenance, Mrs. Samway,' I said apologetically. "'Hardly that,' she replied with a smile. "'But you certainly were looking at me very attentively.' "'Well,' I said, recovering myself, "'after all, a cat may look at a king, you know.' She laughed softly, a very pretty, musical laugh, and rose, still blushing warmly. "'And,' she retorted, "'by the same reasoning, you think a king may look at a cat. Very well, Dr. Jardine. Good night.' She held out her hand, a beautifully shaped hand, though rather large, but, as I've said, she was not a small woman, and as it clasped mine, though the pressure was quite gentle, it conveyed, like her appearance, an impression of abundant physical strength. I accompanied her to the door and watched her as she walked up the dingy street with an easy, erect, undulating gait, even as might have walked those women who are portrayed for the wonder of all time on the ivory-toned marble of the Parthenon frieze. I followed with my eyes the dignified, graceful figure until it vanished round the corner, and then went back to the consulting room, dimly wondering why a woman of such manifest beauty and charm should offer little attraction to me. Batson's practice, among its other drawbacks, suffered from a deadly lack of professional interest. Whether this was its normal condition, or whether his patients had got wind of me and called in other and more experienced practitioners, I know not. But certainly, after the stirring work of the hospital, the cases that I had to deal with seemed very small beer. Hence the prospect of a genuine surgical case came as a grateful surprise, and I hailed it with enthusiasm. It was on the day before Batson's expected return that I received the summons, which was delivered to me in a dirty envelope as I sat by the bedside of the last patient on my list. "'Is the messenger waiting?' I asked, tearing open the envelope. "'No, doctor. He just handed in the note and went off. He seemed to be in a hurry.' I ran my eye over the message, scrawled in a rather illiterate hand on a sheet of common notepaper, and read, "'Sir,' "'Will you please come at once to the Mineral Water Works in Norton Street? One of our men has injured himself rather badly. Yours truly, J. Parker. P.S. He is bleeding a good deal, so please come quick.' The postscript gave a very necessary piece of information, an injury which bled would require certain dressings and surgical appliances over and above those contained in my pocket-case, and to obtain these I should have to take Batson's house on the way. Slipping the note into my pocket, I wished my patient a hasty adieu, and strode off at a swinging pace in the direction of Jacob Street. The housemaid, Maggie, helped me to find the dressings and pack the bag, for she was a handy, intelligent girl, though no beauty, and meanwhile I questioned her as to the whereabouts of Norton Street and the mineral water factory. "'Oh, I know the place well enough, sir,' said she, "'though I didn't know the works were open. Norton Street is only a few minutes' walk from here.' It's quite close to Gayton Street. In fact, these works are just at the back of the Samway's house. You go up to the corner by the market and take the second on the right, and then— Look here, Maggie, I interrupted. You'd better come and show me the way, as you know the place. 
There's no time to waste on fumbling for the right turning. Very well, sir, she replied, and the bag being now packed with all necessary instruments and dressings, we set forth together. Is this a large factory? I asked, as she trotted by my side, to the astonished admiration of Jacob Street, and the neighbourhood in general. No, sir, she replied. It's quite a small place. The last people went bankrupt, and the works were empty and to let for a long time. I thought they were still to let, but I suppose somebody has taken them and started the business afresh. It's round here. She parted at me round the corner into a narrow by-street, near the end of which she halted at the gate of a yard or mews. Above the entrance was a weather-beaten board bearing the inscription, International Mineral Water Company, and a half-defaced printed bill offering the premises to let, and at the side was a large bell-pool. A vigorous tuck at the letter set the bell jangling within, and, as Maggie tripped away up the street, a small wicket in the gate opened, disclosing the dimly seen figure of a man standing in the inner darkness. "'Are you the doctor?' he inquired. I answered, "'Yes, and being thereupon bidden to enter, stepped through the opening of the wicket, which the man immediately closed, shutting out the last gleam of light from the street lamp outside. "'It's rather dark,' said the unseen custodian, taking me by the arm. "'It is indeed,' I replied, groping with my feet over the rough cobbles. "'Hadn't you better get a light of some kind?' "'I will in a minute,' was the reply. "'You see, all the other men have gone home. We close at six sharp. This is the way. I'll strike a match. The man is down in the bottling room.' My conductor struck a match by the light of which he guided me through a doorway, along a passage or corridor, and down a flight of stone steps. At the bottom of the steps was a flagged passage, out of which opened what looked like a range of cellars. Along the passage I walked warily, followed by the stranger, and lighted very imperfectly by the matches that he struck, the glimmer of which threw a gigantic and ghostly shadow of myself on the stone floor, but failed utterly to pierce the darkness ahead. I was exactly opposite the yawning doorway of one of the cellars when the match went out, and the man behind me exclaimed, "'Wait a moment, doctor. Don't move until I strike another light.' I halted abruptly and the next moment I received a violent thrust that sent me staggering through the open doorway into the cellar. Instantly the massive door slammed, and a pair of heavy bolts were shot, in succession, on the outside. "'What the devil is the meaning of this?' I roared, battering and kicking furiously at the door. Of course there was no answer, and I quickly stopped my demonstrations, for it dawned on me in a moment that the factory was untenanted, save by the ruffian who had admitted me, that I had been decoyed here of a set purpose— though what that purpose was I could not imagine. But it was not long before I received a pretty broad hint as to the immediate intentions of my host. A gentle thumping at the door of my cellar attracted my attention, and caused me to lay my ear against the wood. The sound that I heard was quite unmistakable. The crevices of the door were being filled, apparently with pieces of rag, which my friend was ramming home, presumably with a chisel. In fact, the door was being corked to make the joints air tight. The object of this proceeding was clear enough. I was shut up in an air-tight cavity in which I was to be slowly suffocated. That was quite obvious. Why I was to be suffocated, I could form no sort of guess, excepting that I had fallen into the hands of a homicidal lunatic. But I was not greatly alarmed. The air in a good-sized cellar will last a considerable time, and I could easily poke out anything that my friend might stuff into the keyhole. Then, when the man arrived in the morning, I could kick on the cellar door, and they would come and let me out. There was nothing to be particularly frightened about. Were there any men? The injured man was evidently a myth. Supposing the other man were a myth, too? I recalled Maggie's remark that she had thought the place was to let still. Perhaps it was. That would be rather more serious. At this point my agitations were broken in upon by sounds from the adjoining cellar the sound of someone moving about and dragging some heavy body. And it struck me at once as strange that I should hear these sounds so distinctly, seeing the massive door of my own cellar was sealed and the walls were of solid brick, as I ascertained by rapping at them with my knuckles. But I had no time to consider this circumstance, for there suddenly rose a new sound, whereat, I must confess, my heart fairly came into my mouth, a loud, penetrating hiss like the shriek of escaping steam, it seemed to come from some part of the cellar in which I was immured, from a spot nearly overhead, and was immediately echoed by a similar sound in the adjoining cellar, and then by a third. Even as the last sound broke forth, the door of the adjoining cellar slammed, the bolts were shot, and then faintly mingled with a discordant hissing. 
I could hear the dull thumping that told me that the cracks of that door, too, were being corked. It was a frightful situation. The hissing sound was obviously caused by the escape of gas under high pressure, and that gas must be entering my cellar through some opening. I felt for my matchbox, and groping along the wall towards the point whence the loudest sound, and indeed all the sounds, proceeded, I struck a match. The glimmer of the wax vesta made everything clear. Close to the ceiling, about seven feet from the ground, was an opening in the wall about six inches square, and pouring through this in a continuous stream was a cloud of white particles that glistened like snowflakes. As I stood under the opening, some of them settled on my face, and the more than icy coldness of the contact told the whole horrible tale in a moment. This white powder was snow. Carbonic acid snow. The hissing sound came from three of those great iron bottles, charged under pressure with liquefied carbonic acid, which are used by mineral water manufacturers for aerating the water. The miscreant, or lunatic, who had imprisoned me, had turned on the taps, and the liquid was escaping and turning into the snow with the cold produced by its own rapid evaporation and expansion. Of course, the snow would quickly absorb heat, and, without again liquefying, evaporate into the gaseous form. In a very short time both cellars would be full of the poisonous gas, and I, well, in a word, I was shut up in a lethal chamber. It has taken me some time to write this explanation, which, however, flashed through my brain in the twinkling of an eye, as the light of the match fell on that sinister cloud of snowflakes. In a moment I had my coat off, and was stuffing it for dear life into the opening. It was but a poor protection against the gas, which would easily enough find its way through the interstices of the fabric, but it would stop the direct stream of snow and give me time to think. On what incalculable chances do the great issues of our lives depend? If I had been a short man, I must have been dead in half an hour, for the opening through which the cloud of snow was pouring was well over seven feet above the floor, and would have been quite out of my reach. Even as it was, with my six feet of stature and corresponding length of arm, it was impossible to ram my coat into the opening with the necessary force, for I had to stand close to the wall with my arm upraised at a great mechanical disadvantage. Still, as I have said, imperfect as the obstruction was, it served to stop the inrushing cloud of snow. It would take some time for the heavy gas in the adjoining cellar to rise to the level of the opening, and, meanwhile, I could be devising other measures. I lit another match and looked about me. The cellar was much smaller than I had thought, and was absolutely empty. The floor was of concrete, the walls of rough brickwork, and the ceiling of plaster, all cracked and falling in. There was plenty of ventilation there, but that was of no interest to me. Carbonic acid is so heavy that it behaves almost like a liquid, and it would have filled the cellar and suffocated me, even if the top of my prison had been opened to the sky. The adjoining cellar was already filling rapidly, and when the gas in it reached the level of the opening, it would percolate through my coat and come pouring down into my cellar. But that, as I've said, would take some time, if the dividing wall was moderately sound. This important qualification, as soon as it occurred to me, set me exploring the wall with the aid of another match, and very unsatisfactory was the result. It was a bad wall, built of inferior brick and worse mortar, and was marked by innumerable holes, where wall hooks and other fastenings had been driven in between the bricks. My brief survey convinced me that, so far from being gas-tight, the wall was as pervious as a sponge, and that whatever I meant to do to preserve my life, I must set about without delay. But what was I to do? That was the urgent, the vital question— Escape was evidently impossible. There were no means of stopping up the numberless holes and weak places in the wall. The only vulnerable spot was the door. If I could establish some communication with the outer air, I could, for a time at least, disregard the poisonous gas with which I should presently be surrounded. The first thing to be considered was the keyhole. That must be unstopped at once. Fumbling in my bag, for I had grown of a sudden niggardly with my matches, I found a good-sized probe which I insinuated into the keyhole, and in a moment my hopes in that direction were extinguished, for the end of the probe impinged upon metal. The keyhole was not stopped with rag, but with a plate of metal fixed on the outside. With rapidly growing alarm, but with a tidiness born of habit, I put the probe back in the bag, and began feverishly to review the situation, and consider my resources. And then I had an idea, only a poor forlorn hope but still an idea. 
There is a certain ingenious type of pocket-knife, devised principally in the interest of the cutlery trade, that innocent persons, usually of the female persuasion, are wont to bestow as presents on their masculine friends. Such a knife I chanced to possess. It had been given to me by an aunt, and sentimental considerations had induced me to give it an amount of room in my trousers' pocket that I continually grudged. However, there it was at this critical moment, with its corkscrew, gimlet, its bewildering array of blades, its hoof-pick, toothpick, tweezers, file, screwdriver, and assorted unclassifiable tools, a ponderous lump of pocket-destroying uselessness, and yet the appointed means of saving my life. The gimlet was the first tool that I called into requisition. Very gingerly, for these tools are commonly over-tempered and brittle, I bored in the thick plank a hole at about the level of my mouth, and as I worked I turned over my further plans. When the gimlet was through the door, I selected a tool on whose use I had often speculated, a sharp-edged spike, like a diminutive and very stumpy bayonet, which I proceeded to use broachwise to enlarge the hole. When this tool worked loose, I exchanged it for the screwdriver, with which I managed to broach the hole out to about half an inch in width, and this was as large as I could make it, and it was not large enough. True, one could breathe fairly comfortably through a half-inch hole, but, with the deadly gas circulating around, a freer opening was very desirable. Then I bethought me that the magic knife contained a saw, a wretched thick-bladed affair, but still a saw, which would actually cut wood if you gave it time. This implement suggested a simple plan which I forthwith put into execution, working as rapidly as I could without running the risk of breaking the tools. My plan was to make a second hole some two inches diagonally below the first, and from each hole to carry two saw cuts at right angles to one another. The two pairs of cuts would intersect and take a square piece out of the door, giving me a little window through which I could breathe in comfort. It was a trifling task, but yet, with the miserable tools I had, it took a considerable time to execute, the more since the saw-blade was wider than the holes, excepting at its point. However, it was accomplished at last, and I had the satisfaction of pushing out the little separated square of wood, and feeling that I now had free access to the pure air outside my dungeon. But it was none too soon. As I rested from my labours, it occurred to me to test the condition of the air inside, Lighting a wax match, I held the little taper so that the flame ascended steadily, and then lowered it slowly. As it descended, the flame changed colour somewhat, and about eighteen inches from the floor it went out quite suddenly. There was then a layer of the pure gas about eighteen inches deep, covering the floor, and no doubt rising pretty rapidly. This was rather startling, and it warned me to have recourse without delay to my breathing hole for though carbonic acid gas behaves somewhat as a liquid, it is not a liquid. Like other gases, it has the power of diffusing upwards, and the air of the cellar must be already getting unsafe. Accordingly, after carefully wiping the surface of the door with my handkerchief, I applied my mouth, with some distaste, to the opening, and took in a deep draught of undoubtedly pure air. The position in which I had to stand with my mouth to the hole was an irksome one, and I foresaw that it would presently become very fatiguing, Moreover, when the gas reached the level of my head, it would be difficult to prevent some of it from finding its way into my mouth and nostrils, and if it did, I should most assuredly be poisoned. This consideration suggested the necessity of making another hole at a lower level to let out the gas, and allow me to rest myself by a change of position. But this new task had to be carried out with my mouth glued to the breathing hole, and very awkward and tiring I found it, and very slow was the progress that I made. This second hole was smaller than the first, for time was precious, and I reflected that I could easily enlarge it by fresh saw-cuts, each two of which would take out a triangular piece of wood. But it was tedious work, and its completion left me with aching arms. Indeed, I was beginning to ache all over from the constrained position. Taking a deep breath and shutting my mouth, I stood up and stretched myself. Then I lit a match and looked at my watch. Half past eight. I had been over two hours in the cellar, and meanwhile the patients were waiting for me at the surgery, and no doubt murmuring at the delay. How soon would my absence lead to inquiries? Or were inquiries being made even now? Looking at the match that I still held in my hand, I noticed that its flame was pallid and bluish, and as I lowered it slowly, it went out when it was a little over two feet from the floor. The gas, then, was still rising, though not so rapidly as I had feared, but from the altered colour of the flame it was evident that the air of the cellar, 
generally, contained enough diffused gas to be actively poisonous. After a time, the erect position began to grow insupportably fatiguing. I felt that I must sit down for a few minutes' rest, even though prudence whispered that it was highly unsafe. I struggled for a while, but eventually, conquered by fatigue, sat down on the floor with my mouth applied closely to the lower breathing hole. I persuaded myself that I would sit only just long enough to recover some of my strength. But minute after minute sped by, and still I felt an unaccountable reluctance to rise. Suddenly I became conscious of a vague feeling of drowsiness, of a desire to lean back against the wall and doze. It was only slight, but its significance was so appalling that I scrambled to my feet in a panic, and, putting my mouth to the upper breathing hole, took several deep inspirations. But I soon realized that the upright position was impossible. The drowsy feeling continued, and there was growing with it a lassitude and weakness of the limbs that threatened to leave me only the choice between sitting or falling. A wave of furious anger swept over me and roused me a little, a burst of hatred of the cowardly wretch who had decoyed me, as I now suspected, to my death. Then this feeling passed and was succeeded by chilly fear, and I sank down once more into a sitting position, with my mouth pressed to the lower opening. The time ran on unreckoned by me. Gradually, by imperceptible degrees, my mental state grew more and yet more sluggish. Anger and fear and ever-dwindling hope flitted by turns across the slowly fading field of my consciousness. Intervals of quiet indifference, almost of placid comfort, began to intervene, with increasing lassitude and a growing desire for rest. To lie down, that was what I wanted. To lay my head upon the stony floor and sink into sweet oblivion. At last I must have actually dozed, though, fortunately, without removing my mouth from the breathing hole, for I had no sense of the passage of time, when I was suddenly aroused by the loud and continuous jangling of a bell. I listened with a sort of dull eagerness, and keeping awake with a conscious effort. The bell pealed wildly and without a pause for what seemed to me quite a long time. Then it ceased, and again my consciousness began to grow dim. After an interval I know not how long, there came to me dimly and only half perceived the closing of a door, the patter of quick footsteps, and then the voice of a man calling me by name. I struggled to get on to my feet, but could not move, but I still held the clasp-knife and was able to rap with it feebly on the door. Again I heard the voice. It sounded nearer now, and yet infinitely far away, and again I rapped on the door and shouted through the breathing-hole, a thin muffled cry such as one utters in a troubled dream, and then the drowsiness crept over me again, and I heard no more. The next thing of which I was conscious was a sounding thwack on the cheek with something wet that felt like a dead fish. I opened my eyes and looked vaguely into two faces that were close to mine and seemed to be lighted by a lamp or candle. The faces were somehow familiar, but yet I failed clearly to recognize them, and, after staring stupidly for a few moments, I began to doze again. Then the dead fish returned to the assault, and I again opened my eyes. Another vigorous flop caused me to open my mouth with an unparliamentary gasp. "'Ah, that's better,' said a familiar and yet unplaced voice. "'When a man is able to swear, he's fairly on the road to recovery.' Flop! The renewed attentions of the dead fish, which turned out later to be merely a wet towel, evoked further demonstrations on my part of progressing recovery, accompanied by a nervous titter in a female voice. Gradually the clouds rolled away, and to my returning consciousness the faces revealed themselves as those of Maggie, the housemaid, and Dr. Thorndyke. Even to my muddled wits the presence of the latter was somewhat of a puzzle, and, in the intervals of anathematizing the deceased fish, which I had not yet identified, I found myself hazily speculating on the problem of how my revered teacher came to be in this place, and what place this was. "'Come now, Jardine,' said Dr. Thorndyke, emptying a jug of water on my face, and receiving a volley of spluttered expletives in exchange. Pull yourself together. How did you get in that cellar? Hang if I know, said I, composing myself for another nap. But here the wet towel came once more into requisition, and that with such vigour that, in a fit of exasperation, I sat up and yawned. I think you'd better fetch a cab, said Thorndyke, as Maggie wrung out the towel afresh. But leave the gate open when you go out. What's the cab for? I asked sulkily. Can't I walk? If you can, it will be better, said Thorndyke. 
Let us see if you are able to stand. He hoisted me onto my feet, and he and Maggie, taking each an arm, walked me slowly up and down the cobbled yard, which I now began to recognize as appertaining to the mineral waterworks. At first I staggered very drunkenly, but by degrees the drowsy feeling wore off, and I was able to walk with Thorndyke's assistance only. "'I think we might venture out now,' said he, at length, piloting me towards the gate, and when I had stumbled rather awkwardly through the wicket, we set forth homeward. On my arrival home, Thorndyke ordered a supply of strong coffee and a light meal, after which, it being obvious that I was good for nothing in a professional sense, he suggested that I should go to bed. "'Don't worry about the practice,' said he. "'I'll send for my friend Jervis, and between us we will see that everything is looked after. If Maggie will give me a sheet of paper and an envelope, I'll write a note to him, and then she can take a hansom to my chambers and give the note either to Dr. Jervis or my man Polton. Meanwhile, I will stay here and see that you don't go to sleep prematurely. He wrote the note, and Maggie, having made such improvements in her outward garb as befitted the status of a rider in hansoms, took charge of it and departed with much satisfaction and dignity. Thorndyke made a few inquiries of me as to the circumstances that had led to my incarceration in the cellar, but finding that I knew no more than Maggie, whom he had already questioned, he changed the subject, nor would he allow me again to refer to it. "'No, Jardine,' he said. "'Better think no more of it for the present. Have a good night's rest, and then, if you're all right in the morning, we will go into the matter, and see if we can put the puzzle together.'" End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of A Silent Witness by R. Alston Freeman》this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 6. A Council of War. I awoke somewhat late on the following morning. Indeed, I was but half awake when there came a somewhat masterful and peremptory tap at my bedroom door, followed by the appearance in the room of a rather tall gentleman of some thirty years of age. I should have diagnosed him instantly as a doctor by his self-possessed proprietary manner of entering, but he left me no time for guessing as to his identity. "'Good morning, Jardine,' he said briskly, jingling the keys and small change in his trousers' pockets. "'My name is Jervis, second violin in the Thorndyke Orchestra. I'm in charge here, pro tem. How are you feeling?' "'Oh, I'm all right. I was just going to get up. You needn't trouble about the practice. I'm quite fit.' "'Glad to hear it,' said Jervis. "'But you'd better keep quiet all the same. My orders are explicit.' and I know my place too well to disobey. Thorndyke's instructions were that you are not to make any visits or go abroad until after the inquest. "'Inquest?' I exclaimed. "'Yes. He's coming here at four o'clock to hold an inquiry into the circumstances that led to your being locked up in a cellar, and until then I'm to look after the practice and keep an eye on you. What time do you expect the offspring of the Flittermouse?' "'Who?' I demanded. "'Batson. He's coming back today, isn't he?' "'Yes, about six o'clock tonight. "'Then you'll be able to clear out. "'So much the better. "'The neighbourhood doesn't seem very wholesome for you.' "'I suppose I can do the surgery work,' said I. "'You'd better not. "'Better follow Thorndyke's instructions literally. "'But you can tell me about the patients "'and help me to dispense. "'And that reminds me that a person named Samway called just now, "'a rather fine-looking woman, "'reminded me of a big, sleek tabby cat. "'She wouldn't say what she wanted. "'Do you know anything about her?' "'I expect she came about her account. "'But she'll have to see Batson. "'I told her so only a night or two ago.' "'Very well, then,' said Jervis. "'Then I'll be off now, and you take things easy, "'and just think over what happened last night "'so as to be ready for Thorndyke.' "'With this he bustled away, "'leaving me to rise and breakfast at my leisure. "'His advice to me to think over the events of the previous night "'was rather superfluous. "'The experience was not one that I was likely to forget.' To have escaped from death by the very slenderest chance was in itself a matter to occupy one's thoughts pretty completely, apart from the horrible circumstances. And then there was the mystery in which the whole affair was enveloped, a mystery which utterly baffled any attempt to penetrate it. Turn it over as I would, and it was hardly out of my thoughts for a minute at a time all day. No glimmer of light could I perceive, 
no faintest clue to any explanation of that hideous and incomprehensible crime. At four o'clock punctually to the minute, Dr. Thorndyke arrived, and, having quickly looked me over to see that I was none the worse for my adventure, proceeded to business. "'Have you finished the visits, Jervis?' he asked. "'Yes, and sent off all the medicine. There's nothing more to do until six. "'Then,' said Thorndyke, "'we might have a cup of tea in the consulting-room, and talk this affair over. I'm rather taking possession of you, Jardine,' he added. "'But I think we ought to see where we are quite clearly, even if we decide finally to hand the case over to the police. Don't you agree with me?' Certainly, I agreed, highly flattered by the interest he was taking in my affairs. Naturally, I should like to get to the bottom of the mystery. So should I, said he, and to that end, I propose that you give us a completely circumstantial account of the whole affair. I have had a talk with your very intelligent little maid, Maggie, and now I want to hear what happened after she left you. I don't think I have much to tell that you don't know, said I. However, I will take up the story where Maggie left off, and I proceeded to describe the events in detail, much as I have related them to the reader. Thorndyke listened to my story with profound attention, making an occasional memorandum, but not uttering a word until I had finished. Then, after a rapid glance through his memoranda, he said, "'You spoke of a note that was handed in to you. Have you got that note?' "'I left it on the writing-table.' and it's probably there still. Yes, here it is. I brought it over to the little table on which our tea was laid, and handed it to him, and as he took it from me, with the dainty carefulness of a photographer handling a wet plate, I noted mentally that the habit of delicate manipulation contracted in a laboratory makes itself evident in the most trifling of everyday actions. I see, he remarked, turning the envelope over, and scrutinizing it minutely, that this is addressed to Dr. H. Jardine. It appears, then, that he knows your Christian name. Can you account for that? No, I can't. The only letter I've had here was addressed Dr. Jardine, and I've signed no certificates or other documents. He made a note of my answer, and, drawing the missive from its envelope, read it through. The handwriting, he remarked, looks disguised rather than illiterate, and the diction is inconsistent. The blatantly incorrect adverb at the end does not agree with the rest of the phraseology and the correct punctuation. As to the signature, we may neglect that, unless you are acquainted with anyone in these parts the name of Parker. "'I am not,' said I. "'Very well. Then, if you will allow me to keep this note, I will file it for future reference.' now I will ask you a few questions about this adventure of yours, which is really a most astonishing and mysterious affair, even more mysterious, I may add, than it looks at the first glance. But we shall come to that presently. At the moment we are concerned with the crime itself, with a manifest attempt to murder you, and the circumstances that led up to it, and there are certain obvious questions that suggest themselves. The first is, can you give any explanation of this attempt on your life? No, I can't, I replied. It is a complete mystery to me. I can only suppose that the fellow was a homicidal lunatic. A homicidal lunatic, said Thorndyke, is the baffled investigator's last resource. But we'd better not begin supposing at this stage. Let us keep strictly to facts. You do not know of anything that would explain this attack on you. No. Then the next question is, had you any property of value on your person? No. Five pounds would cover the value of everything I had about me, including the instruments. Then that seems to exclude robbery as a motive. The next question is, does any person stand to benefit considerably by your death? Have you any considerable expectations in the way of bequests, reversions, or succession to landed property or titles? No, I replied with a faint grin. I shall come in for a thousand or two when my uncle dies, but I believe the London hospital is the alternative legatee, and I suppose we would hardly suspect the hospital governors of this little affair. 
otherwise the only person who would benefit by my death would be the undertaker who got the contract to plant me thorndyke nodded and made a note of my answer that said he disposes of the principal motives for premeditated murder there remains the question of personal enmity not a common motive in this country have you as far as you know an enemy or enemies who might conceivably try to kill you as far as i know i have not an enemy in the world or anyone even who would wish to do me a bad turn then said thorndyke that seems to dispose of all the ordinary motives for murder and i may say that i have only put these questions as a matter of routine precaution ex abundantia cautely as jervis says when he is in a forensic mood because certain other facts which I have learned seem to exclude any of these motives except, perhaps, robbery from the person. "'You haven't been long picking up those other facts,' remarked Jervis. "'Why, the affair only happened last night.' "'I've only made a few simple inquiries,' replied Thorndyke. "'This morning I called on Mr. Highfield, whose name, as solicitor and agent to the landlords, I copied from the notice on the gate at the works last night.' He knows me slightly, so I was able to get from him the information that I wanted. It amounts to this. About four months ago, a Mr. Gill wrote to him and offered a lump sum for the use of the mineral waterworks for six months. Highfield accepted the offer and drew up an agreement, as desired, granting Gill immediate possession of the premises and the small stock and plant of which the residue was to be taken back at a valuation by the landlords at the expiration of the term. I noted Gill's address, as it appeared on the agreement, and sent my man, Polton, to make inquiries. The address is that of a West Kensington lodging house at which Gill was staying when he signed the agreement. He had been there only three weeks. He left two days after the date of the agreement, and the landlady does not know where he went or anything about him. "'Sounds a bit fishy,' Jervis remarked. "'Did he tell Highfield what he wanted the premises for?' "'I understood that something was said about some assay work in connection with certain, or rather uncertain, mineral concessions. But, of course, that was no affair of Highfield's. His business was to get the rent, and, having got it, his interest in Mr. Gill lapsed. But you see the bearing of these facts.' Gill's connection with these works does, as Jervis says, look a little queer, especially after what has happened. But seeing that he made his arrangements four months ago, at a time when Jardine had no thought of coming into this neighbourhood, it is clear that those arrangements could have no connection with this particular attempt. Gill obviously did not take those works with the intention of murdering Jardine. He took them for some other purpose quite possibly the purpose that he stated. And we must not assume that Gill was the perpetrator of this outrage at all. Could you identify the man who let you in? No, I replied, certainly not. I hardly saw him at all. The place was pitch dark, and whenever he struck a match he was either behind me or in front with his back to me. The only thing I could make out about him was that he had some sort of coarse wash leather gloves on. Ha! exclaimed Thorndyke. "'Then we were right, Jervis.' I looked in surprise from one to the other of my friends, and was on the point of asking Thorndyke what he meant, when he continued. "'That closes another track. If you couldn't identify the man, a description of Gill, if we could obtain it, would not help us. We must begin at some other point.' "'It seems to me,' said Jervis, "'that we haven't much to go upon at all.' "'We haven't much,' agreed Thorndyke, "'but we still have something.' we find that the motive of this attempt was apparently not robbery, nor the diversion of inheritable property, nor personal enmity. It must have been premeditated, but yet it could not have been planned more than a week in advance, for Jardine has only been in this neighbourhood for that time, and his coming was unexpected. The appearances very strongly suggest that the motive, whatever it was, has been generated recently, and probably locally so we'd better make a start from that assumption. "'Is it possible,' Jervis suggested, "'that this man Gill may be some sort of anarchist crank, or a sort of thug, 
it is actually conceivable that he may have taken these premises for the express purpose of having a secure place where he could perpetrate murders and conceal the bodies. It is quite conceivable, said Thorndyke, and when we go and look over the works, which I propose we do presently, we may as well bear the possibility in mind, but it is merely a speculative suggestion. To return to your affairs, Jardine, has your stay here been quite uneventful? Perfectly, I replied. No unusual or obscure cases? No injuries? No, nothing out of the common, I replied. No deaths? One, but the man died before I took over. Nothing unusual about that? Everything quite regular? Oh, perfectly, I answered and then, with a sudden qualm, as I recalled Batson's uncertainty as to the actual cause of death, I added, "'At least, I hope so.' "'You hope so?' queried Thorndyke. "'Yes, because it's too late to go into the question now. The man was cremated.' At this a singular silence fell. Both my friends seemed to stiffen in their chairs, and both looked at me silently but very attentively. Then Thorndyke asked, did you have anything to do with that case? Yes, I replied. I went with Batson to examine the body. And are you perfectly satisfied that everything was as it should be? I was on the point of saying yes, and then suddenly there arose before my eyes the vision of Mrs. Samway looking at me over Batson's shoulder with that strange, inscrutable expression and again I recalled her unexplained anger, and then her sudden change of mood. It had impressed me uncomfortably at the time, and it impressed me uncomfortably now. "'I don't know that I am, now that I come to think it over,' I replied. "'Why not?' asked Thorndyke. "'Well,' I said, a little hesitatingly, "'to begin with, I don't think the cause of death was quite clear.' Batson couldn't find anything definite when he attended the man, and I know that the patient's death came as quite a surprise. "'But surely,' exclaimed Thorndyke, "'he took some measures to find out the cause of death.' "'He didn't. He assumed that it was a case of fatty heart, and certified it as morbus cordis, and a man named O'Connor confirmed the certificate after examining the body. "'After merely inspecting the exterior?' Yes. My two friends looked at one another significantly, and Thorndyke remarked, with a disapproving shake of the head, And this is what all the elaborate precautions amount to in practice. A case which might have been one of the crudest and boldest poisoning gets passed with hardly a pretense of scrutiny. And so it will always be. Routine precautions against the unsuspected are no precautions at all. That is the danger of cremation. It restores to the poisoner's security that he enjoyed in the old days when there were no such sciences as toxicology and organic chemistry, when it was impossible for him to be tripped up by an exhumation and an analysis. "'You don't think it likely that this was a case of poisoning, do you?' I asked. "'I know nothing about the case,' he replied, "'excepting that there was gross neglect in issuing the certificates.' What do you think about it yourself? Looking back at the case, is there anything besides the uncertainty that strikes you as unsatisfactory? I hesitated, and again the figure of Mrs. Samway rose before me with that strange, baleful look in her eyes. Finally, I described the incident to my colleagues. Mrs. Samway, exclaimed Jervis, is that the handsome Lucretia Borgia lady with the mongoose eyes who called here this morning? By Jove! Jardine, you're giving me the creeps. I understand, said Thorndyke, that you're making as if to feel the dead man's pulse. Yes. There is no doubt, I suppose, that he really was dead. None whatever. He was as cold as a fish, and besides there was quite distinct rigor mortis. That seems conclusive enough, said Thorndyke but he continued to gaze at his open notebook with a profoundly speculative and thoughtful expression. "'It certainly looks,' said Jervis, "'as if Jardine had either seen something, or had been about to see something, that he was not wanted to see. 
and the question is what that something could have been. Yes, I agreed gloomily. That is what I have just been asking myself. There might have been a wound or injury of some kind, or there might have been the marks of a hypodermic needle on the wrist. I wish I knew what she meant by looking at me in that way. Well, said Jervis, we shall never know now. The grave gives up its secrets now and again, but the crematorium furnace never. Whether he died naturally or was murdered, Mr. Maddock is now a little heap of ashes, with no message for anyone this side of the Day of Judgment. Thorndyke looked up. "'That seems to be so,' said he. "'And really we have no substantial reasons for thinking that there was anything wrong. So we come back to your own affairs, Jardine, and the question is, what would you prefer to do?' "'In what respect?' I asked. "'In regard to this attempt on your life. You have told us that you have not an enemy in the world, but it appears as if you had.' and a very dangerous one, too. Now, would you like to put the case into the hands of the police, or would you rather that we kept our own counsel and looked into it ourselves? I should like you to decide that, said I. The reason that I ask, said Thorndyke, is this. The machinery of the police is adjusted to professional crime, burglary, coining, forgery, and so forth and their methods are mostly based on information received. The professional crook is generally well known to the police, and, when wanted for any particular job, can be found without much difficulty, and the information necessary for his conviction obtained from the usual sources. But in cases of obscure, non-professional crime, the police are at a disadvantage. The criminal is unknown to them, there are no confederates from whom to get information. Consequently, they have no starting point for their inquiries. They can't create clues, and they, very naturally, will not devote time, labour, and money to cases in which they have nothing to go on. Now, this affair of yours does not look like a professional crime. No motive is evident, and you can give no information that would help the police. I doubt if they would do much more than give you some rather disagreeable publicity, and they might even suspect you of some kind of imposture. Gad! I exclaimed, that's just what they would do. It's what they did last time, and this affair would write me down in their eyes a confirmed mystery monger. Last time? queried Thorndyke. What last time is that? Have there been any other attempts? Not on me, I replied but I had an adventure one night about six or seven weeks ago that has made the Hampstead police look on me, I think, with some suspicion. And here I gave my two friends a description of my encounter with the dead, or insensible, cleric in Millfield Lane, and my discoveries on the following morning. "'But, my dear Jardine,' Thorndyke exclaimed when I had finished, "'what an extraordinary man you are!' It seems as if you could hardly show your nose out of doors without becoming involved in some dark and dreadful mystery. Well, said I, I hope I have now exhausted my gifts in that respect. I am not thirsting for more experiences. But what do you think about that Hampstead affair? Do you think I could possibly have been mistaken? Could the man have been merely insensible, after all, as the police suggested? Thorndyke shook his head. I don't think he replied, that it is possible to take that view. You see, the man had disappeared. Now, he could not have got away unassisted. In fact, he could not have walked at all. One would have to assume that some persons appeared directly after you left and carried him away, and that they appeared and retired so quickly as not to be overtaken by you on your return a few minutes later with the police. That is assuming too much." And then there are the traces which you discovered on the following day, which seem to suggest strongly that a body had been carried away to Ken Wood. It is a thousand pities that you encountered that keeper. If you could have followed the tracks while they were fresh, you might have been able to ascertain whither it had been carried. But now, to return to your latest experience, what shall we do? Shall we communicate with the police, or shall we make a few investigations on our own account? "'As far as I'm concerned,' I replied eagerly, "'a private investigation would be greatly preferable. 
but wouldn't it take up rather a lot of your time? Now, Jardine, you needn't apologize, said Jervis. Unless I'm much mistaken, my respected senior has struck soundings, as the nautical phrase has it. He has a theory of your case, and he would like to see it through. Isn't that so, Thorndyke? Well, Thorndyke admitted, I will confess that the case piques my curiosity somewhat. It is an unusual affair, and suggests some curious hypotheses which might be worth testing. So, if you agree, Jardine, that we make at least a few preliminary investigations, I suggest that, as soon as Batson returns, we three go over to the what the newspapers would call the scene of the tragedy, and reconstitute the affair on the spot. And what about Batson? I asked. Shall we tell him anything? I think we must, said Thorndyke, if only to put him on his guard, for your unknown enemy may be his enemy too. At this moment the street door banged loudly, a quick step danced along the hall, and Batson himself burst into the room. "'Good Lord!' he exclaimed, halting abruptly at the door and gazing in dismay at our little council. "'What's the matter? Anything happened?' Thorndyke laughed as he shook the hand of his quondam pupil. "'Come, come, Batson,' said he. "'Don't make me out such a bird of ill omen. "'I was afraid something awkward might have occurred. "'Police job or inquest or something of that sort.' "'You weren't so very far wrong,' said Thorndyke. When you are at liberty, I'll tell you about it. I'm at liberty now, said Batson, dropping into a chair and glaring at Thorndyke through his spectacles. No scandal, I hope. Thorndyke reassured him on this point, and gave him a brief account of my adventure, and our proposed visit to the works, to which he listened with occasional ejaculations of astonishment and relief. By gum, he exclaimed, what a mercy you got there in time. If you hadn't, there'd have been an inquest and a devil of a fuss. I should never have heard the last of it. Ruined the practice, and worried me into a lunatic asylum. Oh, and about those works? I wouldn't go there if I were you. Why not? Thorndyke asked. Well, you may have to answer some awkward questions, and we don't want this affair to get about, you know. No use raising a dust. Rumpers of any kind place the deuce with a medical practice. Thorndyke smiled at my principal's frank egoism. "'Jervis and I went over last night,' said he, "'and had a hasty look around, "'and we found the place quite deserted. "'Probably it is so still. "'Then you won't be able to get in. "'How'd you get in last night?' "'I happened to have a piece of stiff wire in my pocket,' "'Thorndyke replied impassively. "'Ha!' said Batson. "'Wire, eh? "'Picklock, in fact. "'I wouldn't, if I were you. "'Devil of a bobbery if anyone sees you. "'Hello, there goes the bell.' "'Patient. Let him wait. Tisn't six yet, is it?' Two minutes past,' replied Thorndyke, rising and looking at his watch. "'Perhaps we'd better be starting, as it's now dark, and the business at the works, if there is any, is probably over for the day.' "'Hang the works!' exclaimed Batson. "'I wouldn't go nosing about there. What's the good? Jardine's all right, and the chappie isn't likely to be on view. You'll only raise a stink for nothing.' and bring in a crowd of beastly reporters humming about the place. There's that damn bell again. Well, if you won't stay, perhaps you'll look me up some other time. Always delighted to see you. Jervis, too. You're not going, Jardine. I've got to settle up with you, and hear your report. I'll look in later, said I, when you've finished the evening's work. Right you are, said Batson, opening the door and adroitly etching us out. Sorry you can't stay. Good night. "'Good night.' He shepherded us persuasively and compellingly down the hall, with a skill born of long practice with garrulous patience, and, having exchanged us on the doorstep for a stout woman with two children, returned into the house with his prey and was lost to sight. End of chapter 6《チャプター7》of《A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman》。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon。Chapter 7 of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 7 An Unseen Enemy. From my late principal's house, we walked away quickly down the lamplit street, all, I think, dimly amused at the circumstances of our departure. Is Batson always like that? Thorndyke asked. Always, I replied. 
hurry and bustle are his normal states dear dear commented thorndyke what a terrible amount of time he must waste of course one can understand now how that cremation muddle came about your incurable hustler is always thinking of the things he has got to do next instead of the thing that he is doing at the moment by the way jardine i am taking it for granted that you would like to inspect these premises it is not essential jervis and i had a preliminary look round last night and i dare say we picked up most of the facts that are likely to be of importance if we should be going farther into the matter i think it would be as well for me to take a look at the place and show you exactly where and how the affair happened i think so too said thorndyke it was all pretty evident but you might be able to show us something that we had overlooked here we are wonder if mr gill is on the premises supposing him still to frequent them he looked up and down the street and taking a key from his pocket inserted it into the lock why how on earth did you get the key i asked thorndyke looked at me slyly we keep a tame mechanic said he as he turned the key and opened the wicket yes but how did he get the pattern of the lock i asked thorndyke laughed softly uh, it is only a simple trade lock the fact is jardine that in our branch of practice we have occasionally to take some rather irregular proceedings for instance i usually carry a small set of pick locks fortunately for you that is how i got in last night then i never go abroad without a little box of moulding wax a most invaluable material jardine for collecting certain kinds of evidence well with a slip of wood and a bit of wax i was able to furnish my man with the necessary data for filing up a blank key one doesn't want to be seen using a picklock now can you show us the way he flashed a pocket electric lamp on the ground and we advanced over the rough cobbles until he reached a door at the side this is where i went in said i it opens into a sort of corridor and at the end is a door opening on some steps that lead down to the passage below thorndyke tried the handle of the door and pushed but it was evidently locked or bolted i left this door unlocked last night said he so it is clear that someone has been here since i hardly expected that i thought our friend would have cleared off for good but it is possible that gill had nothing to do with the attempt the premises may have been used by someone who happened to know that they were unoccupied it would have been quite easy for such a person to gain admittance as you see while speaking he had produced from his pocket a little bunch of skeleton keys with one of which he now quietly unlocked the door these builders locks said he are merely symbolic of security you are not expected to unfasten them without authority but you can if you like and happen to have a bit of stiff wire we entered the corridor and as we proceeded looked into the rooms that opened out of it one of them was meagerly furnished as an office but the thick layer of dust on the desk and stools showed clearly that it had been long disused the other rooms were empty and desolate and showed no trace of use or occupation the worthy gill said jervis seems to have been able like diogenes to get on with a very modest outfit yes agreed thorndyke it is a little difficult to guess what his occupation is the place looks as if it had never been used at all shall i go first he halted for a moment passing the light of his lamp over the massive door at the head of the steps and then began to descend it was certainly a horrible and repulsive place especially to my eyes with the recollection of my late experience fresh in my mind the rough brick walls covered with the crumbling remains of old whitewash the black masses of cobwebs that drooped like funereal stalactites from the ceiling the fungi that sprouted in corners and the snail tracks that glistened in the lamplight on the stone floor all contributed to a vault-like sepulchral effect that was most unpleasantly suggestive of what might have been and very nearly had been my late prison was easily distinguished by the two holes in the door we looked in but that cellar was completely empty save for a few chips of wood and a pinch or two of sawdust memorials of my sojourn in the lethal chamber at which i could hardly look without a shudder 
Then we passed on to the next cellar, the one adjoining my prison, and this was an object of no little curiosity to me. Here, while I was securely bolted into my cell, that unknown villain had, deliberately and in cold blood, made all the arrangements for my murder, arrangements which he little suspected that I should survive to look upon. Thorndyke, too, was interested. He stood at the open door, looking in as if considering the positions of various objects, as in fact he was. "'Someone has been here since last night, Jervis,' said he. "'Yes,' agreed Jervis. "'That gas bottle has been taken down from the opening. You see, Jardine,' he continued, "'he had stood that big packing-case up on end, and laid the gas bottle along the top, with its nozzle just opposite the hole. Two other bottles were standing upright with their nozzles upwards.' "'I understand,' said Thorndyke, "'that you heard three bottles only turned on.' "'Yes,' I answered. "'There was the one opposite the hole, and two others.' "'I ask,' Thorndyke said, "'because there are, as you see, seven other bottles lying by the wall. "'Those are all empty. "'We tried them when we came here last night.' "'I know nothing about those others,' said I. The three bottles that I have mentioned I heard distinctly, and after he had turned on the third, the man went out of the cellar and closed up the door. Then, said Thorndyke, the other seven were presumably used for some other, and, let us hope, more legitimate purpose. I wonder why our friend has been at the trouble of moving the cylinders. Perhaps, suggested Jervis, he thought that the arrangement might be a little too illuminating for the police if they should happen to pay a visit to the place. He may not be aware that the apparatus had already been inspected in situ by us. Or again, the cylinders may have been moved by someone else. We are assuming that he is a lawful occupant of the premises, but he may be a mere secret intruder like ourselves, who has discovered that the place is more or less unoccupied, and has made use of the premises and plant for his own benevolent purposes. "'Yes,' agreed Thorndyke, "'that is perfectly true. But we can put the matter to the test, at least negatively.' If the cylinders have been moved by an innocent stranger, they will bear the prints of hands. But why shouldn't the man himself leave the prints of his hands on the cylinders? I asked. Because, my dear Jardine, he is too knowing a bird. Jervis and I went carefully over the cylinders last night, in the hope of getting a few fingerprints to submit to Scotland Yard, but not a vestige could we find. Our friend has seen to that. We assumed that he had operated in gloves and your description of him confirmed our assumption, which, in its way, is an interesting fact, for a man who is knowing enough to take these precautions has probably had some previous experience of crime, or at least has some acquaintance with the ways of criminals. The suggestion, in fact, is that, although this is not an ordinary professional crime, the perpetrator may be a professional criminal. And the further suggestion is, of course, that of very deliberate premeditation. While he had been speaking, he had produced from his pocket a small flattened bottle fitted with a metal cap and filled with a yellowish powder. Removing the cap and uncovering a perforated inner cap, like that of an iodoform dredger, he proceeded to shake a cloud of the light powder over the three upper cylinders, drying them with his foot to make the powder spread. Then he blew sharply on them, one after the other, when the powder disappeared from their surfaces, leaving visible one or two shapeless whitened smears, but never a trace of a fingerprint, or even the shape of a hand. Thorndyke rose and slipped the bottle back in his pocket. "'Apparently,' said he, "'the cylinders were moved by our unknown friend, with the same careful precautions as on the first occasion. A wary gentleman, this, Jervis. He'll give us a run for our money, at any rate.' "'Yes,' agreed Jervis. He doesn't mean to give himself away. He preserves his incognito most punctiliously. I'll say that for him. And meanwhile, said Thorndyke, we had better proceed with our measures for drawing him out of this modest retirement. I want you, Jardine, to look round this cellar and tell us if any of the things that you see in it reminds you of anything that has happened to you, or suggests any thought or reflection. I looked round, I'm afraid rather vacantly. A more unsuggestive collection of objects I've never looked upon. There are the gas cylinders, I said feebly, but I've told you about them. I don't see anything else, except a few oddments of rubbish. 
"'Then take a good look at the rubbish,' said he. "'Remember that it may be necessary at some future time for you to recall exactly what this cellar was like and what it contained. You may even have to make a sworn statement. So cast your eye round and tell us what you see.' I did so, wondering inwardly what the deuce I was expected to see, and what might be the importance of my seeing it. "'I see,' said I, "'a mouldy-looking cellar about fifteen feet by twelve, with very bad brick walls, a plaster ceiling in an advanced stage of decay, and a concrete floor. In the left-hand wall is a hole about six inches square opening into the adjoining cellar. The contents are ten gas cylinders, all apparently empty, a key or spanner which seems to have been used to turn the cocks, a large packing case, which, to judge by its shape, seems to have contained gas cylinders. The word large, interrupted Thorndyke, is not a particularly exact one. Well, then, a packing case about seven feet long by two and a half feet wide and deep. That's better, said Thorndyke. Always give your dimensions in quantitative terms, if possible. Go on. There are a couple of waterproof sheets, said I. I don't see quite what they can have been used for. Never mind their use, said Thorndyke. Note the fact that they are here. I have, said I, and that seems to complete the list, with the exception of the straw in which I suppose the gas cylinders were packed. There is a large quantity of that, but not more than would seem necessary for the purpose. And that seems to complete the inventory, and I may say that none of these things conveys any suggestion whatever to my mind. Probably not, said Thorndyke, and it is quite possible that none of these things has any particular significance at all, but as they are the only facts offered us, we must make the best of them. There is one other cellar that we have not yet looked into, I think. We came out, and, walking along the passage, came to another door which stood slightly ajar. Thorndyke opened it, and, throwing in the light of his lamp, revealed a considerable stack of long iron gas bottles, and one or two packing cases similar to the one I had already seen. "'I presume,' said he, "'that these are full cylinders, the store from which our friend got his supply. But we may as well make sure.' He ran back into the adjoining cellar, and returned with the spanner with which he proceeded to turn the cock of one of the topmost cylinders, upon which a loud hiss and a thin snowy cloud showed that his surmise was correct. He had just closed the cock and stepped out into the passage to take back the spanner, when I saw him stop suddenly as if listening. And then he sniffed once or twice. "'What is it?' asked Jervis. But Thorndyke, without replying, ran quickly along the passage and up the steps, and I heard him trying the door at the top. "'Bring up one of the empty cylinders.' he said quietly. They have bolted us in, and apparently set fire to the place. We did not require much urging to act quickly. Picking up one of the long, ponderous iron cylinders, we ran with it along the passage towards the light of Thorndyke's lamp. As we ascended the steps, I became plainly aware of the smell of burning wood and of a crackling sound, faintly audible through the massive door. "'There is only one bolt,' said Thorndyke. "'I noticed it as we came in.' I will throw my light on the part of the door where it is fixed, and you two must batter on that spot with the cylinder. The door was, as I have said, a massive one, but it would have been a massive door indeed that could have withstood the blows of that ponderous iron cylinder wielded by two strong men whose lives depended on their efforts. At the very first crash of the battering ram, a tiny chink opened, and at each thundering blow the building shook. Furiously we pounded at the thick, plank-built door, and slowly the chink widened as the screws of the bolt tore out of the woodwork, and as the chink opened a thin reek of pungent smoke filtered in, and the cold light of Thorndyke's lantern became contrasted with a red glare from without. And then, suddenly, the door, under the heavy battering, burst from its fastenings and swung open. A blinding, choking cloud of smoke and sparks rolled in upon us, through which we could see in the corridor outside a pile of straw and crates and broken packing cases, blazing and cracking furiously. It looked as if we were cut off beyond all hope. Jervis and I had dropped the now useless cylinder and were gazing in horror at the blazing mass that filled the corridor and cut off our only means of escape, 
when we were recalled by the voice of Thorndyke, speaking in his usual quiet and precise manner. "'We must get the full cylinders up as quickly as possible,' said he. And, running down the steps, he made straight for the end cellar, whither we followed him. Picking up one of the cylinders, we carried it quickly to the top of the steps. "'Lay it down,' said Thorndyke, "'and fetch another.' Jervis and I ran back to the cellar, and taking up another cylinder, brought it along the passage. As we were ascending the steps, there suddenly arose a loud, penetrating hiss, and as we reached the top, we saw Thorndyke disengaging the spanner from the cock of the cylinder, out of which a jet of liquid was issuing, mingled with a dense, snowy cloud. An instantaneous glance, as we laid down the fresh cylinder, reassured me very considerably. The icy, volatile liquid and the falling cloud of intensely cold carbonic acid snow had produced an immediate effect, as was evident in a black and smouldering patch in the midst of the blazing mass. With reviving hope I followed Jervis once more down the steps and along the passage to the end cellar, from which we brought forth a third cylinder. By this time the passage was so filled with smoke that it was difficult either to see or to breathe, and the bright light that had first poured in through the open doorway had already pulled down so far that Thorndyke's figure, framed in the opening, loomed dim and shadowy amidst the smoke and against the dusky red background. We found him, when we reached the top of the steps, holding the great gas bottle and directing the stream of snow and liquid onto those parts of the wood and straw from which flames still issued. "'It will be all right,' he said in his calm, unemotional way. "'The fire had not really got an effective start. "'The straw made a great show, but that is nearly all burned now, "'and all this carbonic acid gas will soon smother the burning wood. "'But we must be careful that it doesn't smother us, too. "'The steps will be the safest place for the present.' "'He opened the cock of the new cylinder, "'and, having placed it so that it played on the most refractory part of the burning mass, back to the steps where jervis and i stood looking through the doorway the fire was as he had said rapidly dying down the volumes of gas produced by the evaporation of the liquid and the melting snow cut off the supply of air so that in place of the flames that had at first looked so alarming only a dense reek of smoke arose now said thorndyke after we had waited on the steps a couple of minutes more i think we might make a sortie and put an end to it if you can get the smouldering stuff off that wooden floor down on to the stone, the danger will be over. He led the way cautiously into the corridor, and, once more bringing his electric lamp into requisition, he began to kick the smouldering cases and crates and the blackened masses of straw down the steps onto the stone floor of the passage, whither we followed them and scattered them with our feet until they were completely safe from any chance of reignition. There, said Jervis giving a final kick at a small heap of smoking straw. "'I should think that ought to do. There's no fear of that stuff lighting up again. And if I may venture to make the remark, the sooner we're off these premises, the happier I shall be. Our friend's methods of entertaining his visitors are a trifle too strenuous for my taste. He might try dynamite next.' "'Yes,' I agreed. "'Or he might take pot-shots at us, with a revolver, from some dark corner.' "'It is much more likely,' said Thorndyke. That he has cleared off in anticipation of the alarm of fire. Still, it is undeniable that we shall be safer outside. Shall I go first and show you a light? He piloted us along the corridor and up the cobbled yard, putting away his lamp as he unlocked the wicket. There was no sign of anyone about the premises, nor, when we had passed out of the gate, was there anyone in sight in the street. I looked about, expecting to see some sign of the fire but there was no smoke visible, and only a slight smell of burning wood. The smoke must have drifted out at the back. Well, Thorndyke remarked, it has been quite an exciting little episode, and a highly satisfactory finish, as things turned out, though it might easily have been very much the reverse. But for the fortunate chance of those gas bottles being available, I don't think we should be alive at this moment. No, agreed Jervis, we should be in much the same condition by this time as Batson's late patient, Mr. Maddock, or at least well on our way to that disembodied state. However, all's well that ends well. Are you coming our way, Jardine? I will walk a little way with you, said I. Then I must go back to Batson to settle up and fetch my traps. I walked with them to Oxford Street, and we discussed our late adventure as we went. It was a pretty strong hint to clear out, wasn't it? Jervis remarked. Yes, 
replied Thorndyke. "'It didn't leave us much option. But the affair can't be left at this. I shall have a watch set on those premises. I shall make some more particular inquiries about Mr. Gill. By the way, Jardine, I haven't your address. I'd better have it in case I want to communicate with you, and you'd better have my card in case anything turns up which you think I ought to know.' We accordingly exchanged cards, and as we had now reached the corner of Oxford Street, I wished my friends adieu, and thoughtfully retraced my steps to Jacob Street. End of chapter 7Chapter 8 of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. It's an ill wind. London is a wonderful place. From the urban greyness of Jacob Street to the borders of Hampstead Heath was, even in those days of the slow horse tram, but a matter of minutes. A good many minutes, perhaps, but still considerably under an hour. Yet, in that brief and leisurely journey, one exchanged the grim sordidness of a most unlovely street for the solitude and sweet rusticity of open and charming country. A day or two after my second adventure in the mineral waterworks, I was leaning on the parapet of the viaduct, the handsome red-brick viaduct with which some builder, unknown to me, had spanned the pond beyond the upper heath, apparently with purely decorative motive, and in a spirit of sheer philanthropy, for no road seemed to lead anywhere in particular over it, and there was no reason why any wayfarer should wish to cross the pond rather than walk round it. Indeed, in those days it was covered by a turfy expanse seldom trodden by any feet but those of the sheep that grazed in the meadows bordering the pond. I leaned on the parapet, smoking my pipe with deep contentment and looking down into the placid water. Flags and rushes grew at its borders, Water lilies spread their flat leaves on its surface, and a small party of urchins angled from the margin, with the keen joy of the juvenile sportsman who suspects that his proceedings are unlawful. I had lounged on the parapet for several minutes when I became aware of a man approaching along the indistinct track that crossed the viaduct, and, as he drew near, I recognized him as the keeper whom I had met in Kenwood on the morning after my discovery of the body in Millfield Lane. I would have let him pass with a smile of recognition, but he had no intention of passing. Touching his hat politely, he halted, and, having wished me good morning, remarked, "'You didn't tell me, sir, what it was you were looking for that morning when I met you in the wood.' "'No,' I replied. "'But apparently someone else has.' "'Well, sir, you see,' he said, the sergeant came up the next day with a plain-clothes man to have a look round, and, as the sergeant is an old acquaintance of mine, he gave me the tip as to what they were after. I'm sorry, sir, you didn't tell me what you were looking for. Why? I asked. Well, he replied, we might have found something if we had looked while the tracks were fresh. Unfortunately, there was a gale in the night that fetched down a lot of leaves and blew up those that had already fallen, so that any footmarks would have got hidden before the sergeant came. "'What did the police officers seem to think about it?' I asked. "'Why, to speak the truth,' the keeper replied, "'they seemed to think it was all bogey.' "'Do you mean to say,' I asked, "'that they thought I had invented the whole story?' "'Oh, no, sir,' he replied, "'not that. "'They believed you had seen a man lying in the lane, "'but they didn't believe that he was a dead man, "'and they thought your imagination had misled you about the tracks.' "'Then I suppose they didn't find anything?' said I. No, they didn't, and I haven't been able to find anything myself, though I've had a good look round. And then, after a brief pause, I wonder, he said, if you would care to come up to the wood and have a look at the place yourself. I considered for a moment. I had nothing to do, for I was taking a day off, and the man's proposal sounded rather attractive. Finally, I accepted his offer, and we turned back together towards the wood. Hampstead, the Hampstead of those days, was singularly rustic and remote. But, within the wood, it was incredible that the town of London actually lay within the sound of a church bell or the flight of a bullet. Along the shady paths, carpeted with moss and silvery lichen, overshadowed by the boughs of noble beeches, or in leafy hollows with the humus of centuries under our feet, 
and the whispering silence of the woodland all around, we might have been treading the glades of some primeval forest. Nor was the effect of this strange remoteness less, when presently, emerging from the thicker portion of the wood, we came upon a moss-grown, half-ruinous boathouse on the sedgy margin of a lake, in which was drawn up a rustic-looking and evidently little-used punt. "'It's wonderful quiet about here, sir,' the keeper remarked, as a water-hen stole out from behind a clump of high rushes and scrambled over the leaves of the water-lilies. "'And presumably,' I remarked, "'it's quieter still at night.' "'You're right, sir,' the keeper replied. "'If that man had got as far as this, he'd have had mighty little trouble in putting the body where no one was ever likely to look for it.' "'I suppose,' said I, "'that you had a good look at the edges of the lake.' "'Yes,' he answered. "'I went right round it, and so did the police, for that matter, and we had a good look at the punt, too. But, all the same, it wouldn't surprise me if, one fine day, that body came floating up among the lilies. Always supposing, that is,' he added, "'that there really was a body.' "'How far is it?' I asked. "'From the lake to the place where you met me that morning?' "'It's only a matter of two or three minutes,' he answered. We may as well walk that way, and you can see for yourself. Accordingly, we set forth together, and coming presently upon one of the moss-grown paths, followed it past a large summer-house, until we came in sight of the beach beyond which I had encountered him while I was searching for the tracks. As we went, he plied me with questions as to what I had seen on the night in the lane, and I made no scruple of telling him all that I had told the police, seeing that they, on their side, had made no secret of the matter. Of course, it was idle after this long period, for it was now more than seven weeks since I had seen the body, to attempt anything in the nature of research. It certainly did look as if the man who had stolen into that wood that night had been bound for the solitary lake. The punt, I had noticed, was only secured with a rope, so that the murderer, for such I assumed he must have been, could easily have carried his dreadful burden out into the middle, and there sunk it with weights, and so hidden it for ever. It was a quick, simple, and easy method of hiding the traces of his crime, and, if the police had not thought it worth while to search the water with drags, there was no reason why the buried secret should not remain buried for all time. After we had walked for some time about the pleasant, shady wood, less shady now that the yellowing leaves were beginning to fall with the passing of autumn, the keeper conducted me to the exit by which I had left on the previous occasion. As I was passing out of the wicket, my eye fell once more on the cottage which I had then noticed, and, recalling the remark that my fair acquaintance had let fall concerning the artist to whom the derelict knife was supposed to belong, I said, "'You mentioned, I think, that that house was let to an artist.' "'It was,' he replied. "'But it's empty now. The artist has gone away.' "'It must be a pleasant little house to live in,' I said, "'at any rate in summer.' "'Yes,' he replied. "'A country house within an hour's walk of the Bank of England. "'Would you like to have a look at it, sir? "'I've got the keys.' "'Now, I certainly had no intention of offering myself as a tenant, "'but, yet, to an idle man, "'there is a certain attractiveness in an empty house of an eligible kind.' a certain interest in roaming through the rooms and letting one's fancy furnish them with one's own household goods. I accepted the man's invitation, and, opening the wide gate that admitted to the garden from a by-road, we walked up to the door of the house. "'It's quite a nice little place,' the keeper remarked. "'There isn't much garden, you see, but then you've got the heath all round, and there's a small stable and coach-house if you should be wanting to go into town.' "'Did the last tenant keep any kind of carriage?' I asked. "'I don't think so,' said the keeper. "'But I fancy he used to hire a little cart sometimes when he had things to bring in from town. But I don't know very much about him or his habits.' We walked through the empty rooms together, looking out of the windows and commenting on the pleasant prospects that all of them commanded, and talking about the man who had last lived in the house. "'He was a queer sort of fellow,' said the keeper. He and his wife seem to have lived here all alone without any servant, and they seem often to have left the house to itself for a day or two at a time. But he could paint. I have stopped and had a look when he has been at work, and it was wonderful to see how he knocked off those pictures. He didn't seem to use brushes, but he had a lot of knives, 
like little trowels, and he used to shovel the paint on with them, and he always wore gloves when he was painting. Didn't like to get the paint on his hands, I suppose. It sounds as if it would be very awkward, I said. Just what I should have thought, the keeper agreed. But he didn't seem to find it so. This seems to be the place that he worked in. Apparently the keeper was right. The room which we had now entered was evidently the late studio, and did not appear to have been cleaned up since the tenant left. The floor was littered with scraps of paper on which a palette knife had been cleaned, with empty paint tubes and one or two broken and worn-out brushes, and, in a packing case, which seemed to have served as a receptacle for rubbish, were one or two canvases that had been torn from their stretchers and thrown away. I picked them out and glanced at them with some interest, remembering what my fair friend had said. For the most part they were mere experiments or failures, deliberately defaced with strokes or daubs of paint, but one of them was a quite spirited and attractive sketch, rough and unfinished, but skilfully executed and undefaced. I stretched out the crumpled canvas and looked at it with considerable interest, for it represented Millfield Lane, and showed the large elms and the posts and the high fence under which I had sheltered in the rain. In fact, it appeared to have been taken from the exact spot on which the body had been lying, and from which I had made my own drawing. Not that there was anything in the latter coincidence, for it was the only sketchable spot in the lane. "'It's really quite a nice sketch,' I said. "'It seems a pity to leave it here among the rubbish.' "'It does, sir,' the keeper agreed. "'If you like it, you'd better roll it up and put it in your pocket. You won't be robbing anyone.' As it seemed that I was but rescuing it from a rubbish heap, I ventured to follow the keeper's advice, and, rolling the canvas up, carefully stowed it in my pocket. And shortly after, as I had now seen all that there was to see, which was mighty little, we left the house, and, at the gate, the keeper took leave of me with a touch of his hat. I made my way slowly back towards my lodgings by way of the Spaniards' Road and Hampstead Lane, turning over in my mind as I went the speculations suggested by my visit to the wood. Of the existence of the lake I had not been previously aware. Now that I had seen it, I felt very little doubt that it was known to the mysterious murderer, for such I felt convinced he was, who must have been lurking in the lane that night when I was sheltering under the lee of the fence. The route that he had then taken appeared to be the direct route to the lake, that he was carrying the body I had no doubt whatever, and seeing that he had carried it so far, it appeared probable that he had some definite hiding-place in view. And what hiding-place could be so suitable as this remote piece of still water? No digging, no troublesome and dangerous preparation would be necessary. There was the punt in readiness to bear him to the deep water in the middle, a silent, easily handled conveyance, a few stones or some heavy object from the boathouse would be all that was needful, and in a moment he would be rid for ever of the dreadful witness of his crime. Thus reflecting, not without dissatisfaction at the passive part that I had played in this sinister affair, I passed through the turnstile or kissing gate at the entrance to Millfield Lane. Almost certainly the murderer or the victim, or both, had passed through that very gate on the night of the tragedy. The thought came to me with added solemnity, with the recollection of the silent wood and the dark, still water fresh in my mind, and caused me unconsciously to tread more softly and walk more sedately than usual. The lane was little frequented at any time, and now, at midday, was almost as deserted as at midnight. Very remote it seemed, too, and very quiet, with a silence that recalled the hush of the wood and yet the silence was not quite unbroken. From somewhere ahead, from one of the many windings of the tortuous lane, came the sound of hurried footsteps. I stopped to listen. There were two persons, one treading lightly, the other more heavily, apparently a man and a woman, and both were running, running fast. There was nothing remarkable in this, perhaps, but yet the sound smote on my ear with a certain note of alarm that made me quicken my pace and listen yet more intently. And suddenly there came another sound, a muffled, whimpering cry like that of a frightened woman. Instantly I gave an answering shout and sprang forward at a swift run. 
I had turned one of the numerous corners and was racing down a straight stretch of the lane when a woman darted round the corner ahead and ran towards me, holding out her hands. I recognized her at a glance, though now she was dishevelled, pale, wild-eyed, breathless, and nearly frantic with terror, and rage against her assailant spurred me on to greater speed. But when I would have passed her to give chase to the wretch, she clutched my arm frantically with both hands and detained me. "'Let me go and catch the scoundrel!' I exclaimed, but she only clung the tighter. "'No!' she panted. "'Don't leave me! I'm terrified! Don't go away!' I ground my teeth. Even as we stood, I could hear the ruffian's footsteps receding as rapidly as they had advanced. In a few moments he would be beyond pursuit. "'Do let me go and stop that villain!' I implored. "'You're quite safe now, and you can follow me and keep me in sight.' But she shook her head passionately, and still clutching my sleeve with one hand, pressed the other to her heart. "'No, no, no!' she gasped, with a catch in her voice that was almost a sob. "'I can't be alone. I'm frightened. Oh, please don't go away from me.' What could I do? The poor girl was evidently beside herself with terror, and exhausted by her frantic flight. It would have been cruel to leave her in that state. But all the same it was infuriating. I had no idea what the man had done to terrify her in this way. But that was of no consequence." The natural impulse of a healthy young man when he learns that a woman has been ill-used is to hammer the offender effectively in the first place, and then to inquire into the affair. That was what I wanted to do, but it was not to be. "'Well,' I said, by way of compromise, "'let us walk back together. Perhaps we may be able to find out which way the man went.' To this she agreed. I drew her arm through mine, for she was still trembling, and looked faint and weak and we began to retrace her steps towards Highgate. Of course the man was nowhere to be seen, and by the time that we had returned to the sharp corner where I had found the body of the priest, the man was not only out of sight, but his footsteps were no longer audible. Still, we went on for some distance in the hopes of meeting someone who could tell us which way the miscreant had gone, but we met nobody. Only, some distance past the posts, we came in sight of a sketching-box and a camp-stool, lying by the side of the path. "'Surely those are your things,' I said. "'Yes,' she answered. "'I had forgotten all about them. I dropped them when I began to run.' I picked up the box and the stool, and debated with myself whether it was worth while to go on any farther. From where we stood, nothing was to be seen, for the lane was still enclosed on both sides by a seven-foot fence of oak boards. But the chance of overtaking the fugitive was not to be considered. By this time he was probably out of the lane, on the heath or in the surrounding meadows. And meanwhile my companion, though calmer and less breathless, looked very pale and shaken. "'I don't know that it's any use,' I said, "'to tire you by going any farther. The man is evidently gone.' She seemed relieved at my decision, and it then occurred to me to suggest that she should sit down a while on the bank under the high fence to recover herself and to this, too, she assented gladly. "'If it wouldn't distress you,' I said, "'would you mind telling me what had happened?' She pondered for a few seconds, and then answered, "'It doesn't sound much in the telling, and I expect you'll think me very silly to be so much upset.' "'I'm sure I shan't,' I said, with perfect confidence in the correctness of my statement. "'Well,' she said, "'what happened was this.' as nearly as I can remember. I was coming up the path from the ponds, and I had to pass a man who was leaning against the fence by the stile. As I came near to him, he looked at me at first, in quite an ordinary way, and then he suddenly began to stare in a most singular and disturbing fashion, not at me so much as at this little crucifix, which I wear, hung from my neck. As I passed through the turnstile, he spoke to me. Would you mind letting me look at that crucifix, he asked. It was a most astonishing piece of impertinence, and I was so taken aback that I hardly had the presence of mind to refuse. However, I did, and very decidedly, too. Then he came up to me, and, in a most threatening and alarming manner, said, You found that crucifix. You picked it up somewhere near here. It's mine, and I'll ask you to let me have it, if you please. Now, 
but this was perfectly untrue. The crucifix was given to me by my father when I was quite a little child, and I've worn it ever since I have been grown up. Ever since he died, in fact, six years ago. I told the man this, but he made no pretense of believing me, and was evidently about to renew his demand when two laborers appeared, coming down the lane. I thought this a good opportunity to escape, and walked away quickly up the lane. It was very silly of me. I ought to have gone the other way. Of course you ought, I agreed. You ought to have got out into a public road at once. Yes, I see that now, she said. It was very foolish of me. However, I walked on pretty quickly, for there was something in the man's face that had frightened me, and I was anxious to get home. I looked back from time to time, and, when I saw no sign of the man, I began to recover myself. But just as I had got to the most solitary part of the lane, just about where we are now, shut in by these high fences, I heard quick footsteps behind me. I looked back and saw the man coming after me. Then I suppose I got in a sudden panic, for I dropped my sketching things and began to run. But as soon as I began to run, the man broke into a run too. I raced for my life, and when I heard the man gaining on me, I suppose I must have called out. Then I heard your shout from the upper part of the lane, and ran on faster than ever to gain your protection. That's all, and I suppose you think that I've been making a great fuss about nothing. I don't think anything of the kind, I said, and neither would our absent friend, if I could get hold of him. By the way, what sort of person was he? A tramp? Oh, no, quite a respectable-looking person. In fact, he would have passed for a gentleman. Can you give any sort of description of him? Not that verbal descriptions are of much use, except in the case of a hunchback or a Chinaman or some other easily identifiable creature. No, they're not, she agreed, and I don't think that I can tell you much about this man, excepting that he was clean-shaved, of medium height, quite well-dressed, and wore a round head and slate-coloured suede gloves, "'I'm afraid we shan't get hold of him from that description,' I said. "'The only thing that you can do is to avoid solitary places for the present, "'and not to come through this lane again alone.' "'Yes,' she said. "'I suppose I must. "'But it's very unfortunate. "'One cannot always take a companion when one goes sketching, "'even if it were desirable, which it is not.' As to the desirability, in the case of a good-looking girl, of wandering about alone in solitary places, I had my own opinions, and very definite opinions they were, but I kept them to myself. And so we sat silent for a while. She was still pale and agitated, and perhaps her recital of her misadventure had not been wholly beneficial. At the moment that this idea occurred to me, a crackling in my breast-pocket reminded me of the forgotten canvas and I bethought me that perhaps a change of subject might divert her mind from her very disagreeable experience. Accordingly, I drew the canvas out of my pocket, and, unrolling it, asked her what she thought of the sketch. In a moment she became quite animated. "'Why!' she exclaimed. "'This looks exactly like the work of that artist who was working on the heath a little while ago.' "'It is his,' I replied, considerably impressed.' and rather astonished at her instantaneous recognition. But I didn't know you were so familiar with his work. "'I'm not very familiar with it,' she replied. "'But, as I told you, I sometimes managed to steal a glance or two when I passed him. You see, his technique is so peculiar that it's easily recognized, and it interested me very much. I should have liked to stop and watch him and get a lesson.' "'It is rather peculiar work,' I said looking at the canvas with new interest. Very solid, and yet very smooth. Yes, it is typical knife-work, almost untouched with a brush. That was what interested me. The knife is a dangerous tool for a comparative tyro like myself, but yet one would like to learn how to use it. Did he give you this sketch? I smiled guiltily. The truth is, I admitted, I stole it. "'How dreadful of you!' she said. "'I suppose that you could not be bribed to steal another.' "'I would steal it for nothing if you asked me,' I answered. "'And meanwhile, you had better take possession of this one.' 
it will be of more use to you than to me. She shook her head. No, I won't do that, she said, though it is most kind of you. You paint, I think, don't you? I am only the merest amateur, I replied. I annexed the sketch for the sake of the subject. I have rather an affection for this lane. So had I, said she, until today. Now I hate it. But might I ask how you managed your theft? I told her about the empty cottage and the rejected canvases in the rubbish box. I'm afraid none of the others would be of any use to you, because he had drawn a brushful of paint across each of them. Oh, that wouldn't matter, she said. The brush strokes would be on dry paint and could easily be scraped off. Besides, it is not the subject but the technique that interests me. Then I will get into the cottage somehow and purloin the remaining canvases for you. Oh, but I mustn't give you all this trouble, she protested. It won't be any trouble, I said. I shall quite enjoy a deliberate and determined robbery. But where shall I send the spoil? She produced her card-case, and, selecting a card, handed it to me, with a smile. "'It seems to me,' she said, "'that I am inciting you to robbery and acting as a receiver of stolen goods. But I suppose there is no harm in it, though I feel that I ought not to give you all this trouble.' I made the usual polite rejoinder as I took from her the little magical slip of pasteboard that, in a moment, transformed her from a stranger to an acquaintance and gave her a local habitation and a name. Before bestowing it in my pocket-book, I glanced at the neat copper-plate and read the inscription. Miss Sylvia Vine, The Hawthorns, North End. The effect of our conversation had answered my expectations. Her agitation had passed off, the colour had come back to her cheeks, and, in fact, she seemed quite recovered. Apparently she thought so herself, for she rose, saying that she now felt well enough to walk home, and held out her hand for the colour-box and stool. "'I think,' said I, "'that if you won't consider me intrusive, I should like to see you safely out onto an inhabited road at least.' "'I shall accept your escort gratefully,' she replied, "'as far as the end of the lane, or farther, if it's not taking you too much out of your way.' Needless to say, I would gladly have escorted so agreeable and winsome a protégé from John O'Groats to Land's End, and found it not out of my way at all. And when she passed out of the gate into Hampstead Lane, I clung tenaciously to the box and stool, and turned towards the Spaniards as though no such thing as dismissal had ever been contemplated. In fact, with the reasonable excuse of carrying the impedimenta, I maintained my place by her side in the absence of a definite congé. And so we walked together, talking quite easily, principally about pictures and painting, until, in the pleasant little hamlet, she halted by a garden gate, and, taking her possessions from me, held out a friendly hand. "'Good-bye,' she said. "'I can't thank you enough for all your help and kindness. I hope I have not been very troublesome to you.' I assured her that she had been most amenable, and, when I had once more cautioned her to avoid solitary places, we exchanged a cordial handshake and parted, she to enter the pleasant, rustic-looking house, and I to betake myself back to my lodgings, lightening the way with much agreeable and self-congratulatory reflection. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine Thorndyke Takes Up the Scent At my lodgings, which I reached at an unconscionably late hour for lunch, I found a little surprise awaiting me. A short note from Dr. Thorndyke, asking me if I should be at liberty early on the following afternoon to show him the spot on which I had found the mysterious body. Of course, I answered by return, begging him to come straight on from the hospital to an early lunch, over which we could discuss the facts of the case before setting out. Having dispatched my letter, I called at the offices of the house-agent who had the letting of the cottage on the heath to see if he had duplicate keys. Fortunately he had, and was willing to entrust them to me on the understanding that they should be returned some time during the next day. I did not, however, go on to the cottage for it occurred to me that Thorndyke would probably wish to visit the wood, and I could make my visit and purloin the canvases then. 
A telegram on the following morning informed me that Thorndyke would be with me at twelve o'clock, and, punctually to the minute, he arrived. "'I hope you don't mind me swooping down on you in this fashion,' he said, as the servant showed him into the room. I assured him, very truthfully, that I was delighted to be honoured by a visit from him, and he then proceeded to explain. "'You may wonder, Jardine, why I am busying myself about this case, which is really no business of mine, or at least appears to be none. But the fact is that, as a teacher and a practitioner of medical jurisprudence, I find it advisable to look into any unusual cases. Of course, there is always a considerable probability that I may be consulted concerning any out-of-the-way case, but apart from that, I have the ordinary specialist's interest in anything remarkable in my own speciality. I should think, said I, that it would be well for me to give you all the facts before we start. Exactly, Jardine, he replied. That is what I want. Tell me all you know about the affair, and then we shall be able to test our conclusions on the spot. He produced a large-scale ordnance map, and, folding it under my direction so that it showed only the region in which we were interested, he stood it up on the table against the water bottle, where we could both see it, and marked on it with a pencil each spot as I described it. It is not necessary for me to record our conversation. I told him the whole story as I have already told it to the reader, pointing out on the map the exact locality where each event occurred. "'It's a most remarkable case, Jardine,' was his thoughtful comment when I had finished. "'Most remarkable. Curiously puzzling and inconsistent, too. For you see that, on the one hand, it looks like a casual or accidental crime, and yet, on the other, strongly suggests premeditation.' No man, one would think, could have planned to commit a murder in what is, after all, a public thoroughfare. And yet, the long distance which the body seems to have been carried, and the apparently selected hiding place, seem to suggest the previously considered plan. "'You think that there is no doubt that the man was really dead?' I asked. "'Had you any doubt at the time yourself?' "'None at all,' I replied. "'It was only the disappearance of the body.' and, perhaps, the sergeant's suggestion that made me think it possible that I might have been mistaken. Thorndyke shook his head. "'No, Jardine,' said he. "'The man was dead. We are safe in assuming that. And on that assumption our investigations must be based. The next question is, how was the body taken away? Did you measure the fence?' "'No, but I should say it is about seven feet high.' "'And what kind of fence is it? Are there any footholds?' "'I can show you exactly what the fence is like,' I answered. "'That sketch which I have pinned up on the wall was apparently painted from the exact spot on which the body lay. That fence on the right-hand side is the one under which I sheltered, and is exactly like the one over which the body seems to have been lifted.' Thorndyke rose and walked over to the sketch, which I had fixed to the wall with drawing pins. "'Not a bad sketch, this, Jardine.' he remarked. Very smartly put in, apparently mostly with a knife. Where did you get it? I had to confess that the canvas was unlawfully come by, and told him how I had obtained it. You don't know the artist's name, said Thorndyke, looking closely at the sketch. No, in fact, I know nothing about him, excepting that he worked mostly with a small painting knife, and usually wore kid gloves. "'You don't mean that he worked in gloves?' said Thorndyke. "'So I am told,' said I. "'I never saw him.' "'It's very odd,' said Thorndyke. "'I have heard of men wearing a glove on the pallet hand to keep off the midges, and many men painting gloves in exceptionally cold weather. But this catch seems to have been painted in summer.' "'I suppose,' said I, "'the midges don't confine their attentions to the pallet hand,' And after all, to a man who worked entirely with the knife, a glove wouldn't be really in the way. No, Thorndyke agreed, that is true. He looked closely at the sketch, and even took out his pocket lens to help his vision, which seemed almost unnecessary. It appeared that he was as much interested in the unknown artist's peculiar technique as was my friend, Miss Sylvia Vine. By the way, said he, when he had resumed his seat at the table, 
You were telling me about some kind of gold trinket that you had picked up at the foot of the fence. Shall we have a look at it? I fetched the little gold object from the dispatch box in which I had locked it up, and handed it to him. He turned it over in his fingers, read the letters that were engraved on it, and examined the little piece of silk cord that was attached to one ring. "'There is no doubt,' said he, "'as to the nature of this object, nor of its connection with the dead man. This is evidently a reliquary, and these initials engraved upon it bear out exactly your description of the body. S.V.D.P. evidently means St. Vincent de Paul, who, as you probably know, was a saint who was distinguished for his works of charity.' You have mentioned that the dead man wore a Roman collar, with a narrow, dark stripe up the front. That means that he was the lay brother of some religious order, probably some philanthropic order, to whom St. Vincent de Paul would be an object of special devotion. The other letters, A, M, D, G, are the initials of the words Ad Maiorum de Gloriam, the motto of the Society of Jesus. But as St. Vincent de Paul was not a Jesuit saint, the motto probably refers to the owner of the reliquary, who may have been a Jesuit or a friend of the society. It was apparently attached, perhaps to the neck, by this silk cord, which seems to have been frayed nearly through, and probably broke when the body was drawn over the top of the fence. "'I suppose I ought to have shown it to the police,' I said." "'I suppose you ought,' he replied, "'but as you haven't, I think we'd better say nothing about it now.' He handed it back to me, and I dropped it into my pocket, intending to return it presently to the dispatch-box. A few minutes later we sallied forth on our journey of exploration. It is not necessary to describe this journey in detail, since I have already taken the reader over the ground more than once. We went, of course, to the place where I had found the body, and walked right through to Hampstead Lane.' Then we returned, and reconstituted the circumstances of that eventful night, after which I conducted Thorndyke to the place where I assumed that the body had been lifted over the fence. "'I suppose,' I said, "'we must go round and pick up the track from the other side.' He looked up and down the lane, and smiled. "'Would your quondam professor lose your respect for ever, Jardine, if you saw him climb over a fence in a frock-coat and a topper?' "'No,' I answered. "'but it might look a little quaint if anyone else saw you.' "'I think we'll risk that,' he said. "'There's no one about, and I should rather like to try a little experiment. "'Would you mind if I hoisted you over the fence? "'You're something of an outsize, but then so am I, too, which balances the conditions.' "'Of course I had no objection, and when we had looked up and down the lane "'and listened to make sure that we had no observers, Thorndyke picked me up.' with an ease that rather surprised me, and hoisted me above the level of the fence. "'Is it all clear on the other side?' he asked. "'Yes,' I answered. "'There's no one in sight.' "'Then I want you to be quite passive,' he said, and with this he hoisted me up further until I hung with my own weight across the top of the fence. Leaving me hanging thus, he sprang up lightly, and, having got astride at the top, dropped down on the other side, when he once more took hold of me and drew me over.' "'It wasn't so very difficult,' he said. "'Of course, it would have been more so to a shorter man, but, on the other hand, it is extremely unlikely that the body was anything like your size and weight.' We now followed the track up to the wood, which we entered by an opening in the fence, through which I assumed that the murderer had probably passed. I conducted Thorndyke by the nearest route to the boathouse, and, when he had thoroughly examined the place and made notes of the points that appeared to interest him, I showed him the way out by the turnstile. It was here when we came in sight of the cottage that I besought me of my promise to Miss Vine, and somewhat sheepishly explained the matter to Thorndyke. "'It won't take me a minute to go in and sneak the things,' I said apologetically, and was proposing that he should walk on slowly, when he interrupted me. "'I'll come in with you,' said he. "'There may be something else to filch. Besides, I am rather partial to empty houses.' There is something quite interesting, I think, in looking over the traces of recent occupation and speculating on the personality and habits of the late occupiers. Don't you find it so? I said yes, truthfully enough, for it was a feeling of this kind that at first led me to look over the cottage. But my interest was nothing to Thorndyke's, 
for no sooner had I let him in at the front door than he began to browse about through the empty rooms and passages, for all the world like a cat that had just been taken to a new house. This was evidently the studio, he remarked, as we entered the room from which I had taken the canvas. He doesn't seem to have had much of an outfit, as he appears to have worked on his sketching easel. You can see the indentations made by the toe points. There are no marks of the casters of a studio easel. You notice, too, that he sat on a camp-stool to work. It did not appear to me to matter very much what he had sat on, but I kept this opinion to myself, and watched Thorndyke curiously as he picked up the empty paint tubes and scrutinized them one after the other. His inquisitiveness filled me with amused astonishment. He turned out the rubbish box completely, and having looked over every inch of the discarded canvases, he began systematically to examine, one by one, the pieces of paper on which the late resident had wiped his palette knife. Having rolled up and pocketed the waste canvases, I expressed myself as ready to depart. "'If you are not in a hurry,' said Thorndyke, "'I should like to look over the rest of the premises.' He spoke as though we were inspecting some museum or exhibition, and indeed his interest and attention, as he wandered from room to room, were greater than that of the majority of visitors to a public gallery. He even insisted on visiting the little stable and coach-house, and when he had explored them both, ascended the rickety steps to the loft over the latter. "'I suppose,' said I, "'this was the lumber-room or store. Judging by the quantity of straw, it would seem as if some cases had been unpacked here.' probably agreed thorndyke in fact you can see where the cases have been dragged along and also by that smooth indented line where some heavy metallic object has been slid along the floor perhaps if we look over the straw we may be able to judge what those cases contained it didn't seem to me to matter a brass farthing what they contained but again i made no remark and together we moved the great mass of straw almost handful by handful from one end of the loft to the other while Thorndyke not only examined the straw, but even closely scrutinized the floor on which it lay. As far as I could see, all this minute and apparently purposeless searching was entirely without result, until we were in the act of removing the last armful of straw from the corner, and even then the object that came to light did not appear a very remarkable one under the circumstances, though Thorndyke seemed to find what appeared to me a most unreasonable interest in it. The object was a pair of canvas pliers, which Thorndyke picked up almost eagerly, and examined with profound attention. "'What do you make of that, Jardine?' he asked at length, handing the implement to me. "'It's a pair of canvas pliers,' I replied. "'Obviously,' he rejoined. "'But what do you suppose they have been used for?' "'I opined that they had been used for straining canvases, that being their manifest function. "'But,' objected Thorndyke, he would hardly have strained his canvases up here. Besides, you will notice that they have, in fact, been used for something else. You observe that the handles are slightly bent, as if something had been held with great force. And if you look at the jaws, you will see that that something was a metallic object, about three-quarters of an inch wide, with sharp corners. Now, what do you make of that? I looked at the pliers, inwardly reflecting that I didn't care tuppence what the object was, and finally said that I would give it up. "'The problem does not interest you keenly,' Thorndyke remarked with a smile. "'And yet it ought to, you know. However, we may consider the matter on some future occasion. Meanwhile, I shall follow your pernicious example and purloin the pliers.' His interest in this complete stranger appeared to me very singular and it seemed for the moment to have displaced that in the mysterious case which was the object of his visit to me. "'A strange, vagabond sort of man that artist must have been,' he remarked, as we walked home across the heath. "'But I suppose one picks up vagabond habits in travelling about the world.' "'Do you gather that he travelled much, then?' I asked. "'He appears to have visited New York, Brussels, and Florence, which is a selection suggesting other travels.' I was wondering vaguely how Thorndyke had arrived at these facts, and was indeed about to ask him, when he suddenly changed the subject by saying, "'I suppose, Jardine, you don't wander about this place alone at night?' "'I do sometimes,' I replied. "'Then I shouldn't,' he said. "'You must remember that a very determined attempt has been made on your life, 
and it would be unreasonable to suppose that it was made without some purpose. But that purpose is still unaccomplished. You don't know who your enemy is, and consequently can take no precautions against him, excepting by keeping away from solitary places. It is an uncomfortable thought, but at present you have to remember that any chance stranger may be an intending murderer. So be on your guard. I promised to bear his warning in mind, though I must confess his language seemed to me rather exaggerated. And so we walked on, chatting about various matters until we arrived at my lodgings. Thorndyke was easily persuaded to come in and have tea with me, and while we were waiting for its arrival, he renewed his examination of the sketch upon the wall. "'Aren't you going to have this strained on a stretcher?' he asked. I replied, "'Yes, and that I intended to take it with me the next time I went into town.' "'Let me take it for you,' said Thorndyke. "'I should like to show it to Jervis, to illustrate the route that we have marked on the map. Then I can have it left at any place that you like.' I mentioned the name of an artist's colour man in the Hampstead Road, and, unpinning the canvas, rolled it up and handed it to him. He took it from me, and, rolling it up methodically and carefully, bestowed it in his breast pocket. Then he brought forth the map, and as we drank our tea and talked over our investigations, he checked our route on it and marked the position of the cottage. Shortly after tea he took his leave and I then occupied an agreeable half-hour in composing a letter to Miss Vine to accompany the loot from the deserted house. End of chapter 9《Chapter 10 of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon Chapter 10 The Unheeded Warning Thorndyke's warning, so emphatically expressed, ought to have been alike unnecessary and effective. As a matter of fact, it was neither. I suppose that, to a young man not naturally timorous, the idea of a constantly lurking danger amidst the prosaic conditions of modern civilization is one that is not readily accepted. At any rate, the fact is that I continued to walk abroad by day and by night with as much unconcern as if nothing unusual had ever befallen me. It was not that the recollection of those horrible hours in the poisoned cellar had in any way faded. That incident I could never forget. But I think that in the back of my mind there still lingered the idea of a homicidal lunatic, though that idea had been so scornfully rejected by Thorndyke. But before I describe the amazing experience by which I once more came within a hair's breadth of a sudden and violent death, I must refer to another incident, not because it seemed to be connected with that alarming occurrence, but because it came first in the order of time, and had its own significance later. It was a couple of days after Thorndyke's visit that I walked down the Hampstead Road with the intention of fetching the sketch from the artist's colour man's. The shop was within a few hundred yards of Jacob Street, and as I crossed the end of that street I was just considering whether I ought to look in on Batson, when a lady bowed to me and made as if she would stop. It was Mrs. Samway. Of course I stopped and shook hands, and while I was making the usual polite inquiries, I felt myself once more impressed with the unusualness of the woman. Even in her dress she was unlike other women, though not in the least eccentric or bizarre. At present she was clothed from head to foot in black, but a scarlet bird's wing in a coquettish little velvet toque and a scarlet bow at her throat gave an effect of colour that, unusual as it was, harmonized completely and naturally with her jet-black hair and her strange un-english beauty so you haven't started for paris yet i remarked no she replied my husband has gone and may perhaps come back at any rate i am staying in england for the present then i may possibly have the pleasure of seeing you again i said and she graciously replied that she hoped it might be so as we shook hands and parted a few minutes later, in the artist's colourman's shop, I had another chance meeting, and a more agreeable one. The proprietor had just produced the sketch, now greatly improved in appearance by being strained on a stretcher, when the glass door opened and a young lady entered the shop. Imagine my surprise when that young lady turned out to be none other than Miss Vine. "'Well!' I exclaimed, as we mutually recognised each other. "'What an extraordinary coincidence!' 
"'I don't see that it is very extraordinary,' she replied. "'Most of the Hampstead people come here because it's the nearest place where you can get proper artist materials. Is that the sketch you were telling me about?' "'Yes,' I answered, "'and it's the pick of the loot. But it isn't too late to alter your mind. Say the word and it's yours.' "'Well,' she replied with a smile, "'I'm not going to say the word, but I want to thank you for rescuing those other treasures for me.' She had, as a matter of fact, already thanked me in a very pretty little note, but I was not averse to her mentioning the subject again. We stepped back to the door, and in the brighter light looked at the sketch together. "'It's a pity,' she remarked, "'that he handled it so carelessly before the paint was hard. Those finger marks wouldn't matter a bit on a brush-painted surface, but on the smooth knife surface they're rather a disfigurement.' She placed the sketch in my hand, and I backed nearer to the glass door to get a better light. Happening to glance up, I noticed that a sudden and very curious change had come over her, a look of haughty displeasure, and even anger, apparently directed at somebody or something outside the shop. For a few moments I took no notice. Then, half unconsciously, I looked round just as some person moved away from the door. I looked once more at Miss Vine. She was quite unmistakably angry. Her cheeks were flushed, and there was a resentful light in her eyes that gave her an expression quite new to me. I suppose she caught my inquiring glance, for she exclaimed, "'Did you see that woman? I never heard of such impertinence in my life.' "'What did she do?' I asked. "'She came right up to the doorway and looked over your shoulder, and then stared at me in the most singular and insolent manner. I could have slapped her face.' "'Not through the glass door,' I suggested, on which her anger subsided in a ripple of laughter as quickly as it had arisen. "'What was this objectionable person like?' I asked. "'Was she a charwoman, or a slavey?' "'Oh, not at all,' replied Miss Vine. "'Quite a ladylike-looking person, except for her manners. Rather tastefully dressed, too. A black and vermilion scheme of colour. The reply startled me a little. "'Had she a scarlet bird's wing in her hat?' I asked. "'Yes, and a scarlet bow at her throat. "'I hope you're not going to say that you know her.' "'It was a rather delicate situation. "'I could not actually disavow the acquaintance, "'but I did not feel inclined to have a black and scarlet fly "'introduced into the sweet-smelling ointment "'of my intercourse with the fair Sylvia. "'So I explained with great care "'the exact scope of the acquaintance.' on which Miss Vine remarked that she supposed that doctors could not be held responsible for the people they knew, and proceeded to make her purchases. I did not take the sketch away with me after all, for it occurred to me that I might as well leave it to be framed, but instead I carried forth with me the parcel containing Miss Vine's purchases. I had not far to carry it, for she was returning at once to Hampstead. I was tempted to return for the sake of enjoying a chat with her, too, but discreetly withstood the temptation, and, having escorted her to a tram, I turned my face south, and walked away at a leisurely pace into the jaws of an all-unsuspected danger. It was some hours, however, before anything remarkable happened. My immediate objective was Lincoln's Inn Fields, where, at the College of Surgeons, a lecture on epidermic appendages was to be delivered by the Hunterian professor and there, in the college theatre, I spent a delightful hour while the genial professor took his hearers with him on a personally conducted tour among structures that ranged from the plumage of the sunbird to the dermal plates of the crocodile, from the silken locks of beauty to the quills of the porcupine or the male of the armadillo. When I came out, the dusk was just closing in. It was a slightly foggy evening. The last glow of the sunset in the western sky lighted up the haze into a rosy background, against which the shadowy buildings were relieved in shapes of cloudy grey. It was a lovely effect, an effect such as London alone can show, and fugitive as a breath on a mirror. As I sauntered westward up the strand, I presently bethought me that, before the light should have faded completely, I would see how the effect looked by the riverside. Walking quickly down Buckingham Street, I came out on to the embankment, and looked into the west. But the light was nearly gone, the shadows of evening were closing in fast, and the fog, creeping up the river, ushered in the night. I leaned on the parapet, and watched the last glimmer die away, watched the darkness deepen on the river, and the faint lights on the barges moored on the southern shore at first twinkled pallidly, 
and then fade out as the fog thickened. I lit my pipe and looked down at the dark water swirling past, and gradually fell into a train of half-dreamy meditation. Not for the first time since the occurrence, my thoughts turned to Mrs. Samway. Why had she stared at Miss Vine in that singular manner? If indeed it was really Mrs. Samway, and if she really had stared in the manner alleged. It was an odd affair, but, after all, it did not very much matter. And with this, my thoughts rambled off in a new direction. It was to the cottage on the heath that they wanted this time, and the picture of Thorndyke's cat-like prowlings and pryings arose before me. That was very queer, too. Was it possible that this learned and astute man habitually went about eagerly probing into the personal habits and trivial actions of chance strangers? The apparently puerile inquisitiveness that he displayed seemed totally out of character with all that I knew about the man. But then, it often happens that the private life of public men develops personal traits that are surprising and disappointing to those who have only known them in connection with their public activities. I had become so completely immersed in my thoughts as to be almost oblivious of what was happening around. Indeed, there was mighty little happening. The gathering darkness and the thin fog limited my view to a few square yards. Now and again, a muffled hoot from the lower river spoke of life and movement on the water, and at long intervals an occasional wayfarer would pass along the pavement behind me. My reflections had reached the point recorded above, when a person emerged from the obscurity near to the parapet and approached as if to pass close behind me. I only caught the dusky shape indistinctly with the tail of my eye, so indistinctly that I could not say certainly whether it was that of a man or a woman, for I was still gazing down at the dark water. He or she approached quietly, swerving towards me across the wide pavement, and was in the act of passing quite close to me when the thing happened. Of a sudden I felt my knees clasped in a powerful grip, and at the same moment I was lifted off my feet and thrust forward over the parapet. Instinctively I clutched at the stonework, but its flat surface offered nothing for my fingers to grasp. Then my assailant let go, and the next instant I plunged head first into the icy water. It was fortunate for me that the tide was nearly full, else must I almost certainly have broken my neck. As it was, my head struck on the firm mud at the bottom with such force that for some moments I was half stunned. Nevertheless, I must have struck out automatically, for when I began to recover my wits, my head was above water, and I was swimming as actively as my clinging garments would let me. But apparently, in those moments of dazed semi-consciousness, I must have struck out towards the middle of the river, for now I was encompassed by a murky void in which nothing was visible save one or two reddish, luminous patches, presumably the lamps on the embankment. Towards one of these I turned and struck out vigorously. The water was desperately cold, and hampered as I was with my clothing, I felt that I should not be able to keep myself afloat very long, strong swimmer as I was. The dim red nebula of the unseen lamps moved past slowly, showing me that I was drifting down on the ebb tide. Before me, I knew, was the long, inhospitable wall of the embankment. True, there were some steps, if I was not mistaken, by Cleopatra's needle, but the question was whether I had not drifted past them already. I had given one or two lusty shouts as soon as I had cleared my chest of the mouthful of water that I had got in my first plunge, and I was now letting off another yell, when, out of the darkness behind me, came a prolonged hoot. I looked round quickly in the direction whence the sound had come, and then became aware of the churning of a propeller. Almost at the same moment, a dim, ruddy smudge of light broke through the darkness over the river, and began rapidly to brighten, until it took the form of the twin masthead lights of a tug with a vessel in tow. For a moment I hesitated. My first impulse was to avoid the danger of being run down, but suddenly I altered my mind, for, as the Turk bore down on me, with a roaring of water and a loud clank of machinery, I saw that she was not absolutely end-on, for her green starboard light, which had been for a moment visible, suddenly disappeared. Of what happened during the next few moments I have but a confused recollection. A splashing and churning, with a loud wash of water, the throb of the engines, and a glare of light which blazed before my eyes for a moment, to vanish in an instant into pitchy darkness. A huge black object, felt rather than seen to sweep past before me. And then my hand clutched a wooden projection, and I felt myself dragged violently through the water. 
The projection that I had laid hold of was the lee board of a sailing barge, as I discovered when the rush of the water banged me against it, and much ado I had to hold on, with the water dragging at me and spouting up over my head. But with what strength was left to me, I reached out with the other hand and clawed hold of the dwarf bulwark over which the water was lapping, and so, with a last violent effort, contrived to drag myself up onto the deck. I essayed to stand up, and did in fact succeed, but as my sensations suggested those of a leaden statue with india-rubber legs, I sat down hastily on the hatch cover to avoid going overboard. And there I sat for a minute or two, leaning against the lowered mast with my teeth chattering, and seeming to grow more and more chilled and exhausted every moment. Numb as my mind was by this time, my medical instincts told me that this would not do. Somehow I must get warmth and shelter, for I might as well have been drowned at once as die of exposure and cold. I looked round lethargically. There was no sign of anyone on board. Another barge was towing alongside, and the bows of two others were dimly visible astern. On those rearmost barges there must certainly have been someone steering. But they were inaccessible to me, and I had not the energy to shout, nor could anyone have got across to me if I had. Suddenly my eye fell on the little chimney that rose by the cabin scuttle. A thin stream of smoke issued from it and blew away astern. Perhaps, then, the crew were below, or, if not, at least there was a fire. I crawled aft, holding on with my hands, and, pushing back the scuttle, backed cautiously down the ladder, closing the scuttle after me. There seemed to be nobody below, and the cabin was in darkness, save for the glow of the fire that burned in the little grate. The air was probably warm, though to me it felt icy. But at least there was no wind to play on my wet clothes. I sat down on the locker as near to the fire as I could, and rested my elbows on the little triangular table. Chilled to the marrow, and utterly exhausted, I was sensible of a growing desire to sleep, a desire which I repressed, as I believed, with noble resolution. But apparently my efforts in this respect were not so successful as I had supposed, for the next incident opened with suspicious suddenness. A vigorous shake, which dislodged one of my elbows, introduced the episode. I looked up, blinking sulkily at a bright and most objectionably dazzling light, which further inspection showed to proceed from a hurricane lamp held by a rather dirty hand. "'Here, wake up, mister,' said a hoarse voice. "'This here ain't the Hotel Cecil, you know.' I sat up and stared vaguely at the speaker, or at least the holder of the lamp, but could not think of anything appropriate to say. Then another voice emerged from nowhere in particular. "'He's been overboard. That's what he's been.' "'Any fool can see that,' said the first man. "'But the question is, who is he, and what's he doing in my cabin? "'Who are you, mister?' "'Now, that would seem to be a perfectly simple and straightforward question. "'But it is not so simple as it seems. "'To a complete stranger, the bare mention of a name is unilluminating. "'Further explanations are needed, "'and at that moment I did not feel equal to explanations. "'Besides, I was not so very clear on the subject myself.' Consequently, I preserved a silence which, perhaps, was wooden rather than golden. "'The ear, the ear,' persisted the first man. "'I'm asking you a question.' "'What's the good of asking questions of a man what's been a-ramming his crumpet against the bottom of the river?' protested the other man. "'What do you mean?' demanded the first mariner. "'Can't you see?' retorted the other. "'As he's took the ground hard. Look at his head.' Here the first mariner, Lucifer, or lamp-bearer, wiped his hand over the top of my head, and then examined the tip of his forefinger critically, as though it were the arming of a deep-sea lead. "'You're right, Abel,' said he. "'That's mud off the bottom, that is. He must have took a regular header. Suicide, perhaps, and all that is mind. Found it a bit damper in what he expected. Put the kittle on, Abe.' From this moment the two mariners treated me as if I had been a lay-figure. Silently, they peeled off my wet clothes, and dried my skin with vigorous friction, as if it had been a wet deck. They not only asked no further questions, but when I would have spoken, they urged me to economize my wind. They inducted me into stiff and hairy garments of uncouth aspect, and finally Abe set before me on the table a large earthenware mug, the contents of which steamed and diffused through the cabin a strong odor of Dutch gin. "'You get outside that, mister.' said the luminiferous mariner, who turned out subsequently to be the skipper, and then you'd best turn in. 
The treatment was not strictly orthodox, but I obeyed without demur. Most people would have done the same under the circumstances, but the process of getting outside it took time, for the grog was boiling hot and had been brewed with a flexible wrist. By the time that I had emptied the mug, I was not only revived, but, so far as my memory serves, rather disposed to be garrulously explanatory and facetious. I even felt a slight inclination to sing. But my friends would stand no nonsense. As soon as the mug was fairly empty, they bundled me, neck and crop, into a sort of elongated cupboard, and proceeded to pile on me untold quantities of textile fabrics, including a complete suit of oilskins. Then they commanded me to go to sleep, which I believe I must have done almost instantly. End of chapter 10《ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・ウィッグ・ネス・ヒロイン・My first impressions concerned themselves with the unusual appearance of the bedroom wall and its remarkable proximity to my nose. I further noticed that the bedstead had become inexplicably tilted and that the house appeared to be swaying, and as I mused on these phenomena with the vagueness of the half awake, a loud voice, proceeding apparently from the floor above, roared out the mystic words, Leo! whereupon there ensued a sound like the shaking of colossal tablecloths and the loud clanking of chains, and my bedstead took a sharp tilt to the opposite side. This roused me pretty completely, and turning over in the bunk, I looked out into the barge's cabin. It was broad daylight, and evidently not early, for a square patch of sunlight crept to and fro on the little table, whence presently it slipped down to the floor and slithered about unsteadily, as if Phoebus had overdone his morning dram and could not drive his chariot straight. I watched it lazily for some time, and then, becoming conscious of a vacancy within, crept out from under the mountain of bedclothes and made my way to the ladder. As I put my head through the companion hatch, a man who stood at the wheel regarded me stolidly. "'So you've woke up, have you?' said he. "'Thought he was going right round the clock. "'Abel, he's woke up.' Tell young Ted to stand by with them hags and that their attic. Here Abel looked round from behind the luff of the mainsail, and having verified the statement, conveyed the order to some invisible person in the forepeak. Then he came aft with an obvious air of business. The time for explanations had arrived. Accordingly, I proceeded to pitch the Mayan, as they expressed it, to which they listened with polite attention and manifest disappointment clearly regarding the story as a fabrication from beginning to end. And no wonder. The whole affair was utterly incredible even to me. To them it must have seemed sheer nonsense. Their own verdict of suicide during very temporary insanity with sudden mental recovery under the influence of cold water was so much more rational. Not that they truded their views. They listened patiently and said nothing. And nothing that they could have said could have been more expressive. Meanwhile, I looked about me with no little surprise. Some miles away to the south lay a stretch of low land, faint and grey, with a single salient object, apparently a church with two spires. In every other direction was the unbroken sea horizon. "'You seem to have made a pretty good passage,' I remarked. "'We have had sixteen hours to do it in,' replied the skipper and spring tides and a nice bit of breeze. If it'd only hold, which I'm afraid it won't, we'd be in Folkestone Harbour this time tomorrow, or even sooner. Folkestone be much out of your way? I smiled at the artlessness of the question. It was undeniable that the route from Charing Cross to Hampstead by way of Folkestone was slightly indirect, but there was no need to insist on the fact. My hospitable friends had acted for the best, and their prudence was justified by the result. For here I was, not a whit the worse for my ducking, save that I badly wanted a bath. "'Folkestone will suit me quite well,' I replied, "'if there is enough money left in my pockets to pay my fare home.' 
"'That's all right,' said the skipper. "'I cleared out your pockets myself. "'You'll find the things in a mug in the starboard locker. "'Better overhaul them when you go below "'and see if you've dropped anything. "'Here comes young Ted with your grub.' As he spoke, the apprentice rose through the forehead like a stage apparition, if one can imagine an apparition burdened with a tin teapot, two hags, and an attic, and came grinning along the weather side deck to vanish through the cabin hatchway. I followed gleefully, and, almost before young Ted had finished the somewhat informal table arrangements, fell too on the food with voracious joy. "'If you want any more eggs or anything,' said the apprentice, all you've got to do is just to touch the electric bell, and the waiter will come and take your orders. And having delivered this delicate shaft of irony, he presented me with an excellent back view of a pair of brown dreadnoughts as he retired up the ladder. As I consumed the rough but excellent breakfast, I reflected on the strange events that had placed me in my present odd situation. For the first time I began fairly to realize that I was in some way involved in a nexus of circumstances that I did not in the least understand. I had an enemy, a vindictive enemy too, in whose eyes mere human life was a thing of no account. But who could he be? I knew of no one on whom I had ever inflicted the smallest injury. I bore no man any grudge, and had never to my knowledge had unfriendly dealings with any human creature." Was this inveterate enemy of mine any one whom I knew? Or was he some stranger whose path I had crossed without knowing it, and whom I should not recognize even if I saw him? This last supposition was highly disquieting, especially as it seemed rather probable. For if my enemy was unknown to me, what precautions could I take? Then, again, there was the question. What was the occasion of this extraordinary vendetta? What had I done to this man that he should pursue me with such deadly purpose? As to Jervis's suggestion that I had seen something at the Samway's house that I was not wanted to see, there was nothing in it, for as a matter of fact I had seen nothing. There was nothing to see. The man Maddock was certainly dead. As to what he died of, that was Batson's affair. But even in that there was no sign of anything suspicious. The man himself had consulted Batson and had thought so badly of himself that he had made his will in Batson's presence. The patient himself was fully aware of a serious condition. It was only Batson, with his eternal hurry and bustle, and his defective eyesight, who had missed observing it. The only circumstance that supported Jervis's view was that the acts of violence seemed to be connected with the locality of Batson's house. Of course, there remained the mystery of the dead priest or lay brother, but with that these attempts seemed to have no connection. Nor was there any reason why the murderer should pursue me. I had seen the body, it is true, but nobody believed me, and no proceedings were being taken. Nor could I have identified the murderer if I had been confronted with him. Clearly, he had nothing to fear from me. From the causes of my present predicament, I passed to the immediate future. I should have to get back from Folkestone, and I ought to send a telegram to my landlady, Mrs. Blunt, who would probably be in a deuce of a twitter about me. I raised the lid of the locker, and, reaching out the big earthenware mug, emptied its contents on the table. All my portable property seemed to be there, including the little gold reliquary, which I had carelessly carried in my pocket ever since I had shown it to Thorndyke. My available funds were some four or five pounds, amply sufficient to get me home and to discharge my liability to the skipper as well. I swept the things back into the mug, which I returned to the locker, and having cut myself another thick slice of bread, proceeded with the largest breakfast that I have ever eaten. The skipper's forebodings were justified by the course of events. When I came on deck, the breeze had died down to a mere faint breath, hardly sufficient to keep the big red mainsail asleep, as the pretty old nautical phrase has it. The skipper was still at the wheel, and Abel was anxiously taking soundings with a hand lead. "'You won't do it, Bill,' said the latter, coiling up the lead line with an air of finality. "'This ere breeze is a petering right out.' The skipper said nothing, but stared gloomily at the land which was now right ahead, and much nearer than when I had last looked. And from the land his eye travelled to a sandbank from which rose a tall post at the top of which was an inverted comb. "'Ought to gone about a bit sooner, Bill,' pursued Abel. 
whereupon the skipper turned on him fiercely. "'What's the good of saying that now?' he demanded. "'If you'd have told me the wind was going to drop, I'd have gone about sooner. What water is there?' Five fathom here,' replied Abel. "'That means one and a quarter on the wool-pack. You'd best shove her nose round now, Bill.' "'Oh, all right,' retorted the skipper. "'Leo, this is going to be an all-night job, this is.' and with this gloomy prediction he spun the wheel round viciously and once more headed away from the land prophecy appeared to be the skipper's speciality and like most prophets he tended to view the future with an unfavourable eye gradually the breeze died away into a dead calm so that we had presently to let go the anchor to avoid drifting on to a great sandbank which now lay between us and the land and here we remained not only for the rest of the day and the succeeding night as the skipper had promised, but throughout the whole of the next day and following night. I have already remarked on the incalculable chances by which the course of a man's life is determined. Looking back now, I see that the skipper's little miscalculation, and his failure to cross the Woolpack Shoal into the inshore channel, was an antecedent determining the most momentous consequences for me. For, had the barge been becalmed in the inshore channel, I could, and should, have landed in the boat and returned home forthwith and if i had certain events would not have happened and my life might have run a very different course as it was miles of sea and the great bank known as the margate sand lay between me and the shore whence i was committed to the wanderings and dallyings of the barge as irrevocably as if we were crossing the pacific we lay then in the queen's channel outside margate sand for two whole days and nights, during which time the skipper and Abel slept much and smoked more, and young Ted, having cleaned and dried my clothes, inducted me into the art of bottom-fishing. On the third day a faint breath of breeze enabled us to crawl round the North Foreland, and the skipper, having elected to pass outside the Goodwin, managed to get becalmed again in the neighbourhood of the East Goodwin lightship, a little breeze at night enabled us to move on a few miles farther, and so we continued to crawl along at intervals, mainly on the tide, until nine o'clock in the morning of the fifth day, when we finally crawled into Folkestone Harbour. As soon as the barge was brought up to a buoy, young Ted was detailed to put me ashore in the boat. The skipper and Abel had insisted on treating me as a guest, and I had perforce to accept the position, but young Ted had no such pride and when I ran up the wooden steps by the old fish market, I left him on the stage below, staring with an incredulous grin at a gold coin in his none-too-delicate palm. I was not sorry to be landed in this unfashionable quarter of the town, for, in spite of young Ted's efforts, my turnout left much to be desired, especially in the matter of shirt-cuffs and collar, and I was, moreover, hatless and somewhat imperfectly shaved. Accordingly, I slunk inconspicuously past the market and the groups of lounging fishermen, and when I saw a well-dressed, ladylike woman preceding me into the little narrow street known as the Stade, I slackened my pace so as not to overtake her. She sauntered along with a leisurely air as if she were waiting for something or somebody, and this, and the fact that she carried a light canvas portmanteau and a rug, suggested to me that she was probably travelling by the cross-channel boat which was due to start presently. Suddenly my attention was diverted from her by a loud chattering and a series of shouts. A small crowd of men and women ran excitedly past the end of the little street. The clattering rapidly drew nearer, and then a horse with a light van swept round the corner, and, passing under an archway, advanced at a furious gallop. Evidently the horse had bolted, and now, mad with terror, dashed forward with trailing reins, zigzagging erratically and making the van sway to and fro so that it took up the whole of the narrow street the few wayfarers darted into doorways and sheltered corners and i was about to secure my own safety in a similar manner when i noticed that the woman in front of me had apparently become petrified with terror for she stood stock still gazing helplessly at the approaching horse it was no time for ceremony the infuriated animal and the swaying van were thundering up the street like an insane juggernaut with a hasty apology, I seized the woman from behind, and half dragged, half carried her to the opening of a little yard beside a sail-loft, and even then I was hardly quick enough, 
for as the van roared past, some projecting object struck me between the shoulders and sent me flying, face downwards, onto a pile of tarred drift net. I had had the presence of mind to let go as I was struck, so that my fair protégé was not involved in my downfall, but in a moment she was stooping over me, and with many expressions of concern, endeavouring to help me to rise. Beyond a thump in the back, however, I was not hurt in the least, but picked myself up, grinning and turned to reassure her. And then I really did get a shock, for as I turned, the woman gave a shriek and fell back on the steps of the sailor loft, gasping, and staring at me with an expression of the utmost astonishment and terror. I suppose the accident had upset her nerves, but to be sure my own received, as I have said, a pretty severe shock. For the woman was Mrs. Samway. We remained for a moment or two, gazing at one another in mute astonishment. Then I recollected myself, and advanced to shake hands. But to my discomfiture, she shrank away from me, and began to sob and laugh in an unmistakably hysterical fashion. I must confess that I was somewhat surprised at these manifestations in so robust a woman as Mrs. Samway. Unreasonably so, indeed, for all womankind are more or less prone to hysteria but whereas the normal woman tends to laugh and cry, the weaker vessels develop inexplicable diseases, with a tendency to social reform and emancipation. I put on my best bedside manner, at once matter-of-fact and persuasive. "'You seem quite upset,' I said, "'and all about nothing, for the poor beggar of a horse must be half a mile away by now.' "'Yes,' she answered shakily, it's ridiculous of me, but it was so sudden, and so— Here she laughed noisily, and as the laugh ended in a portentous sniff, I hastened to continue the conversation. Yes, it was a bit of a facer to see that beast coming up the street as if it was Tottenham Corner. Why on earth didn't you get out of the way? I'm sure I don't know, she answered. I seem to be paralysed and idiotic, and— Here the laughter began again. Well— I interrupted cheerfully. You didn't get rolled on those tarred nets, so that's something to be thankful for. This was a rather unlucky shot, for the semblance of facetiousness started a most alarming train of giggles, interrupted by rather loud sobs. But at this point a new curative influence made itself manifest. Two smack boys halted outside the opening and surveyed her with frank interest and pleased surprise. Simultaneously, an elderly mariner appeared at the door of the sail loft, grasping a black bottle and a teacup, and rather shyly descending the steps, suggested that perhaps a drop of spirits might do the lady good. Mrs. Samway bounced off the steps, her hitherto pale cheeks aflame with anger. "'I'm making a fool of myself!' she exclaimed. "'Let us go away from here.' She walked out into the street, and I, having thanked the old gentleman for his most efficacious remedy, followed. As soon as I caught her up, she turned on me quickly and held out her hand. "'Good-bye, Dr. Jardine,' she said, "'and thank you so very much for risking your life for a—for a wretched, giggling woman.' "'Oh, you're not going to send me packing like this,' I protested, "'when we've hardly said good morning. Besides, you're not fit to be left.' "'But you're not to begin laughing again,' I added, threateningly, for an ominous twitching of her mouth seemed to herald a relapse, or I shall go back and get that black bottle. She shook her head impatiently, but without looking at me. "'I would rather you went away, Dr. Jardine,' she said in an agitated voice. "'I would, really. I wish to be alone. Don't think me ungracious. I'm really most grateful to you, but I would rather you left me now.' Of course there was nothing more to be said. She was not really ill or in need of assistance, and probably her instinct was right. Hysteria is not one of those affections which waste their sweetness on the desert air. I shook her hand cordially, and, advising her to keep out of the way of stray vans and horses, once more pursued my way towards the town, meditating as I went on the oddity of the whole affair. It was an astonishing coincidence that I should have run against this woman in this out-of-the-way place. I had left her but a few days since, apparently firmly rooted in the Hampstead Road, and now, behold, as I step ashore from the barge, she is almost the first person that I meet. And yet the coincidence, which had evidently hit her as hard as it had me, like most coincidences, 
tended to disappear on closer inspection. The only really odd feature was my own presence in Folkestone. As to Mrs. Samway, she had probably been sent for by her husband, and was crossing by the boat that was now due to start. Her anxiety to get rid of me was more puzzling, until I suddenly remembered my bare head, my crumpled collar, and generally raffish and disreputable appearance. The latter was, in fact, at this moment brought to my notice by a man with whom, in my preoccupation, I collided, who first uttered an impatient exclamation, and then, bestowing on me a quick stare of astonishment, muttered a hasty apology and hurried past. The incident emphasized the necessity for some reform, and I mended my pace towards the region of shops in a very ferment of uncomfortable self-consciousness. With the purchase of a new hat, a collar, a pair of cuffs, a necktie, a pair of gloves and a stick, some faint glimmer of self-respect revived in me. I was even conscious of a temptation to linger in Folkestone and spend a few hours by the sea. But a sense of duty aided by a large, muddy stain on my coat, finally decided me to return to town at once. Accordingly, having sent off a telegram to my landlady, and ascertained that a train left for London in about twenty minutes, I betook myself to the station. There were comparatively few people travelling by this particular train. In fact, when I had established myself with the morning paper in the off-side corner seat of a smoking compartment, I began, with an Englishman's proverbial unsociability, to congratulate myself on the prospect of having the compartment to myself, when my hopes were dashed by the entrance of an elderly clergyman, who not only broke up my solitude, but aggravated the offence by quite unnecessarily seating himself opposite to me. I was almost tempted to move to another corner, for my length of leg gives an added value to space, but it seemed a rude thing to do, and as the train moved off at this moment I resigned myself to the trifling discomfort. My clerical friend was a somewhat uncommon-looking man, with a countenance at once strong and secretive, a rectangular, masterful face, with a bull-like dewlap and a small and very sharp Roman nose. On further inspection I decided that he was either a high-church parson or a Roman Catholic priest. His proceedings seemed to favour the latter hypothesis, for the train was barely out of the station before he had whisked out of his pocket an ecclesiastical-looking volume which he opened at a marked place, and instantly began to read. I watched him with inquisitive interest, for his manner of reading was very singular. There was something habitual, almost mechanical, about it, suggesting an allotted and familiar task, and a lack of concentration that suggested a corresponding lack of novelty in the matter. As he read, his lips moved, and now and again I caught a faint whisper, by which I gathered that he was reading rapidly. But the most singular phenomenon was— that when his eyes strayed out of the carriage window, as they did at frequent intervals, his lips went on sputtering with unabated rapidity. Quite suddenly he appeared to come to the end of a sort of literary measured mile, for even as his lips were still moving, he clapped in the bookmark, shut the volume, and returned it to his pocket with a curious air of business-like finality. As his eyes were no longer occupied with the book, my observations had to be suspended, and my attention was now turned to my own affairs. Putting my hand in my coat pocket for my pipe and pouch, I became aware of a state of confusion in the said pocket which I had already noticed when making my purchases. The fact is that I had nearly come away from the barge without my portable property. It was only at the last moment that the skipper, remembering the mug, had fetched it hurriedly from the locker and shot its contents bodily into my coat pocket. The present seemed a good opportunity for distributing the various articles among their proper receptacles. Accordingly, I turned out the whole pocketful on the seat by my side, and a remarkably miscellaneous collection they formed, comprising knives, pencils, matchbox, keys, the minor implements of my craft, and various other objects, useful and useless, including the little gold reliquary. My neighbour opposite was, I think, quite interested in my proceedings, though he kept up a dignified pretense of being entirely unaware of my existence. Only for a while, however. Suddenly he sat up, very wide awake, and slewing his head around, stared with undisguised intentness at my little collection. I guessed at once what it was that had attracted his attention. A cleric would not be thrilled by the sight of a clinical thermometer or an ophthalmoscope. It was the reliquary that had caught his eye. 
That was an article in his own line of business. With deliberate mischief, I left the little bauble exposed to view as I very slowly and methodically conveyed the other things one by one, each to its established pocket. Last of all, I picked up the reliquary and held it irresolutely as if debating where I should stow it. And at this point, his reverence intervened, unable any longer to contain his curiosity. That is a very remarkable little object, sir he said in excellent Anglo-German. Might one presume to ask what his use is? I handed the reliquary to him, and he took it from me with ill-disguised eagerness. I understand, said I, that it is a reliquary, but you probably know more about such things than I do. I haven't opened it, so I can't say what is inside. He nodded gravely. So, I am glad to hear you say that. Probably there is inside some holy relic which ought not to be touched, excepting by by his hand. He turned the case over, and putting on a pair of spectacles, which he had not appeared to require for reading, closely scrutinized the inscriptions, and even the wisp of cord that remained attached to one of the rings. You say, he resumed without raising his eyes, that you understand that this is a reliquary. Do you not send no? The person who gave it to you, did he not tell you what it contained? It wasn't given to me at all, I replied. In fact, it isn't properly mine. I picked it up, and am merely keeping it until I find the owner. He pondered this statement with a degree of profundity that seemed rather out of proportion to its matter, and he continued to gaze at the reliquary, never once raising his eyes to mine. At length, after a considerable pause and a most unnecessary amount of reflection, he asked, "'Might one ask, if you shall pardon my curiosity, where you found this little object?' I hesitated before replying. My first and natural impulse was to tell him exactly where and under what circumstances I had found the object. But the way in which my information had been received by the police had made me rather chary of offering confidences besides which I had half promised them not to talk about the affair. And, after all, it was no business of this good gentleman's where I found it. My answer was, therefore, not very explicit. I picked it up in a lane at Hampstead, near London. At Hampstead, he repeated. So, that would be a very good place to find such things. I mean, he added hastily, there are many people in that place, and some of them will be of the old religion. Now, this last remark was such palpable nonsense that it set me speculating on what he had intended to say, for it was obvious that he had altered his mind in the middle of the sentence and completed it with the first words that came to hand. However, as I could read no sense into it at all, I said that perhaps he was right, which seemed an eminently safe rejoinder to an unintelligible statement. When he had finished his minute examination of the reliquary, he handed it back to me with such evident reluctance that, if it had been mine, I should have been tempted to ask him to accept it. But it was not mine. I was only a trustee. So I made no remark, but watched him as he, very deliberately, took off his spectacles and returned them to their case, looking meanwhile at the floor with an air of deep abstraction. He appeared to be thinking hard, and I was quite curious as to what his next remark would be. A considerable interval elapsed before he spoke again, but at last the remark came, in the form of a question, and very disappointing it was. "'You are not, perhaps, very much interested in relics and reliquaries?' As a matter of fact, I didn't care two straws for either the one or the other, but there was no need to put it as strongly as that. "'We are apt,' I replied, "'to find a lack of interest in subjects of which we are ignorant.' That was a fine sentence. It might have come straight out of Sandford and Merton. "'That is what I think too,' he rejoined. "'We do not know. We do not care. But there is a very excellent little book which explains all the customs and ceremonies connected with the relics of the saints. I should like you to read that book. Will you permit me to send you a copy which I have?' 
Of course I said I should be delighted. It was an outrageous falsehood, but what else could I say? Then, said he, I shall have great pleasure in sending it to you, if you will kindly tell me how I shall address it. I presented him with my card, which he read very attentively before bestowing it in his pocket-book. I see, he remarked, that you are a doctor of medicine. It is a fine profession, if one does not too much forget the spiritual life in caring for that of the body. In this I acquiesced vaguely, and the conversation drifted into detached commonplaces, finally petering out as we approached Paddock Wood, where my reverend acquaintance bought a newspaper and underwent a total eclipse behind it. As soon as the train started again, I took up my own paper, and the very first glance at it gave me a shock of surprise that sent all other matters clean out of my mind. It was an advertisement in the column-headed personal that attracted my attention, an advertisement that commenced with the word missing in large type, and went on to offer two hundred pounds reward, thus. Missing, two hundred pounds reward, whereas on the fourteenth instant, Dr. Humphrey Jardine disappeared from his home and his usual places of resort. The above reward will be paid to any person who shall give information as to his whereabouts if alive, or the whereabouts of his body if he is dead. He was last seen at 12.20 p.m. on the above date in the Hampstead Road, and was then walking towards Euston Road. The missing man is about twenty-six years of age, is somewhat over six feet in height, of medium complexion, has brown hair, grey eyes, straight nose, and a rather thin face, which is clean-shaved. He was wearing a dark tweed suit and a soft felt hat. Information should be given to Hector Brodrip, Esquire, 65, New Square, Lincoln's Inn, by whom the above reward will be paid. Here was a pretty state of affairs. It seemed that while I was placidly taking events as they came, smoking the skipper's tobacco and bottom-fishing with young Ted, my escapade had been producing somewhere a most almighty splash. I read the advertisement again, with a self-conscious grin, and out of it there arose one or two rather curious questions. In the first place, who the deuce was Hector Brodrip, and what concern was I of his? And how came he to know that I was walking down Hampstead Road at twelve-twenty on the fourteenth inst? I felt very little doubt it was actually Thorndyke who was tweaking the strings of the Brodribian puppet, but even this left the mystery unsolved. For how did Thorndyke know? This was only the fifth day after my disappearance, and it would seem that there had hardly been time for exhaustive inquiries. Then another highly interesting fact emerged. The only person who had seen me walk away down Hampstead Road was Sylvia Vine, whence it followed that Thorndyke, or the mysterious Brodrip, had in some way got into touch with her. And reflecting on this, the mechanism of the inquiry came into view. The connecting link was, of course, the sketch. Thorndyke had, himself, left the canvas with Mr. Robinson, the artist's colourman, and he must have called to inquire if I had collected it. Then he would have been told of my meeting with Miss Vine, and as she was a regular customer, Mr. Robinson would have been able to give him her address. It was all perfectly simple, the only remarkable feature being the extraordinary promptitude with which the inquiry had been carried out which went to show how much more clearly Thorndyke had realised the danger that surrounded me than I had myself. These various reflections gave me full occupation during the remainder of the journey, extending themselves into consideration of how I should act in the immediate future. My first duty was obviously to report myself to Thorndyke without delay, after which, I persuaded myself, it would be highly necessary for me personally to reassure the fair, and perhaps anxious, Sylvia. As to how this was to be managed, I was not quite clear, and in spite of the most profound cogitation, I had reached no conclusion when the train rumbled into Charing Cross Station. End of chapter 11《ハッタ12》of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon。《ハッタ12》。Miss Vine
As I stepped out onto the platform with a valedictory bow to my reverend fellow passenger, my irresolution came to an end, and my duty became clear. I must, in common decency, report myself at once to Thorndyke, seeing that he had been at so much trouble on my account. His card, which he had given me, I had unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, as it turned out, left on the mantelpiece at my lodgings, but I remembered that the address was King's Bench Walk, and assumed that I should have no difficulty in finding the house. Nor had I, for, as I entered the temple by the Tudor Street gate, having overshot my mark on the embankment, I was almost immediately confronted by a fine brick doorway, surmounted by a handsome pediment, and bearing legibly painted on its jamb, First Pair Dr. Thorndyke. I ascended the first pair of stairs, which brought me to an open oak door, massive and iron-bound, and a closed inner door, on the brass knocker of which I executed a flourish that would have done credit to a Belgravian footman, whereupon the door opened, and a small man of sedate and clerical aspect regarded me with an air of mild inquiry. "'Is Dr. Thorndyke at home?' I asked. "'No, sir. He is at the hospital.' Dr. Jervis is watching a case in the probate court. Perhaps you would like to leave a message or write a note. A message in writing would be preferable. I don't know that it is necessary, said I. My name is Jardine, and if you tell him that I called, that will probably be enough. The little man gave me a quick bird-like glance of obviously heightened interest, "'If you are Dr. Humphrey Jardine,' said he, "'I think a few explanatory words would be acceptable. "'The doctor has been extremely uneasy about you. "'A short note and an appointment, either here or at the hospital, would be desirable.' "'With this he stepped back, holding the door invitingly open, "'and I entered, wondering who the deuce this prim little cathedral dean might be.' with his persuasive manners and his quaintly precise forms of speech. He placed a chair for me at the table, and, having furnished me with writing materials, stood a little way off, unobtrusively examining me as I wrote. I had finished the short letter, closed it up and addressed it, and was rising to go, when, almost automatically, I took out my watch and glanced at it. Of course it had stopped. "'Can you tell me the time?' I asked. My acquaintance drew out his own watch and replied deliberately, Seventeen minutes and forty seconds past one. He paused for a moment and then added, I hope, sir, you have not got any water in your watch. I'm afraid I have, I replied, rather taken aback by the rapidity of his diagnosis. But I'll just wind it up to make sure. Oh, don't do that, sir, he exclaimed. "'Allow me to examine it before you disturb the movement.' He whipped out of his pocket a watchmaker's eyeglass, which miraculously glued itself to his eye, and, having taken a brief glance at the opened watch, produced a minute pocket screwdriver and a sheet of paper, and, in the twinkling of an eye, as it seemed to me, the paper was covered with the dismembered structures which had in their totality formed my timepiece. "'It's quite a small matter, sir.' was his report as he rose from his inspection and pocketed his eyeglass. "'Just a speck or two of rust. If you will take my watch for the present, I will have your own in going order by the next time you call.' It seemed an odd transaction, but the little man's manner, though quiet, was so decisive that I took his proffered watch, and, affixing it to my chain, thanked him for his kindness, and departed, wondering if it was possible that this prim, clerical little person— could possibly be the tame mechanic of whom Thorndyke had spoken. Travelling in London was comparatively slow in those days, which perhaps was none the worse for a near and pleasant suburb like Hampstead. It had turned half-past two when I let myself into my lodgings with a rather rusty key, and almost literally fell into the arms of Mrs. Blunt. I feared for a moment that she was going to kiss me, but that was a false alarm. What she actually did was to seize both my hands and burst into tears with such violence as to cover me with confusion, and cause the servant-maid to rise like a domestic and highly inquisitive apparition from the kitchen stairs. I pacified Mrs. Blunt as well as I could, and shook hands heartily with the maid, who thereupon retired, much gratified, to the underworld, 
whence presently issued an odour suggestive of sacrificial rites, not entirely unconnected with fried onions, and accompanied by an agreeable hissing sound. "'But wherever have you been all this time?' Mrs. Blunt asked, as she preceded me up the stairs, wiping her eyes. "'And why didn't you send us a line just to say that you were all right?' To this question I made a somewhat guarded answer in so far as the cause of my immersion in the river was concerned. Otherwise I gave her a fairly correct account of my adventures. "'Well, well,' was her comment. "'I suppose it was all for the best, but I do think those sailors might have put you on shore somewhere. Dear me, what a time it has been! I couldn't sleep at night for thinking of you, and what Susan and I have eaten between us wouldn't have kept a sparrow alive. And Dr. Thorndyke, too! I'm sure he was very anxious and worried about you, though he's such a quiet, self-contained man that you can't tell what he's thinking of. And, Lord, what a lot of questions he do ask, to be sure. By the way, how did he come to know that I was missing? Why, I told him, of course, when you didn't come home that night, which Susan and me sat up for you until three in the morning, I thought there must be something wrong, you being so regular in your habits. So next day, the very first thing, I took his card from your mantelpiece, and down I went to his office and told him what had happened. He came up here that evening to see if you'd come home, and he's been here every day since to inquire. Has he really? Yes, in a handsome cap, every single day. And so is the young lady. The young lady? I exclaimed. What young lady? Mrs. Blunt regarded me with something as nearly approaching a wink as can be imagined in association with an elderly female of sedate aspect. Now, she protested slyly, as if you didn't know. What young lady, indeed? Why, Miss Vine, to be sure, and a very sweet young lady she is, and talk to me just as simple and friendly as if she'd been an ordinary young woman. How do you know that she isn't an ordinary young woman? I asked. Mrs. Blunt was shocked. "'Do you suppose, Mr. Jardine, sir,' she demanded severely, "'that I, who have been a head parlour-maid in a county family where my poor husband was coachman, don't know a real gentlewoman when I meet one? You surprise me, sir.' I apologised hastily, and suggested that, as so many kind inquiries had been made, the least I could do was to call and return thanks without delay. "'Certainly, sir,' Mrs. Blunt agreed. "'But not until you've had your lunch. "'It's a small porterhouse steak,' she added, alluringly, "'being evidently suspicious of my intentions. "'The announcement, seconded by an appetizing whiff from below, "'reminded me that I was prodigiously sharp-set, "'having tasted no food since I'd come ashore at Folkestone, "'and put the grosser physiological needs of the body, for the moment, in the ascendant. "'But even as I was devouring the steak with voracious gusto, my mind occupied itself with plans for a strategic descent on the abode of the fair Sylvia, and with speculations on the reception I should get, and the noise of water running into the bath formed a pleasing accompaniment to the final mouthfuls. When I bathed, shaved, and attired myself in carefully selected garments, I set forth, as smart and spruce as the frog that would a wooing go, saving the opera head, which would have been inappropriate to the occasion. The distance to Sylvia's house was not great, and a pair of long and rapidly moving legs consumed it to such purpose that it was still quite reasonable calling time when I opened the gate of the Hawthorns and gave a modest pull at the bell. My summons was answered by a rather foolish-looking maid, by whom I was informed that Miss Vine was at home, and when I had given her my name, which she seemed disposed to confuse with that of a well-known edible fish, she ushered me down a passage to a room at the back of the house, and, opening the door, announced me. Correctly, I was glad to note, whereupon I assumed an ingratiating smile and entered. Now, there is nothing more disconcerting than a total failure of agreement between anticipation and realisation. Unconsciously, I pictured to myself the easy-mannered, genial Sylvia, seated perhaps at an easel or table, working on one of her pictures— and had prepared myself for a reception quite simple, friendly, and unembarrassing. Confidently and entirely at my ease, I walked in through the doorway, and there the pleasant vision faded, leaving me with the smile frozen on my face, staring in consternation at one of the most appalling old women 
that it has ever been my misfortune to encounter. I am, in general, rather afraid of old women. They are, to my mind, a rather alarming class of creature. But the present specimen exceeded my wildest nightmares. It was not merely that she was seated unnaturally in the exact centre of the room, and that she sat with the unhuman immobility, moving no muscle and uttering no sound as I entered, though that was somewhat embarrassing. It was her strange, forbidding appearance that utterly shattered my self-possession, and seemed to disturb the very marrow in my bones. She was a most remarkable-looking person. An immense Roman nose, a mop of frizzy grey fringe, and a lofty surmounting cap or headdress of some kind, suggested that monstrous and unreal bird the helmeted hornbill, and the bird-like character was heightened by her eyes, which were small and glittering, and set in the midst of a multitude of radiating wrinkles. To this most alarming person I made a low bow, and dropped my stick, of which the maid had neglected to relieve me, and for which I had found no appointed receptacle. As I stooped hastily to pick it up, my hat slipped from my grasp, and, urged by the devil that possessed disengaged hats, instantly rolled under a deep ottoman, once I had to hook it out with the handle of my stick. I rose, perspiring with embarrassment, to confront that immovable figure, and found the glittering eyes fixed on me attentively, but without any sign of expression of human emotion. Haltingly, I essayed to stammer out an explanation of my visit. Uh, I have, um, called... Here I paused to collect my ideas, and the old lady watched me stonily, without offering any remark. Indeed, no comment was needed on a statement so self-evidently true. After a brief and hideous silence, I began again. I, um, thought it desirable, um, and in fact necessary, and, um, proper to call, um, and... Here my ideas again petered out, and a horrid silence ensued, amidst which I heard a still, emotionless voice murmur, "'Yes, and you have accordingly called.' "'Exactly,' I agreed, grasping eagerly at the slenderest straw of suggestion. "'I have called to, um, well, the fact is that my, um, very remarkable absence seemed to call for some explanation.' especially as certain inquiries, um... At this point I stopped suddenly with a horrible doubt as to whether I was not saying more than was discreet, and the misgiving was intensified by that chilly, calm voice framing the question, "'Enquiries made personally?' Now this was a facer. I seemed to have put my foot in it at the first lead off, supposing Sylvia had said nothing about her little visits to Mrs. Blunt. It would never do to give her away to this inquisitorial old waxwork. I endeavoured to temporise. Well, I stammered, not exactly made personally to me. By letter, perhaps? The voice suggested in the same even, impassive tone. Uh, no, not by letter. There was a short, embarrassing pause. And then the old lady, as if summing up the case, said frigidly, "'Not exactly personally, and not by letter.' I was so utterly confounded by her judicial manner, her immovable, expressionless face, and the hypnotic quality of those glittering eyes, that for the moment I could think of nothing to say. "'Don't let me interrupt you,' said she, after some seconds of agonized silence on my part, whereupon I pulled myself together and made a fresh start. I should perhaps have explained that I have been unavoidably absent from home for some time, and, as I was unable to communicate with my friends, I have, I am afraid, caused them some anxiety. I was this that seemed to make it necessary for me to call and give an account of myself. She pondered a while on this statement. If a graven image can be said to ponder, and at length inquired, "'You spoke of your friends. Are any of them known to me?' "'Well,' I replied, "'I was referring more particularly to your daughter.' 
she continued to regard me fixedly, and, after a brief interval, rejoined, "'You are referring to my daughter, but I do not recall the existence of any such person. I think you must be mistaken.' It seemed extremely probable, and I hastened to amend the description. I beg your pardon, I should have said Miss Vine, but perhaps she is not at home. You are evidently mistaken, was the paralyzing reply. I am Miss Vine, and I need not add that I am at home. But, I demanded despairingly, is there not another Miss Vine? "'There is not,' she answered. "'But it is possible that you are referring to Miss Sylvia Vine. Is that so?' I replied sulkily that it was, and being somewhat nettled by this unnecessary and rather offensive hair-splitting, offered no further remark. How the conversation would have proceeded after this I cannot even surmise, but it did not proceed at all, for the embarrassing silence was brought to an end by a very agreeable interruption. The door opened softly, and for one moment Sylvia herself stood framed in the portal. Then, with a little cry, she ran towards me with her hands held out impulsively, and the prettiest smile of welcome. "'So it is really you!' she exclaimed. "'That silly little goose of a maid has only just told me you were here. I am glad to see you. When did you graciously please to descend from the clouds?' I arrived home this afternoon, and as soon as I changed and at lunch I came here to report myself. "'How nice of you,' said Sylvia. "'I suppose you guessed how anxious we should be.' "'I didn't presume to think that you would actually be anxious about me,' I replied, with a furtive eye on the waxwork, though I knew that you had been kind enough to express an interest in my fate. "'What a cold-bloodedly polite way to put it,' laughed Sylvia. "'Express an interest, indeed. We were most dreadfully worried about you.' To a somewhat friendless man like myself, this sympathetic warmth was very delightful, and my pleasure was not appreciably damped when a chill, emotionless voice affirmed, "'The use of the first person singular would, I think, be preferable.' Sylvia turned on her aunt with mock ferocity. "'Well, really,' she exclaimed, you're a dreadful impostor, Mopsy, dear. Just listen to her, Dr. Jardine. And if you had only seen what a twitter she was in as the time went on and no news came. I gasped, and the hair seemed to stir on my scalp. Mopsy. The name was obviously not applied to me. But could it be? Was it possible that such a name could be associated with that terrific old lady? It was inconceivable. It was positively profane. It was almost as if one should presume to address the deity as old chap. I could hardly believe my ears. I glanced at her nervously and caught her glittering eye, but the grotesque face was as immovable as everlasting granite, though indeed by some ventriloquial magic the word rubbish managed to disengage itself from her person. "'It isn't rubbish,' retorted Sylvia. "'It's the plain truth. We were both worried to death about you. And no wonder.' Dr. Thorndyke was very quiet and matter-of-fact, but there's no disguising his fear that something dreadful had happened to you. And then there was the advertisement in the papers. Did you see that? Oh, it's nothing to grin about. You've given us all a nice fright, and me especially, because, of course, I naturally thought of that ruffian from whom you had rescued me in the lane. But he never saw me. You don't know. He may have done. At any rate, ye owe us an explanation. So when the tea comes in, you shall give us the true story of your adventures. I hope you've let Dr. Thorndyke know about your resurrection. I reassured her on this point, and as the goose of a mate now brought in the tea, I proceeded to pitch my yarn, as the skipper had expressed it, without those reservations that I had considered necessary in the case of Mrs. Blunt. The old lady, having been unmasked by Sylvia, developed a slight tendency to thaw. She even condescended, in a rigid and effigian fashion, to consume bread and butter, a proceeding that seemed to me weirdly incongruous, as though one should steal into the British Museum in off hours and find the seated statue of Amenhotep III in the act of refreshing itself with a sandwich and a glass of beer. 
But I was less terrified of her now, since I had gathered that the core of warm humanity was somewhere concealed within that grim exterior, and even though her little sparkling eyes were fixed on me immovably, I told my story to the end without flinching. Sylvia listened to my narration with a rapt attention that greatly flattered my vanity and made me feel like a very Othello, and when I had finished she regarded me for a while silently and with an air of speculation. "'It's a queer affair,' she said at length, "'and there is a smack of mystery and romance about it that is rather refreshing in these commonplace days. But I don't like it. Adventure is all very well, but there seems to have been a deliberate attempt to make away with you.' unless you think it may have been a piece of silly horseplay that went farther than it was meant to. "'That is quite possible,' I replied untruthfully, for I didn't think anything of the sort, and only made this evasive answer to avoid raising other and more delicate issues. "'I hope that is the explanation,' said Sylvia, "'though it sounds rather a lame one. You would know if you had an enemy who might wish to get rid of you. I suppose you don't know of any such person?' It was a rather awkward question. I didn't want to tell an untruth, but, on the other hand, I knew that Thorndyke would not wish to have my affairs discussed while his investigations were in progress. So I hedged once more, replying quite truthfully that I was not acquainted with anyone who bore me the slightest ill will. My adventures done with, the talk drifted into other channels, and presently came round to the little crucifix that had been the occasion of Sylvia's disagreeable experience in the lane. In spite of my confusion, I had noticed, on first entering the room, that the old lady was wearing suspended from her neck a small enameled crucifix, and had instantly identified it, and wondered not a little that she should be thus disporting herself in borrowed ornaments. But when Sylvia had arrived, behold, the original crucifix was hanging on its chain from her neck. From time to time during my recital, my eyes had wandered from one to the other, seeking some difference or variation, but finding none and at length my inquisitive glances caught the younger lady's attention. "'I can see, Dr. Jardine,' said she, "'that you are eaten up with curiosity about the crucifix that my aunt is wearing. Now confess, aren't you?' "'I am,' I admitted. "'When I first came in I naturally thought it was yours. Is it a copy?' "'Certainly not,' said Miss Vine, the elder. "'They are duplicates.' Sylvia laughed. "'You'd better not talk about copies,' said she. "'My aunt has only acquired her treasure lately, and she's as proud of it as a peacock. Aren't you, dear?' "'The sensations of a peacock,' replied Miss Vine, "'are unknown to me. I am very gratified at possessing the ornament.' "'Gratified, indeed,' said Sylvia. "'I consider such vanity most unsuitable to a person of your age. But they are very charming. There is quite a little story attached to them.' "'My father and a cousin of his.' "'By marriage,' interposed Miss Vine. "'You needn't desist on that,' said Sylvia, "'as if poor old Vitalia were a person to be ashamed of. "'Well, my father and his cousin were at a Jesuit school in Belgium, "'at Leuven, in fact, "'and among the teachers in the school was an Italian Jesuit named Giglioli. "'Now the respected Gigli, "'Oli,' interposed Miss Vine, in a severe voice, Oli, continued Sylvia, had formerly been a goldsmith, and the father superior, with that keen eye to the main chance which you may have noticed among professed religious, furnished him with a little workshop, and employed him in making monstrances, thuribles, and church plate in general. It was he who made these two crucifixes, and, with the father superior's consent, he gave one to my father, and the other to the cousin, as parting gifts on their leaving school." As the boys were inseparable friends, the two crucifixes were made absolute duplicates of one another, with the single exception that each had the owner's name engraved on the back. When my poor father died, his crucifix became mine, and a short time ago his cousin, who is now getting an old man, took a fancy that he would like the two crucifixes to be together once more, and gave his to my aunt. So here they are, after all these years, under one roof again. As she finished speaking, she detached the crucifix from her neck, and, having given it to me to examine, proceeded to remove its fellow from the neck of the elder lady, who not only submitted quite passively, but seemed to be unaware of the transaction, and handed that to me also. 
I laid them side by side in my palm and compared them, but could not detect the slightest difference between them. They were complete duplicates. Each was a Latin cross with trefoiled extremities, wrought from a single piece of gold and enriched with champlevé enamel. The body of the cross was filled with a ground of deep translucent blue, from which the figure stood out in rather low relief, and the space between each of the trefoils was occupied by a single Greek letter, iota and chi at the top and bottom respectively, and at the ends of the horizontal arm, alpha and omega. On turning them over, I saw that the back of each bore an engraved inscription, carried across the horizontal arm, that on Sylvia's reading, A. M. Robertus, D. G., while that on the other read, A. M. Vitalis, D. G. They are very charming little things, I said, as I returned to Sylvia, and it was a pretty idea of the old Jesuit to make them both alike for the two friends. I suppose he didn't make any more of them for his other pupils. What makes you ask that? demanded Sylvia. I am thinking of that man in the lane. He must have had some reason for claiming the crucifix as his, one would think, and as these are quite unlike any ordinary commercial jewellery, the suggestion is that the worthy Giglioli was tempted to repeat his successes. What do you think? I think, said Miss Vine, that the suggestion is inadmissible. Father Giglioli was an artist, and an artist does not repeat himself. I am inclined to agree with my aunt, said Sylvia. An artist does not care to repeat a design, excepting for a definite purpose, as in the case of these duplicates, especially when the thing designed is intended as a gift. To this I gave a somewhat qualified assent, though I found the argument far from convincing, and as I had made a very long visitation, especially for a first call, I now rose to depart. I hope I may be allowed to come and see you again, I ventured to say, as Miss Vine raised a sort of semaphore arm to my extended hand. I see no reason why you should not, she replied judicially. You seem to be a well-disposed young man, though indiscreet. Good afternoon. I bowed deferentially, and then, to my gratification, was escorted as far as the garden gate by Sylvia, who evidently wished to gather my impressions of her relative, for, as she let me out, she asked with a mischievous smile, "'What do you think of my aunt, Dr. Jardine?' "'She is rather a terrifying old lady,' I replied. Sylvia giggled delightedly. "'She does look an awful old griffin, doesn't she? But it's all nonsense, you know.' She's really a dear old thing, and as soft as butter. Well, I said, she conceals the fact most perfectly. She does. She's a most complete impostor. I'll tell you a secret, Dr. Jardine, Sylvia added in a mysterious whisper, as we shook hands over the gate. She trades on her nose. I've told her so. Her nose is her fortune, and she plays it for all it's worth. Goodbye, or rather, au revoir for you have promised to come and see us again. With a bright little nod, she turned and ran up the garden path, still chuckling softly at her joke, and I wended homewards, very well pleased with the circumstances of my visit, despite the soul-shaking incidents with which it had opened. End of chapter 12《ハッタ13》of《A Silent Witness》by R. Austin Freeman。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Anna Simon。Chapter 13 A Mysterious Stranger On the following morning, I betook myself to the hospital, intending to call later in the day at Dr. Thorndyke's chambers. But that visit turned out to be unnecessary, for as I ran my eye over the names on the attendance board in the entrance hall, I saw that Thorndyke was in the building, although it was not the day on which he lectured. I found him, as I had expected, in the museum, and was greeted with a hearty grip of the hand and a welcome, the warmth of which gratified me exceedingly. "'Well, Jardine,' he said, "'you've given us all a pretty fine shake-up. I have never been more relieved in my life than I was when my man Poulton gave me your note.' 
But you seem to have had another fairly close shave. What a fellow you are, to be sure. You seem to be as tenacious of life as the proverbial cat. So that little archbishop is your man Polton, is he? Yes, and a most remarkable man, Jardine, and simply invaluable to me, though he ought to be in a very different position. But I think he is quite happy with me, especially now that he has got your watch to experiment on. You will see that watch again some day, when he has rated it to half a second. And meanwhile, let us go into the curator's room and reconstitute your adventures. The curator's room was empty at the moment, empty, that is to say, so far as human denizens were concerned. Otherwise it was decidedly full. The usual wilderness of glass jars, sepulchral slate tanks, bones in all stages of preparation, and unfinished specimens being supplemented by that all-pervading, unforgettable odour peculiar to curator's rooms, compounded of alcohol and mortality, and suggesting a necropolis for deceased dipsomaniacs. Thorndyke seated himself on a well-polished stool by the workbench, and, motioning me to another, bade me speak on, which I did in exhaustive detail, giving him a minute history of my experiences from the time of my parting from Sylvia to the present moment, not omitting my encounter with Mrs. Samway and the clerical gentleman in the train. He listened to my narrative in his usual silent, attentive fashion, making no comments and asking no questions until I had finished, when he cross-examined me on one or two points of detail. "'With regard to Mrs. Samway,' he asked, "'did you gather that she was crossing by the Boulogne boat?' "'I inferred that she was, but she said nothing on the subject.' He nodded, and then asked, "'Do I understand that you never saw your assailant at all?' I never got the slightest glimpse of him. In fact, I could not say whether the person who attacked me was a man or a woman, excepting that the obvious strength and the method of attack suggest a man. To this he made no reply, but sat a while absorbed in thought. It was evident that he was deeply interested in the affair, not only on my account, but by reason of the curious problems that it offered for solution. Indeed, his next remark was to this effect. "'It is a most singular case, Jardine,' he said. "'So much of it is perfectly clear, and yet so much more is unfathomable mystery. "'But just now the speculative interest is overshadowed by the personal. "'I am rather doubtful as to what we ought to do. "'It almost looks as if you ought not to be at large.' "'I hope, sir, you don't suggest shutting me up,' I exclaimed with a grin. "'That was in my mind,' he answered. "'You are evidently in considerable danger, and you are not as cautious as you ought to be.' "'I shall be mighty cautious after this experience,' I rejoined. "'And you have yourself implied that I have nine lives.' "'Even so,' he retorted. "'You have played away a third of them pretty rapidly. "'If you are not more careful of the other six, I shall have to put you somewhere out of harm's way.' Do, for goodness sake, Jardine, keep away from unpopulated places, and see that no stranger gets near enough to have you at a disadvantage. I promised him to keep a constant watch for suspicious strangers, and to avoid all solitary neighbourhoods and ill-lighted thoroughfares, and shortly after this we separated to go our respective ways, he back to the museum and I to the surgical wards. For some time after this, the record of my daily life furnishes nothing but a chronicle of small beer. I had resumed pretty regular attendance at the hospital, setting forth from my lodgings in the morning and returning thither as the late afternoon merged into evening, taking the necessary exercise in the form of the long walk to and from the hospital, and keeping close indoors at night. It began to look as though my adventures were at an end, and life were settling down to the old familiar jog-trot. And yet the beer was not quite so small as it looked, Coming events cast their shadows before them, but often enough those shadows wear a shape ill-defined and vague, and so creep on unnoticed. Thus it was in these days of apparent inaction, though even then there were certain little happenings at which I looked askance. 
Such an episode occurred within a few days of my return and gave me considerable food for thought. I had climbed on to the yellow bus in the Tottenham Court Road and was seated on the top, smoking my pipe, when, as we passed up the Hampstead Road, I noticed a woman looking into the window of Mr. Robinson, the artist's colourman. Something familiar or distinctive in the pose of the figure made me glance a second time. And then I think my eyes must have grown more and more round with astonishment as the bus gradually drew me out of range, for the woman was undoubtedly Mrs. Samway. It was really a most surprising affair. This good lady seemed to be ubiquitous, to fly hither and thither and drop from the clouds as if she were the possessor of a magic carpet. Apparently she had not gone to Bologna after all, or if she had, her stay on the continent must have been uncommonly short. But if she had not crossed on the boat, what was she doing in Folkestone? It was all very well to say that she had as much right to be in Folkestone as I had. That was true enough, but it was a lame conclusion, and no explanation at all. It was my custom, as I have said, to walk from my lodgings to the hospital, a distance of some five miles, but this was practicable only in fine weather. On wet days I took the tram from the Duke of St. Albans, and beguiled the slow journey by reading one of my textbooks and observing the manners and customs of my fellow passengers. Such a day was the one that followed the reappearance of Mrs. Samway. A persistent drizzle put my morning walk out of the question, and sent me, reluctant but resigned, to seek the shelter of the tram, where, having settled myself with a volume of Gold's Surgical Diagnosis, I began to read, to the accompaniment of the monotonous rhythm of the horses' hoofs and the sleepy jingle of their bells. From time to time I looked up from my book to take a glance at the other occupants of the steamy interior, and on each occasion that I did so, I caught the eye of my opposite neighbour, roving over my person, as if taking an inventory of my apparel. Whenever he caught my eye, he immediately looked away, but the next time I glanced up, I was sure to find him once more engaged in a leisurely examination of me. There was nothing remarkable in this. People who sit opposite in a public vehicle unconsciously regard one another, as I was doing myself. But when I had met my neighbour's eye a dozen times or more, I began to grow annoyed at his persistent inspection, and, finally shutting up my book, proceeded to retaliate in kind. This seemed to embarrass him considerably. Avoiding my steady gaze, his eyes flitted to and fro, passing restlessly from one part of the vehicle to another and then it was that my medical eye noted a fact that gave an intrinsic interest to the inspection. The man had what is called an nystagmus, that is, a peculiar oscillatory movement of the eyeball. As his eyes passed quickly from object to object, they did not both come to rest instantaneously, but the right eye stopped with a sort of vertical stagger, as if the bearings were loose. The condition is not a very common one, and the one-sided variety is decidedly rare. It is usually associated with some defect of vision or habitual strain of the eye muscles, as in minor's nystagmus, whence my discovery naturally led to a further survey and speculation as to the cause of the condition in the present case. The man was obviously not a minor. His hands, with the cigarette stain, as I noticed, on the left middle finger, were much too delicate, and he had not in any way the appearance of a labourer. Then the spasm must be due to some defect of eyesight. Yet he was not near-sighted, for, as we passed a church at some distance, I saw him glance out through the doorway at the clock and compare it with his watch. And again I noticed that he took out his watch with his left hand. Then perhaps he had a blind eye, or unequal vision in the two eyes. This seemed the most likely explanation, and I had hardly proposed it to myself when the chance was given to me to verify it. Confused by my persistent examination of him, my unwilling patient suddenly produced a newspaper from his pocket, and, clapping a pair of pince-nez on his nose, began to read. Those pince-nez gave me the required information, for I could see that one glass was strongly convex, while the other was nearly plain. The question of my friend's eyesight being disposed of, I began to debate the significance of that stain of the left middle finger. Was he left-handed? It did not follow, though it seemed likely, and then I found myself noting the manner in which he held his paper, until, becoming suddenly conscious of the absurdity of the whole affair, I impatiently picked up my book 
and reverted to the diagnosis of renal calculus. I was becoming, I reflected disparagingly, as inquisitive as Thorndyke himself, from whom I seemed to have caught some infection that impelled me thus to concern myself with the trifling peculiarities of total strangers. The trivial incident would probably have faded from my recollection, but for another, equally trivial, which occurred a day or two later. I was returning home by way of Tottenham Court Road, and had nearly reached the crossing at the north end, when I suddenly remembered that I had come to the last of my notebooks. The shop at which I obtained them was in Gower Street, hard by, and as the thought of the books occurred to me, I turned abruptly, and, running across the road, strode quickly down a by-street that led to the shop. As I came out into Gower Street, I noticed a small but rapidly augmenting crowd on the pavement, and, elbowing my way through, found at its centre a man lying on the ground, writhing in the convulsions of an epileptic fit. I proceeded to ward off the well-meant attentions of the usual excited bystanders who were pulling open his hands and trying to sit him up, and had thrust the corner of a folded newspaper between his teeth to prevent him from biting his tongue when a constable arrived on the scene, upon which, as the officer bore on his sleeve the badge of the St. John's Ambulance Society, I gave him a few directions and began to back out of the crowd. At this moment I became aware of a pressure behind me and a suspicious fumbling, strongly suggestive of the presence of a pickpocket. Instantly I turned right about and directed a searching look at the people behind me, and especially at a bearded, nondescript person who seemed also to be backing out of the crowd. He gave me a single quick glance as I followed him through the press and then averted his eyes, and as he did so I noticed that something of a start that his right eye came to rest with a peculiar, rapid, up-and-down shake. He had, in fact, a right-sided nystagmus. The coincidence naturally struck me with some force. A nystagmus is not, as I have said, a very common condition. One-sided nystagmus is actually a rare one, and, of the one-sided instances, only some fifty percent will affect the right eye. The coincidence was therefore quite a notable one, but had it any particular bearing? I had a half-formed inclination to follow the man, but he had not actually picked my pocket or done any other overt act, and one could hardly follow a person merely because he happened to suffer from an uncommon nervous affection. The man was now walking up the street, briskly, but without manifest hurry, looking straight before him and swinging his stick with something of a flourish. I watched him speculatively, as I walked in the same direction, and then suddenly realized that he was carrying his stick in his left hand, and carrying it, too, with the unmistakable ease born of habit. Then he was left-handed, and here was another coincidence, not a remarkable one in itself, but, when added to the other, so singular and striking, that I insensibly quickened my pace. As my acquaintance reached the corner of the Euston Road, an omnibus stopped to put down a passenger. It was about to move on when he raised his stick, and, following it, stepped on to the footboard and mounted to the roof. I was undecided what to do. Should I follow him? And, if so, to what purpose? He would certainly notice me, if I did, and be on his guard, so that I should probably have my trouble for nothing, and possibly look like a fool into the bargain. And while I was thus standing irresolute at the corner, the omnibus rumbled away westward, and decided the question for me. I am not, as the reader may have gathered, a particularly cautious man, or much given to suspicion. But recent events had made me a good deal more wary, and had taught me to look with less charity on chance fellow creatures. And this left-handed person with the nystagmus occupied my thoughts to no small extent during the next day or two. Was he the man whom I had seen in the tram? Apparently not. The latter had been clean-shaven and dressed neatly in the style of a clerk or ordinary city man, whereas the former wore a full beard and was shabby, almost beyond the verge of respectability. As to their respective statures, I could not judge, as I had seen the one man seated and the other standing. But, superficially, they were not at all alike, and, in all probability, they were different persons. But this conclusion was not at all inevitable. When I reflected on the matter, I saw that the resemblances and differences did not balance. The two men resembled one another in qualities that were inherent and unalterable, 
but they differed in qualities that were superficial and subject to change. A man cannot assume or cast off an astagmus, but he can put on a false beard. A left-handed man may endeavour to conceal his peculiarity, but the superior deftness of the habitually used hand will make itself apparent in spite of his efforts, whereas he can make any alterations in his clothing that he pleases. And thus reflecting, the suspicion grew more and more strong that the two men might very well have been one and the same person, and that it would be discreet to keep a bright lookout for a left-handed man with a right-sided nystagmus. During all this time I had seen nothing of my new friend Miss Sylvia, but I had by no means forgotten her. Without wishing to exaggerate my feelings, I may say that I had taken a strong liking to that very engaging young lady. She was a pleasant, easy-mannered girl, evidently good-tempered and very frank and simple, a girl, as Mrs. Sparkler would have said, with no bigot nonsense about her. Her tastes ran along very similar lines to my own, and she was clever enough to be a quite interesting companion. Then it was evident that she liked me, which was in itself an attraction, to say nothing of the credit that it reflected on her taste, and, in a perfectly modest way, she had made no secret of the fact. And, finally, she was exceptionally good-looking. Now, people may say, as they do, that beauty is only skin-deep, which is perfectly untrue, by the way, but even so one is more concerned with the skins of one's fellow-creatures than with their livers or vermiform appendices. The contact of persons, as of things, occurs at their respective services. From which it will be gathered that I was only allowing a decent interval to elapse before repeating my visit to the Hawthorns. Indeed, I was beginning to think that a sufficient interval had already passed and to contemplate seriously my second call, when my intentions were forestalled by Sylvia herself. Returning home one Friday evening, I found on my mantelpiece a short letter from her, enclosing a ticket for an exhibition of paintings and sculpture at a gallery in Leicester Square, and mentioning, incidentally, that she proposed to visit the show on the following morning in order to see the works by a good light, which seemed such an eminently rational proceeding in these short winter days that I determined instantly to follow her example and get the advantage of the morning light myself. I acted on this decision with such thoroughness that, when I arrived at the gallery, I found the attendant in the act of opening the doors, and for nearly half an hour I was in sole possession of the premises. Then, by twos and threes, other visitors began to straggle in, and among them Sylvia, looking very fresh and dainty, and obviously pleased to see me. "'I'm glad you were able to come,' she said, as we shook hands. "'I thought you would, somehow.' It is so much nicer to have someone to talk over the pictures with, isn't it? Much more interesting, I agreed. I've been taking a preliminary look around, and have already accumulated quite a lot of profound observations to discharge at you as occasion offers. Shall we begin at number one? We began at number one, and worked our way methodically, picture by picture, round the room, considering each work attentively, with earnest discussion, and a wealth of comment. As the morning wore on, visitors arrived in increasing numbers, until the two large rooms began to be somewhat inconveniently crowded. We had made a complete circuit of the pictures, and were about to turn to the sculpture, which occupied the central floor space, when Sylvia touched me on the arm. "'Let us sit down for a minute,' said she. "'I want to speak to you.' I led her to one of the large settees that disputed the floor space with the busts and statuettes, and, somewhat mystified by her serious tone and by the rather agitated manner which I now noticed for the first time, seated myself by her side. "'What is it?' I asked. She looked anxiously round the room, and, leaning towards me, said in a low tone, "'Have you noticed a man who has been keeping near us and listening to our conversation?' "'No, I haven't.' I replied. If I had, I would have given him a hint to keep farther off. But there's nothing in it, you know. In picture galleries, it is very usual for people to hang about and try to overhear criticisms. This man may be interested in the exhibits. Yes, I know. But I don't think this person was so much interested in the exhibits. He didn't look at the pictures. He looked at us. I caught his eye several times reflected in the picture glasses, 
and once or twice I saw him looking most attentively at this crucifix of mine. That was what really disturbed me. I wish now that I hadn't unbuttoned my coat. So do I. You'll have to leave that crucifix at home if it attracts so much undesirable attention. Which is the man? Is he in this room? No, I don't see him now. I expect he has gone into the next room. Then let us go there too, and if you'll point him out to me, I will pay him back in his own coin. We rose and made our way to the door of communication, and, as we passed into the second room, Sylvia grasped my arm nervously. There he is. Don't let him see us looking at him. He is sitting on the settee at the farther end of the room. It was impossible to make a mistake, since the settee held only a single person, a fairly well-dressed, ordinary-looking man, rather swarthy and foreign in appearance, with a small waxed moustache. He was sitting nearly opposite the entrance door, and seemed at the moment to be reading over the catalogue, which he held open on his knee. But as he looked up almost at the moment when we entered, I turned my back to him, and continued my inspection with the aid of the reflection in a picture-glass. "'He's probably a journalist,' I said. "'You see, he's scribbling some notes on the blank leaves of his catalogue. Probably some of your profound criticisms, which will appear, perhaps tomorrow morning, clothed in super-technical jargon, in a daily paper. Here I paused suddenly, for I had made a rather curious observation. The reflection in a mirror is, as everybody knows, reversed laterally, so that the right hand of a person appears to be the left, and vice versa. But in the present case, no reversal seemed to have taken place. The figure in the reflection was writing with its right hand. Obviously, then, the real person was writing with his left. This put a rather different aspect on the affair. Up to the present I had been disposed to think that Sylvia had been unduly disturbed, for there are plenty of ill-bred bounders to be met in any public place who will stare a good-looking girl out of countenance. But now my suspicions were all awake. It is true that left-handed men are as common as blackberries, but still— "'Can you tell me, Miss Vine,' I asked, as we worked our way towards the other end of the room, "'if this man is at all like the one who frightened you so in Millfield Lane?' "'No, he's not. I'm sure of that. The man in the lane was a good deal taller and thinner.' "'Well,' said I, "'whoever he is, I want to have a good look at him, and the best plan will be to turn our attention to the sculpture. Shall we go and look at that rather remarkable pink bust?' That will give our friend a chance of another stare at you, and, if he doesn't take it, I will go and inspect him where he sits. The bust to which I had referred was executed in a curious, rose-tinted marble, very crystalline and translucent, a material that suited the soft, girlish features of its subject admirably. It stood on an isolated pedestal quite near the settee on which the suspicious stranger was sitting, and I hoped that our presence might lure him from his retreat. "'I don't think,' I said, taking up a position with my back to the settee, "'that I've ever seen any marble quite like this. Have you?' "'No,' replied Sylvia. "'It looks like coarse lump sugar stained pink, and how very transparent it is, too transparent for most subjects.' Here she gave a quick, nervous glance at me, and I was aware of a shadow thrown by some person standing behind me. Had our friend risen to the bait already? I continued the conversation in good, audible tones. Very awkward these isolated pedestals would be for slovenly artists who scamped the back of their work. With this remark I moved round the pedestal as if to examine the back of the bust, and Sylvia followed. The move brought us opposite the person who had been standing behind me. And, sure enough, it was the gentleman from the settee. I continued to talk, rather blatantly, I fear, commenting on the careful treatment of the hair and the backs of the ears, and meanwhile took an occasional swift glance at the man opposite. He appeared to be gazing in rapt admiration at the bust, but his glance too occasionally wandered, and when it did, the point of fixation, as the oculists would express it, was Sylvia's crucifix, which was still uncovered. Presently I ventured to take a good, steady look at him, and was for a few moments unobserved. His left eye moved, as I could see, quite smoothly and evenly from point to point, but the right, at each change of position, gave a little rapid vertical oscillation. 
Suddenly he became aware of my now undisguised inspection of him, and, immediately, the oscillation became much more marked, as is often the case with these spasmodic movements. Perhaps he was conscious of the fact. At any rate, he turned his head away, and then moved off to examine a statuette that stood near the middle of the room. I looked after him, wondering what I ought to do. That he was the man whom I had seen on the two previous occasions I had not the slightest doubt, although I was still unable to identify his features, or anything about him, excepting the nystagmus and the left-handed condition. But there could be no question that he was the same man, and this very variability in his appearance only gave a more sinister significance to the affair, pointing clearly, as it did, to careful and efficient disguise. Evidently he'd been, and still was, shadowing me, and, what was still worse, he seemed to be taking a most undesirable interest in Sylvia. And yet, what could I do? My small knowledge of the law suggested that shadowing was not a criminal act, unless some unlawful intent could be proved. As to punching the fellow's head, which was what I felt most inclined to do, that would merely give rise to disagreeable and perhaps dangerous publicity. "'My lord is pleased to meditate,' Sylvia remarked at length, breaking in upon my brown study. "'I beg your pardon,' I exclaimed. "'The fact is, I was wondering what we'd better do next. Do you want to see anything else?' "'I should rather like to see the outside of the building,' she answered. "'That man has made me quite nervous.' "'Then we will go at once, and we won't sign the visitor's book.' I led her to the door, and as we rapidly descended the carpeted stairs, I considered once more what it were best to do. Had I been alone, I would have kept our watcher in view, and done a little shadowing on my own account. But Sylvia's presence made me uneasy. It was of the first importance that this sinister stranger should not learn where she lived. The only reasonable course seemed to be to give him the slip, if possible. "'What did you make of that man?' Sylvia asked when we were outside in the square. "'Don't you think he was watching us?' "'Yes, I do. And I may say that I've seen him before.' She turned a terrified face to me, and asked, "'You don't think he is the wretch who pushed you into the river?' Now, this was exactly what I did think, but it was not worth while to say so. Accordingly, I temporized. It is impossible to say. I never saw that man, you know. But I have reason for thinking that this fellow is keeping a watch on me, and it occurs to me that, if he appears still to be following us, I had better put you into a hansom and keep my eye on him until you are out of sight. Oh, I'm not going to agree to that she replied with great decision. I don't suppose that my presence is much protection to you, but still, you are safer while we are together, and I'm not going to leave you. This settled the matter. Of course she was quite right. I was much safer while she was with me, and if she refused to go off alone, we must make our escape together. I looked up the square as we turned out of it towards the Charing Cross Road, but could see no sign of our follower, and, as we walked on at a good pace, I hoped that we might get clear away. But I was not going to take any chances. Before turning homewards, I decided to walk sharply some distance in an easterly direction, and then see if there was any sign of pursuit. For my previous experiences of this good gentleman led me to suspect that he was by no means without skill and experience in the shadowing art. We walked down to Charing Cross, and turned eastward along the north side of the Strand, I had chosen this thoroughfare as offering a good cover to a pursuer, who could easily keep out of sight among the crowd of wayfarers who thronged the pavement, for the first question to be settled was whether we were or were not being shadowed. "'Where are we going now?' Sylvia asked. "'We are going up Bedford Street,' I answered. "'There is a bookshop on the right-hand side where we can loiter unobtrusively and keep a lookout. If we see nobody, We'll try one of the courts off Maiden Lane, where we should be certain to catch anyone who is following. But we'll try the bookstall first, because, if our friend is in attendance, I have a rather neat plan for getting rid of him. We accordingly made our way to the bookstall in Bedford Street, and began systematically to look through the second-hand volumes, and as we pored over an open book, we were able to keep an effective watch on the end of the street and the strand beyond. Our vigil was not a long one. We had been at the stall less than a minute, when Sylvia whispered to me, "'Do you see that man looking in the shop on the farther side of the strand?' 
Yes, I replied. I've noticed him. He has only just arrived, and I fancy he is our man. If he is, he will probably go into the doorway, so as not to have to keep his back to us. Almost as I spoke, the man moved into the deep doorway as if to inspect the end of the shop window, and Sylvia exclaimed, "'I'm sure that is the man. I can see his profile now.' There could be no doubt of the man's identity, and at this moment, as if to clinch the matter, he took out a cigarette and lighted it, striking the match with his left hand. "'Come along,' said I. "'We will now try my little plan for getting rid of him. We mustn't seem to hurry.' We sauntered up to the corner of Maiden Lane, and there stood for a few moments looking about us. Then we strolled across to the farther side of Chandler Street, and, as soon as we were out of sight of our follower, crossed the road and slipped in at the entrance to the civil service stores. Passing quickly through the provision department, we halted at the glazed doors, from which we could look out through the Bedford Street entrance. "'There he is!' exclaimed Sylvia. And there he was, sure enough walking rather quickly up the east side of Bedford Street. "'Now,' said I, "'let us make a bolt for it. This way.' We darted out through the china, furniture, and ironmongery departments, across the whole width of the building, and out of the Agger Street entrance, where we immediately crossed into King William Street, turned down Adelaide Street, shot through the alley by St. Martin's Church, and came out opposite the Natural Portrait Gallery, just as a yellow omnibus was about to start. We sprang into the moving vehicle, and, as it rumbled away into the Charing Cross Road, we kept a sharp watch on the end of King William Street. But there was no sign of our pursuer. We had got rid of him for the present, at any rate. "'Don't you think,' said Sylvia, "'that he will suspect that we went into the stores?' "'I have no doubt he will, and that is where we have him. He can't come away and leave the building unsearched. Most probably he is at this very moment.' racing madly up and down the stairs, and trying to watch the three entrances at the same time. Sylvia chuckled gleefully. "'It has been quite good fun,' she said. "'But I'm glad we have shaken him off. I think I shall stay indoors for a day or two and paint, and I hope you'll stay indoors too. And that reminds me that I'm out of Hale's White. I must call in at Robinson's and get a pound tube. Do you mind? It won't delay us more than a few minutes.' Now, I would much rather have gone straight on to Hampstead, for our unknown attendant certainly knew the whereabouts of my lodgings, and might follow us when he failed to find us in the stalls. Moreover, I had, of late, given the neighbourhood of the artist Colourman's shop a rather wide berth, having seen Mrs. Samway from afar once or twice, thereabouts, and having surmised that she tended to haunt that particular part of the Hampstead road. But the fresh supply of flake white seemed to be a necessity— so I made no objection, and we accordingly alighted opposite the shop and entered. Nevertheless, while Sylvia was making her purchase, I stood near the glass door and kept a watchful eye on the street. When a tram stopped a short distance away, I glanced quickly over its passengers, as well as I could, though without observing anyone who might have been our absent friend. But just as it was about to move on, I saw a woman run out from the pavement and enter, and though I got but an indifferent view of her, I felt an uncomfortable suspicion that the woman was Mrs. Samway. Looking back, I do not quite understand why I had avoided this woman, or why I now looked with distaste on the fact that she was travelling in our direction. She was a pleasant-spoken, intelligent person, and I had no dislike of her, nor any cause for dislike. Perhaps it was the recollection of the offence that she had given Sylvia in this very shop but a short time since, that made me unwilling to encounter her now in Sylvia's company. At any rate, whatever the cause may have been, throughout the otherwise pleasant journey, and in spite of an animated and interesting conversation, the thought of Mrs. Samway continually recurred, and this notwithstanding that I kept a constant unobtrusive lookout for the mysterious spy who might even now be hovering in our rear. We alighted from the tram at the Duke of St. Albans, and made our way to North End by way of the Highgate Ponds. As we crossed the open fields and the heath, I turned at intervals to see if there was any sign of our being followed. But no suspicious-looking person appeared in sight, though on two separate occasions I noticed a woman ahead of us, and walking in much the same direction, turn round and look our way. There was no reason, however, to suppose that she was looking at us, and in any case she was too far ahead to be recognisable. 
At last, somewhere in the neighbourhood of the Spaniards' Road, she finally disappeared, possibly into the hollow beyond, and I saw no more of her. At the gate of the Hawthorns, I delivered up the heavy tube of paint, and thus, as it were, formally brought our little outing to an end, and as we shook hands, Sylvia treated me to a parting exhortation. "'Now do take care of yourself and keep out of harm's way,' she urged. "'You are so large, you see.' she added with a smile, and such a very conspicuous object that you ought to take special precautions. And you must come and see us again quite soon. I assure you my aunt is positively pining for another conversation with you. Why shouldn't you drop in to-morrow and have tea with us? Now this very idea had already occurred to me, so I hastened to close with the invitation, and then, as she retired up the path with another good-bye and a wave of the hand, I turned away and walked back towards the heath. For some minutes I strode on, across furzy hollows or over little hills, traversed by sunken sandy paths, occupying myself with thoughts of the pleasant, friendly girl whom I had just left, and reflections on the strange events of the morning. Presently I mounted a larger hill, on which was perched a little old-fashioned house. Skirting the wooden fence that enclosed it, I turned the corner and saw before me at a distance of some forty yards, a rough, rustic seat. On that seat a woman was sitting, and somehow, when I looked at her and noted the graceful droop of the figure, it was without any feeling of surprise, almost that of realised expectation, that I recognised Mrs. Samway. End of chapter 13《ハッタ14》《A Silent Witness》by R. Austin Freeman。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon。Chapter 14 A Lonely Woman。If I had had any intention of avoiding Mrs. Samway, that intention must inevitably have been frustrated, for her recognition was as instantaneous as my own. Almost as I turned the corner, she looked up and saw me and a few moments later she rose and advanced in my direction, so that, to an onlooker, it would have appeared as if we had met by appointment. There was obviously nothing for it but to look as pleased as I could manage at such short notice, which I did, shaking her hand with hypocritical warmth. "'And I suppose, Dr. Jardine,' said she, "'you are thinking what a very odd coincidence it is that we should happen to meet here.' Oh, I don't know that it is so very odd. I live about here, and I understood you to say that you often come up to the heath. At any rate, our last meeting was a good deal more odd. Yes, indeed. But the truth is that this is not a coincidence at all. I may as well confess that I came here deliberately with the intention of waylaying you. This very frank statement took me aback considerably so much so that I could think of no appropriate remark beyond mumbling something to the effect that it was very flattering of her. "'I've been trying,' she continued, "'to get a few words with you for some time past, but, although I have lurked in your line of march in the most shameless manner, I have always managed to miss you. I thought, from what you told me, that you passed Robinson's shop on your way to the hospital.' "'So I do.' I replied mendaciously, for I could hardly tell her that I had lately taken to shooting up by-streets with the express purpose of avoiding that particular stretch of pavement. "'It's rather curious that I never happened to meet you there. However, I didn't, so today I determined to take the bull by the horns and catch you here.' This last statement, like the former ones, gave me abundant matter for reflection. How the deuce had she managed to catch me here? I supposed that she had seen Sylvia and me in the Hampstead Road, and had guessed that we were coming on to this neighbourhood. That was a case of feminine intuition, which, like the bonesetter's skill, is a wonderful thing, when it comes off. And when it doesn't, one isn't expected to notice the fact. Then she had gone on ahead, still guessing at our final destination, and kept us in sight while keeping out of view herself. It was not so very easy to understand— and not at all comfortable to think of, 
for there was a disagreeable suggestion that she had somehow ascertained Sylvia's place of abode beforehand. And yet, well, the whole affair was rather mysterious. "'You don't ask why it was that I wanted to waylay you,' she said at length, as I made no comment on her last statement. "'There is an old saying,' I replied, "'that one shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth.' "'That is very diplomatic,' she retorted with a laugh. "'But I dare say your knowledge of women makes the question unnecessary.' "'My knowledge of women,' said I, "'might be put into a nutshell and still leave plenty of room for the nut and a good fat maggot besides.' "'Then I must beware of you. The man who professes to know nothing of women is the most deep and dangerous class of person. But there is one item of knowledge that you seem to have acquired. You seem to know that women like to have pretty things said to them. "'If you call that knowledge,' said I, "'you must apply the same name to the mere blind impulse that leads a spider to spin a nice, symmetrical web.' She laughed softly and looked up at me with an expression of amused reflection. "'I am thinking,' she said, "'what a very fine symmetrical web you would spin if you were a spider.' "'Possibly,' I replied, "'but it looks as if the roll of bluebottle were the one that is being marked out for me.' "'Oh, not a bluebottle, Dr. Jardine. It doesn't suit you at all. If you must make a comparison, why not say a goliath beetle and have something really dignified, and not so very inappropriate?' "'Well, then, a Goliath beetle, if you prefer it. Not that he would look very dignified, kicking his heels in the elegant web of the superlatively elegant feminine spider.' "'Oh, but that isn't pretty of you at all, Dr. Jardine. In fact, it is quite horrid, and unfair, too, because you are trying to get the information without asking a direct question.' "'What question am I supposed to ask?' "'You needn't ask any.' I will take pity on your masculine pride and tell you why I have been lying in wait for you, although I dare say you have guessed. The truth is, I am simply devoured by curiosity. Concerning what? Now, how can you ask? Just think. One day I meet you in the Hampstead Road, going about your ordinary business, apparently a fixture, at least for months. A few days later, a hundred miles from London, I feel myself suddenly seized from behind. I turn round, and there are you, with tragedy and adventure written large all over you. I thought the tragedy was rather on your side, and so did the ancient mariner, with a black bottle and the teacup. But— I don't wish to discuss the views of that well-meaning old brute. I want an explanation. I want to know how you came to be in Folkestone, and in that extraordinary condition— I'm sure something strange must have happened to you. Why, haven't I as much right to be in Folkestone as you have? That is mere evasion. When I see a man who is usually rather carefully and very neatly dressed, walking in the streets of a seaport town, without hat or a stick, and with a collar that looks as if it had been used to clean out a saucepan, and great stains on his clothes, I am justified in inferring that something unusual has happened to him. I didn't think you had noticed my negligee get-up. At the time I did not. I was very upset and agitated. I just had a lot of worry, and was compelled to cross to France at a moment's notice. And then there was that horrible horse, and the sudden way that you seized me, and then got knocked down, and the— The ancient mariner? Yes, the ancient mariner, and the knowledge that I was behaving like an idiot and couldn't help it though you were so nice and kind to me. So, you see, I was hardly conscious of what was happening at the time. But afterwards, when I'd recovered my wits a little, I recalled the astonishing figure that you made, and I've been wondering ever since what had happened to you. I assure you, Dr. Jardine, you looked as if you might have swum to Folkestone. Did I, by Jove? I exclaimed with a laugh. Well, appearances weren't so very deceptive. The fact is that I'd swum part of the way. She looked at me incredulously. Whatever do you mean? she asked. 
I mean that you are now looking on a modern and strictly up-to-date edition of Simbad the Sailor. That isn't very explanatory, but I suppose it isn't meant to be. It is just a preliminary stimulant to whet my appetite for marvels, and a most unnecessary one, I can assure you, for I am absolutely agape with curiosity. Do go on. Tell me exactly what had happened to you. Now the truth is that I had already said rather more than was strictly discreet, and would gladly have drawn in my horns, but I had evidently let myself in for some sort of plausible explanation, and a lack of that enviable faculty that enables its possessor to tell a really convincing and workmanlike lie, condemned me to a mere unimaginative adherence to the bold facts, though I did make one slight and amateurish effort at prevarication. "'You want a detailed log of Simbad's voyages, do you?' said I. "'Then you shall have it. We will begin at the beginning. The port of departure was the embankment somewhere near Cleopatra's Needle. I was leaning over the parapet, staring down at the water like a fool, when some practical joker came along, and, apparently thinking it would be rather funny to give me a fright, suddenly lifted me off my feet. But my joker's friend hadn't allowed for the top heaviness of a person of my height, and, before you could say knife, I had slipped from his hold and taken a most stylish header into the water. Fortunately for me, a barge happened at the moment to be towing past, and, when I had managed to haul myself on board, I fell into the arms of a marine species of good Samaritan, who, not having a supply of the orthodox oil and wine, proceeded to fill me up with hot gin and water, which is distinctly preferable for internal application. Then the Samaritan aforesaid clothed me in gorgeous marine raiment, and stowed me in a cupboard to sleep off the oil and wine, which I did after some sixteen hours, and then awoke to find our good ship on the broad bosom of the ocean. And so, not to weary you with the incidents of the voyage, I came to Folkestone, where I found a beautiful lady endeavouring, very unsuccessfully, to hypnotise a runaway horse, and so to the adventure of the tarred nets and the ancient mariner with a black bottle. Mrs. Samway smiled a little consciously, as I mentioned the last incidents, but the smile quickly faded, and left a deeply thoughtful expression on her face. "'You take it all very calmly,' said she, "'but it seems to me to have been a rather terrible experience. You really had a very narrow escape from death.' "'Yes, quite near enough. I'm far from wanting any more from the same tap.' "'And I don't quite see why you assume that it was a mere clumsy joke that sent you into the river by accident. "'Why, what else could it have been?' "'It looks more like a deliberate attempt to drown you. "'Perhaps you have some enemy who might want to make away with you.' "'I haven't. There isn't a soul in the world who owes me the slightest grudge.' "'That seems rather a bold thing to say. But I suppose you know. Still... I should think you ought to bear this strange affair in mind, and be a little careful when you go out at night, to avoid the riverside, for instance. Have you... did you give any information to the police about this accident, as you call it? Good Lord, no! What would have been the use? I thought you might have given them some description of the man who pushed you over. But I never saw him. I don't even know for certain that it was a man. It might have been a woman, for all that I can tell. Mrs. Samway looked up at me with that strangely penetrating expression that I'd seen before in those singular, pale eyes of hers. "'You don't mean that,' she said. "'You don't really think that it could have been a woman?' "'I don't think very much about it. But as I never saw the person who did me the honour of hoisting me overboard, I'm clearly not in a position to depose as to the sex of that person.' but if it was a woman, she must have been an uncommonly strong one. Mrs. Samway continued to look at me questioningly. I thought you seemed to hint at a suspicion that it actually was a woman. You would surely be able to tell. I suppose I should, if there were time to think about the matter. But you see, before I was fairly aware that anyone had hold of me, I was sticking my head into the mud at the bottom of the river, which is a process that does not tend very much to clarify one's thoughts. No, I suppose not, she agreed. But it is a most mysterious and dreadful affair. I can't think 
how you can take it so calmly. You don't seem to be in the least concerned by the fact that you've been within a hair's breadth of being murdered. What do your friends think about it? Well, you see, Mrs. Samway, I replied evasively, one doesn't talk much about incidents of this kind. It doesn't sound very credible, and one doesn't want to gain a reputation as a sort of modern Munchausen. I shouldn't have told you, but that you were already partly in the secret, and that you cross-examined me in such a determined fashion. But, she exclaimed, do you mean to tell me that you've said nothing to anyone about this extraordinary adventure of yours? No, I don't say that. Of course, I had to give some sort of explanation to my landlady, for instance, but I didn't tell her all that I've told you, and I would rather, if you don't mind, that you didn't mention the affair to anyone. I should hate to be suspected of romancing. You shan't be through anything that I may say, she replied, though I should hardly think that anyone who knew you would be likely to suspect you of inventing imaginary adventures. For some minutes after this, we walked on without speaking, and, from time to time, I stole a glance at my companion, and, once again, I found myself impressed by something distinctive and unusual in her appearance. Her unquestionable beauty was not like that of most pretty women, localized and unequal, having features of striking attractiveness set in an indifferent or even defective matrix. It was diffused and all-pervading, the product of sheer physical excellence. With most women, one feels that the more attractive wares are judiciously pushed to the front of the window, while a discreet reticence is maintained respecting the unpresentable residue. Not so with Mrs. Samway. Her small, shapely head, her symmetrical face, her fine, supple figure, and her easy movements all spoke of a splendid physique. She was not merely a pretty woman, she was that infinitely rarer creature, a physically perfect human being, comely with the comeliness of faultless proportion, graceful with the grace of symmetry and strength. Suddenly she looked up at me, with just a hint of shyness and a little heightening of the colour in her cheek. "'Are you going to tell me again, Dr. Jardine, that a cat may look at a king? Or was it that a king may look at a cat?' "'Whichever you please.' I replied, we will put them on a footing of equality, excepting that the king might have the better claim if the cat happened to be an exceptionally good-looking cat. But I wasn't really staring at you this time. I was only giving you a sort of friendly look-over. You weren't quite yourself, I think, when we met last. No, I certainly was not. So we are now making an inspection. May I ask if I am to be informed of the diagnosis, as I think you call it? Now, to tell the truth, I had thought her looking rather haggard and worn, and decidedly thinner, and when her sprightliness subsided in the intervals of our somewhat flippant talk, it had seemed to me that her face took on an expression that was weary and even sad, but it would hardly do to say as much. "'It is quite irregular,' I replied. "'The diagnosis is for the doctor. The patient is only concerned with the treatment.' but I'll make an exception in your case, especially as my report is quite unsensational. I thought you looked as if you'd been doing rather too much, and not greatly enjoying the occupation. Am I right? Yes, quite right. I've had a lot of worry and bother lately, and not enough rest and peace. I hope all that is at an end now. I don't know that it is, she replied wearily, or, for that matter, that it will ever be. Fate or destiny, or whatever we may call it, starts us upon a certain road, and along that road we must needs trudge, wherever it may lead. I was rather startled at the sudden despondency of her tone. Apparently, the road that Mrs. Samway trod was not strewn with roses. Still, I said, it is a long road that has no turning. It is, she agreed bitterly. But many have to travel such a road, to find the turning at last barred by the churchyard gate. Oh, come, I protested. We don't talk of churchyards at your time of life. We think of the jolly wayside inns, and the buttercups and daisies, and the may blossom and the hedgerows. 
churchyard indeed we will leave that to the old folk and the village donkey if you please she smiled rather wanly her gaiety seemed to have deserted her for good the wayside inns and the wayside flowers said she are your portion at least i hope so they are not for me and after all there are worse things to think of than a nice quiet churchyard with a village donkey browsing among the graves as you say i quite agree with you from the standpoint of the disinterested spectator not contemplating freehold investments nothing can be more delightfully rustic and peaceful it is the personal application that i object to again she smiled but very pensively and for a while we walked on in silence presently she resumed i used to think that the shortness of life was quite a tragedy that was when i was young but now when you were young i interrupted why what are you now i can tell you mrs samway that there is many a girl of twenty who would be only too delighted to exchange personalities with you and who would stand to make a mighty fine bargain if she could do it if you talk like this i shall have to refer you to the great leonardo's advice to painters what is that she asked he recommends the frequent use of a looking-glass she gave me a quick glance and then blushed so very deeply that i was quite alarmed lest i should have given offence but her next words reassured me it was nice of you to say that and most kindly meant i won't say that i don't care very much how i look because that would be an ungracious return for your compliment and it wouldn't be quite true there are times when one is quite glad to feel that one looks presentable the present moment for instance i acknowledged the compliment with a bow thank you i said that was more than i deserved i only wish that your fortune was equal to your looks but i am afraid it isn't i have an uncomfortable feeling that you are not very happy i am afraid i am not she replied life is rather a lottery you know and the worst of it is that you can only take a single ticket so when you find that you have drawn the wrong number and you realize that there is no second chance well it isn't very inspiriting is it i had to admit that it was not and after a short pause she continued women are poor dependent creatures dr jardine dependent i mean for their happiness on the people who surround them but that is true of us all not quite a man like yourself for instance has his work and his ambitions that make him independent of others but for a woman whatever pretenses she may make as to larger interests in life a husband a home and one or two nice children form the real goal of her ambition but you are not a lone spinster mrs samway i reminded her no i am not but i have no children no proper home and not a real friend in the world unless i may think of you as one i hope you always will i exclaimed impulsively for there was to me something very pathetic in the evident loneliness of this woman she must i felt be friendless indeed if she must needs appeal for friendship to a comparative stranger like myself i am glad to hear you say that she replied for i am making you bear a friend's burden i hope you will forgive me for pouring out my complaints to you in this way it isn't difficult said i to bear other people's troubles with fortitude but if sympathy is any good believe me mrs samway when i tell you that i am really deeply grieved to think that you are getting so much less out of life than you ought i only wish that i could do something more than sympathize i believe you do she said i felt at folkestone how kind you were as a good man is to a woman in her moments of weakness that is why i suppose i was impelled to talk to you like this and that is why she added after a little pause i felt a pang of envy when i saw you pass with your pretty companion i started somewhat at this 
where the deuce could she have seen us near enough to tell whether my companion was pretty or not i turned the matter over rapidly in my mind and meanwhile i said i don't quite see why you envied me mrs samway i didn't say that i envied you she replied with a faint smile and the suspicion of a blush or her either i retorted we are only the merest acquaintances my conscience smote me somewhat as i made this outrageous statement but mrs samway took me up instantly then you've only known her quite a short time the rapidity with which she had jumped to this conclusion fairly took my breath away and had answered her question before i was aware of it but i added i don't quite see how you arrived at your conclusion i thought she replied that you seem to like one another very well so we do i think but can't acquaintances like one another oh certainly but if they are a young man and a maiden they are not likely to remain mere acquaintances very long that was how i argued i see very acute of you by the way where did you see us i didn't see you of course you didn't yet you passed quite close to me on the spaniard's road immersed in conversation and little suspecting that the green eyes of envy were fixed on you oh now mrs samway i can't have that they're not green you know although what their exact colour is i shouldn't like to say off-hand what not after that careful inspection that didn't include the eyes perhaps you wouldn't mind if i made another just to satisfy my curiosity and settle the question for good oh do by all means if it is such a weighty question we both halted and i stared into the clear depths of our singular pale hazel eyes with an impertinent affectation of profound scrutiny while she looked up smilingly into mine suddenly to my utter confusion her eyes filled and she turned away her head oh please forgive me she exclaimed i beg your pardon i do beg your pardon most earnestly for being such a wretched bundle of emotions you would forgive me if you knew what i can't tell you there is no need dear mrs samway i said very gently laying my hand on her arm are we not friends and may i not give you my warmest sympathy without asking too curiously what brings the tears to your eyes i was in truth deeply moved as a young man is apt to be by a pretty woman's tears but more than this something whispered to me that my playful impertinence had suddenly brought home to her the void that was in her life the lack of intimate affection at which she had seemed to hint and instantly all that was masculine in me had risen up with the immemorial instinct of the male in defence of the female for whatever her faults may have been mrs samway was feminine to the fingertips she pressed my hand for a moment and impatiently brushed the tears from her eyes i do hope dr jardine she said looking up at me with a smile that your wife will be a good woman you'll be a dreadful victim if she isn't with your quick sympathy and your endless patience with feminine silliness and now i won't plague you any more with my tantrums i hope i'm not bringing you a great deal out of your way you do live in this direction don't you yes and i've been assuming that my direction was yours too is that right are you going back to hampstead road not at once i'm going to make a call at highgate first then you'll want to go up highgate rise or swain's lane and i will walk up with you if you'll let me i think my nearest way will be up the little path that leads out of swain's lane you know it i expect yes it is locally known as love lane it leads to the crest of the hill that is right you shall see me to the top of it and then i'll take myself off and leave you in peace we had by this time crossed parliament hill fields and passed the end of the highgate ponds a few paces more brought us out at the top of the grove and a few more to the entrance of the rather steep and very narrow lane for some time mrs samway walked by my side in silence and by the reflective way in which she looked at the ground before her seemed to be wrapped in meditation which i did not disturb 
As we entered the lane, however, she looked up at me thoughtfully and said, "'I wonder what you think of me, Dr. Jardine.' It was a fine opening for a compliment, but somehow compliments seemed out of place after what had passed between us. I accordingly evaded the question with another. "'What do you suppose I think of you?' "'I don't know. I hardly know what I think of myself. You would be quite justified in thinking me rather forward to waylay you in this deliberate fashion. Well, I don't. Your curiosity about that Folkestone affair seems most natural and reasonable. I'm glad you don't think me forward, she said. But, as to my curiosity, I am beginning to doubt whether it was that alone that determined me of a sudden to come here and talk to you. I half suspect that I was feeling a little more solitary than usual, and that some instinct told me that you would be kind to me, and say nice things, and pet me just a little, as you have done. I was deeply touched by her pathetic little confession, so deeply that I could find nothing to say in return. You don't think any the worse of me, she continued, for coming to you, and begging a little sympathy and friendship. As she spoke, she looked up very wistfully and earnestly in my face, and rested her hand for a moment on my arm. I took it in mine, and drew her arm under my own as I replied, "'Of course I don't. Only I think it a wonder and a shame that my poor friendship and sympathy should be worth the consideration of a woman like you.' She pressed my arm slightly, and, after a little interval, said in a low voice with just a suspicion of a tremor in it, "'You have been very kind to me, Dr. Jardine, more kind than you know.' I'm very, very grateful to you for taking what was really an intrusion so nicely. It was not in the least an intrusion, I protested, and as to gratitude, a good many men would be very delighted to earn it on the same terms. You don't seem to set much value on your own exceedingly agreeable society. She smiled very prettily at this, and again we walked on for a while up the slope without speaking. Once she turned her head as if listening for some sound from behind us, but our feet were making so much noise on the loose gravel, and the sound reverberated so much in the narrow space between the wooden fences that I, at least, heard nothing. Presently we turned a slight bend, and came in sight of the opening at the top of the hill, guarded by a couple of posts. Within a few yards of the latter she halted, and withdrawing her hand from my arm, turned round and faced me. "'We must say good-bye here,' said she. "'I wonder if I shall ever see you again.' For a moment I felt a strong impulse to propose some future meeting at a definite date, but fortunately some glimmering of discretion, and perhaps some thought of Sylvia, restrained me. "'Why shouldn't you?' I asked. "'I don't know, but mine is rather a vagabond existence.' and I suppose you will be travelling about. I hope we shall meet again soon. But if we do not, I shall always think of you as my friend, and you will have a kind thought for me sometimes, won't you? I shall indeed. I shall think of you very often, and hope that your life is brighter than it seems to be now. Thank you, she said earnestly. And now, good-bye. She held out her hand, and, as I grasped it, she looked in my face with the wistful, yearning expression that I had noticed before, and which so touched me to the heart that, yielding to a sudden impulse, I drew her to me and kissed her. Dim as was the light of the fading winter's day, I could see that she had in an instant turned scarlet. But she was not angry, for, as she drew away from me, shyly and almost reluctantly, she gave me one of her prettiest smiles and whispered, Goodbye again. Then she ran out between the posts, and turning once again, and still as red as a peony, waved me a last farewell. I stood in the narrow entrance looking out after her with a strange mixture of emotions, pity, wonder and admiration, and a little doubt as to my own part in the late transaction, for I had never before kissed a married woman, and cooling judgment did not altogether approve the new departure 
for if Mr. Samway was not all that he might be, still he was Mr. Samway and I wasn't. Nevertheless, I stood and watched my late companion with very warm interest until she faded into the dusk, and even then I continued to stand by the posts, gazing out into the waning twilight and cogitating on our rather strange interview. Suddenly my ear caught a sound from behind me, down the lane, a sound which, while it set my suspicion on the alert, brought a broad grin to my face. It was what I suppose I must call a stealthy footstep, but the stealthiness might have stood for the very type and essence of futility, for, as I've said, the ground sloped pretty steeply and was covered with loose pebbles, whereby every movement of the foot was rendered as audible as a thunderclap. However, absurd as the situation seemed, if the unseen person was really trying to approach by stealth, it was necessary to be on my guard. Moreover, if this should chance to be the person with the nystagmus, the present seemed to be an excellent opportunity for coming to some sort of understanding with him. Accordingly, I wheeled about and began to walk back down the lane. Instantly, the steps, no longer stealthy, began to retire. I quickened my pace. The unknown and invisible eavesdropper quickened his. Then I broke into a run, and so did he, notwithstanding which I think I should have had him, but for an untoward accident. The ground was not only sloping, but, under the loose gravel, was as hard as stone. Consequently, the foothold was none of the best, as I presently discovered, for, as I raced down one of the steepest slopes, the pebbles suddenly rolled away under my foot, and I lost my balance. But I did not fall instantly. Half recovering, I flew forward, clawing the air, stamping, staggering, kicking up the gravel, and making the most infernal hubbub and clatter before I finally subsided into a sitting posture on the pebbles. When I rose, the footsteps were no longer audible, though the lower end of the lane was still some distance away. I resumed my progress at a more sedate pace, and kept a sharp lookout for a possible ambush, though the lane was too narrow, even in the darkness that now pervaded it, to furnish much cover to an enemy. Some distance down, I came to an opening in the fence, where one or two boards had become loose, and was half disposed to squeeze through and explore. But I did not, for, on reflection, it occurred to me that if the man was not there it would be useless for me to go, while if he should be hiding behind the fence it would be simply insane of me to put my head through the hole. When I emerged into the road at the bottom I looked about vaguely, but, of course, there was no sign of the fugitive, nor, indeed, could I have identified him if I had met him. I loitered about undecidedly for a minute or two, and then, realising the futility of keeping a watch on the entrance of the lane for a man whom I could not recognise, and becoming conscious of a ravenous desire for food, I made my way down the grove in the direction of my lodgings. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of A Silent Witness by R. Austin Freeman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter Fifteen. Exit Dr. Jardine. My second visit to the Hawthorns, to which I had looked forward with some eagerness, had, after all, to be postponed indefinitely. I say had, since, under the circumstances, it appeared to be so unsafe that I could not fairly take the risk that it involved. I had made the engagement thoughtlessly, and, in my preoccupation with Mrs. Samway, had not realised the indiscretion to which I had committed myself until I was brought back sharply to the actual conditions by the incident in Love Lane which I have mentioned. But after that I saw that it would be the wildest folly to show myself in the vicinity of Sylvia's house. Evidently the spy, after we had given him the slip so neatly, had made direct for my lodgings and lurked in the neighbourhood, and there it must have been that he had picked me up again as I passed with Mrs. Samway. Of course, it was possible that the unseen person in the lane was not really shadowing me at all, but his stealthy approach, his hasty retreat and his mysterious disappearance left me in very little doubt on the subject. I was not very nervous about this enigmatical person on my own account. In spite of my alarming experiences, I found it difficult to take him as seriously as I should have done, and still felt a quite unjustifiable confidence in my capability of taking care of myself. 
but on Sylvia's account I was exceedingly uneasy. The interest that this man had shown in the unlucky little ornament that she wore associated itself in my mind most disagreeably with a mysterious and terrifying adventure in Millfield Lane, and made me feel that it would be sheer insanity for me to go from my house to hers, and so possibly give this unknown villain the clue to her whereabouts. This conclusion, at which I had arrived overnight, was confirmed on the following morning, for, having taken a brisk walk out in the direction of Harrow, and having kept a very sharp lookout, I was distinctly conscious of the fact that there always appeared to be a man in sight. I never got near him, and was not able to recognize him, but at intervals throughout the morning he continually reappeared in the distance, even on the comparatively solitary country roads and the hedge-divided meadows. It was excessively irritating. Yet what could I do? Even if I could have identified him with the man who had apparently shadowed me before, I really had nothing against him. And cogitating on the matter, with no little annoyance, I determined to take counsel with Thorndyke, and meanwhile to avoid the neighbourhood of the Hawthorns. After lunch I wrote a letter to Sylvia, briefly explaining the state of affairs, and, having given it to our maid to deliver, I took the precaution to go out and saunter towards Kentish Town, with the object of engaging the spy's attention and preventing him from following my messenger to North End. The rest of the day I spent at home, and occupied my time in writing a long letter to Thorndyke, in which I gave a pretty detailed account of my recent experiences, which letter was duly posted by Mrs. Blunt herself in time for the evening collection. I had barely seated myself at the breakfast-table on the following morning when a telegram was brought to me. On opening it, I found that it was from Thorndyke, advising me that a letter had been dispatched by hand, and asking me to stay at home until I had received it, which I did, and within an hour it arrived, and was delivered into my own hands by a messenger boy. It was curt and rather peremptory in tone, desiring me to meet him at one o'clock at Salter's Club in a turning off St. James's Street, and concluding with these somewhat remarkable instructions. I want you to wear an overcoat and hat of a distinctive and easily recognizable character, and to take every means that you can of being seen, and, if possible, followed to the club. You had better put a few necessaries in a bag or a suitcase, and tell your landlady that you may not be home to-night. Follow these instructions to the letter, and bring this note with you. At the latter part of these directions I was somewhat disposed to boggle, remembering my worthy teacher's threat to put me somewhere out of harm's way. But Thorndyke was a difficult man to disobey. Suave and persuasive as his manners were, he had a certain final and compelling way with him that silenced objections and produced a sort of frictionless obedience without any sense of compulsion. Hence, notwithstanding a slight tendency to bluster and tell myself that I would see him hang before I would submit to being mollycoddled like an idiot, I found myself presently walking down the grove in a buff overcoat and a grey felt hat, carrying a green canvas suitcase in which were packed the necessaries for a brief stay away from home, and bearing in my pocket the incriminating letter. I walked slowly as far as the junction road, in order to give any pursuer a fair opportunity to take up the chase and to make the necessary observations on my tasteful turnout. At the junction I waited for a tram, and carefully abstained from staring about in a manner which would have embarrassed any person who might wish unobserved to share the conveyance with me, and from the terminus at Euston Road I proceeded in leisurely fashion on foot, still resisting the temptation to look about and see if I had picked up a companion by the way. Salt's Club was domiciled in a typical West End house, situated in a quiet street of similar houses, grazed at one end by a cab-stand. I timed my arrival with such accuracy that a neighbouring church clock struck one as I ascended the steps, and on my entering the hall I was met by an elderly man in a quiet livery who seemed to expect me, for when I mentioned Thorndyke's name he asked, "'Dr. Jardine, sir?' and, hardly waiting for my reply, showed me to the cloak-room. "'Dr. Thorndyke,' said he, "'will be with you in a few minutes.' When you have washed, I will show you to the dining-room, where he wished you to wait for him." I was just a little surprised at even this short delay, for Thorndyke was the soul of punctuality. However, I had not to wait long. 
I had been sitting less than three minutes at a small table laid for two in the deep bay window, scanning the street through the wire gauze blinds, when he arrived. "'I needn't apologize, I suppose, Jardine,' he said, shaking my hand heartily. "'You will have guessed why I have kept you waiting.' "'You flatter me, sir,' I replied with a slight grin. "'I haven't your powers of instantaneous deduction.' "'You hardly needed them,' he retorted. "'Of course, I was watching your approach, and observing the corner by which you entered the street, to see who came after you. "'Did anyone come after me?' "'Several persons. I examined them all very carefully, with a prism binocular that magnifies twelve times linear, and an assistant is now at the same window, the one over this, following the fortunes of those persons with the same excellent glass. Did you spot anyone in particular as looking a likely person? Yes, the second man who came after you seemed to be sauntering in a rather unpurposive fashion, and looking a little obtrusively unconcerned. I noticed, too, that he was carrying an umbrella in his left hand. But we needn't concern ourselves. If anyone is shadowing you, we are certain to see him. He must expose himself to view from time to time, for he can't afford to lose sight of our doorway for more than a few seconds, and there is practically no cover in this street. He might hide in a doorway, I suggested. Oh, might he? These are all clubs in this street. He'd very soon have the servants out wanting to know his business. No, he'll have to keep on the move, and he'll have to keep mostly in sight of this house. And meanwhile, we are going to take our lunch at our leisure, and have a little talk to while away the time. The lunch was on a scale that my youthful appetite approved strongly, though the number of courses and irrelevant, time-consuming kickshaws struck me as rather unusual, and I never saw a man eat so slowly and delay a meal so much as Thorndyke did on that occasion. I believe that it took him fully twenty minutes to consume a fried soul, and even then he created a further delay by drawing my attention to the skeleton on his plate as an illustration of inherited deformity adjusted to special environmental conditions. But all the time, whether eating or talking, I noticed that his eye continually travelled up and down the stretch of street that was visible through the wire blinds. "'You haven't told me why you sent for me, sir,' I said, after waiting patiently for him to open the subject. "'I dare say you have guessed,' he replied. "'But we may as well thrash the matter out now.' You realize that you are running an enormous and unnecessary risk by going abroad with this man at your heels. Well, I don't suppose he's following me about from sheer affection. No. I thought it possible that he might be a plain-clothes policeman, but I have ascertained that he is not. Who he is we don't know but we have the strongest reasons for suspecting his intentions. There have been three very determined attempts on your life. They were all made with such remarkable caution and foresight that, though they failed, practically no traces have been left. Those attempts imply a strong motive, though to us an unknown one, and that motive, presumably, still exists. Your enemy may well be getting desperate, and may be prepared to take greater risks to get rid of you. And if he is, the chances are that he will succeed sooner or later. Murder isn't very difficult to a cool-headed man who means business. Then what do you propose, sir? I propose that you disappear from your ordinary surroundings and come and stay for a time at my chambers in the temple. This was no more than I had expected, but my jaw dropped considerably, notwithstanding. "'It's awfully good of you, sir,' I stammered, and so, to be sure, it was. "'But don't you think it would be simpler to turn the tables on this Johnny and shadow him?' 
an excellent idea jardine and one i may say that i am acting on at this moment but there isn't so much in it as you seem to think supposing we identify this man and even run him to earth what then we have nothing against him we know of no crime that has been committed we may suspect that the man whom you saw at hampstead had been murdered but we can't prove it we can't produce the body or even prove that the man was dead and we couldn't connect this person with the affair because nobody was known to be connected with it i should like to know who this man is but i don't want to put him on his guard and above all i can't agree to your going about as a sort of live bait to enable us to locate him by the way that man on the opposite side of the street is the one whom i selected as being probably your attendant apparently i was right as this is the third time he has passed do you recognize him i looked attentively at the uncharacteristic figure on the farther side of the street but could find nothing familiar in his appearance no i replied he doesn't look to me like the same man he is dressed differently that's nothing as he has been dressed differently on each occasion and that torpedo beard and full moustache are quite unlike though there's nothing in that either but the man looks different altogether distinctly taller for instance thorndyke chuckled good said he now look at his feet as he passes opposite did you ever see an instep set at that angle to the sole and does not your anatomical conscience cry out at a foot of that thickness yes by jove i exclaimed there's room for a double row of mitted tarsals it's a fake of some kind i suppose cork razors inside high-heeled boots through the glasses i could see that the boots gaped considerably at the instep as they will when there is a pad in sight as well as a foot but you notice also that the man is dressed for height he has a tall hat a long coat and his shoulders are obviously raised by padding i think there is very little doubt that he is our man it must be a dull job i remarked hanging about by the hour to see a man come out of a house very thorndyke agreed i am quite sorry for the worthy person especially as we are going to play him a rather shabby trick presently what are we going to do i asked we are going to let him in for one of the longest waits he has ever had i am afraid perhaps i had better give you the particulars of our modus operandi first i shall send down to the stand for a hansom which will draw up opposite the club and thereupon i have no doubt our friend will hurry down to the cab stand to be in readiness at any rate i shall let him get down to that end of the street before i do anything more then i shall take the liberty of putting on your coat and hat and go out to the cab with your suitcase in my hand i shall stand on the curb long enough to let our friend get a good view of my back i shall get into the cab give the driver the direction through the trap to drive to the hospital and pay the fare in advance why in advance i asked so that i shall not have to turn round and show my face when i get out at the hospital entrance i assume that your friend will follow me in another hansom also that he will alight at the outer gates whereas i shall drive into the courtyard right up to the main entrance so that he will merely see your hat coat and suitcase disappear into the building then as i say he will be in for an interminable vigil i have a lecture to give this afternoon and when i have finished i shall come away in a black overcoat and tall hat which are at this moment hanging up in the curator's room leaving your friend to wait for the reappearance of your coat hat and suitcase i only hope he won't wait too long why because he may wear out the patience of my assistant i have a plain-clothes man keeping a watch from the window above if your friend sets off in pursuit of your garments as i anticipate 
the plain-clothes man will go straight to the hospital and take up his post in the porter's lodge, which, as you know, commands the whole street outside the gates. And what have I got to do? First of all, you'll put your toothbrush in your pocket, never mind about your razor, and let me try on your hat, in case we have to pad the lining. Then, when you have seen your friend start off in pursuit, and are sure the coast is clear, you will make straight for my chambers and wait there for me. And supposing the chappie doesn't start off in pursuit? Supposing he twigs the imposture? Then the plain-clothes man will go out and threaten to arrest him for loitering with intent to commit a felony. That would soon move him on out of the neighbourhood, and the officer might accompany him some distance and try to get his address. Meanwhile, you would be off to King's Bench Walk. But wouldn't it be simpler to run the Johnny in, in any case? Then we should know all about him. No, it wouldn't do. The police wouldn't actually make an arrest without an information, and if they did proceed, they would want me to appear. That wouldn't suit me at all. Until we obtain some fresh evidence, I don't want this man to get any suspicion that the case is being investigated. And now I think the time has come for a move. Let us go to the cloakroom and see if your hat fits me sufficiently well. It was not a good fit, being just a shade small, but, as it was a soft felt, this was not a vital defect. The overcoat fitted well enough, though a trifle long in the sleeves, and when Thorndyke was fully arrayed in this borrowed plumage, his back view, so far as I could judge, was indistinguishable from my own. "'If you will take out your toothbrush and hand me your suitcase,' said he, "'I will send for a hansom, and then we will watch the progress of events from the dining-room window.' I handed him the green canvas case, and we returned to the dining-room, and there, when he had ordered the cab, we took up a position at the window, screened from observation by the wire blinds. "'Our friend,' said Thorndyke, "'was walking towards the right-hand end of the street when we saw him last. As the cab stand is at the left-hand end, we may hope to look upon his face once again.' As he spoke, the air was rent by the shriek of the cap whistle and the leading hansom began immediately to bear down on the club it had hardly come to rest at our door when a figure appeared from the opposite direction advancing at a brisk walk on our side of the road i recognized him instantly as the man to whom thorndyke had directed my attention and watched him closely as he approached to see if i could identify him with the man who had shadowed sylvia and me at the picture gallery but though he passed within a few yards of the window and I felt no doubt that he was the same man, I could trace no definite resemblance. It is true that while actually passing the club he averted his face somewhat, but I had a good view of him within an easy distance, and the face that I then saw was certainly not the face of the man at the gallery. The skilfulness of the make-up, assuming it to be really a disguise, was incredible, and I remarked on it to Thorndyke. Yes, he agreed, a really artistic make-up is apt to surprise the uninitiated. And that reminds me that Polton has instructions to make a few trifling alterations in your own appearance. I stared at him aghast. You don't mean to say, I exclaimed, that you contemplate making me up. We won't discuss the question now, he replied a little evasively. You talk it over with Polton. It is time for me to go now, as our quarry has considerately acted up to our expectations. He little knows what confusion of our plans he would have occasioned by simply staying at the other end of the street. The spy had, in fact, now halted opposite the cab stand and was apparently making some notes in a pocket-book, facing, meanwhile, in our direction. With a few parting instructions to me, Thorndyke picked up the suitcase and hurried out, and I saw him dart down the steps with his face turned somewhat to the right, and stand for a few seconds at the edge of the pavement with his back to the cab-stand, but in full view, looking at his watch as if considering some appointment. Suddenly he sprang into the cab, and, pushing up the trap, gave the driver his instructions and handed up the fare. At the same moment I saw the unknown shadower hail a hansom, and, scrambling to the footboard, 
give some brief directions to the driver. Then Thorndyke's cabman touched his horse with the whip, and away he went at a smart trot. But hardly had the cab turned the first corner, when the second hansom rattled past the club in hot pursuit. I was about to turn away from the window, when a tall, well-dressed man ran down the steps, and immediately signalled to the cab-stand with his stick. Thinking it probable that this was the plain-clothes policeman, I stopped to watch, and when I had seen him enter the cab and drive off in the same direction as the other two, I decided that the show was over, and that it was time for me to take my departure, which I did, after stuffing a couple of envelopes into the lining of Thorndyke's hat to prevent it from slipping down towards my ears. That my arrival at number 5A King's Bench Walk was not quite unexpected, I gathered not only from the fact that the oak stood wide open, revealing the inner door, but from the instantaneous way in which this latter opened in response to my knock, and something gleeful and triumphant in Mr. Polton's manner, as he invited me to enter, stirred my suspicions and aroused vague forebodings. He helped me out of my, or rather Thorndyke's, overcoat, and, having taken the hat from me, peered inquiringly into its interior and fished out the two envelopes, which he politely offered to me. Then, having disposed of his employer's property, he returned to confront me, and, wrinkling his countenance into a most singular and highly corrugated smile, he opened his mouth and spoke. "'So you've come, sir,' the doctor tells me, to take sanctuary for a time with us from the malice of your enemies.' "'I don't know about that,' I replied. "'But there is a cockeyed transformationist who seems to be dodging about after me, and Dr. Thorndyke thinks I'd better give him the go-by for the present.' "'And very proper, too, sir. Discretion is the better part of valour, as the proverb says, though I really could never see that it is any part at all. But no doubt our forefathers who made the proverb knew best. Did the doctor mention that he'd given me certain instructions about you?' "'He said that I was to talk over some question with you, but I didn't quite follow him. What were his instructions?' Polton rubbed his hands, and his face became more crinkly than ever. "'The doctor instructed me,' he replied, looking at me hungrily and obviously making a mental inventory of my features, "'to effect certain slight alterations in your outward personality.' "'Oh, did he?' said I. "'And what does he mean by that? Does he mean that you are to make me up as an old woman, or a nigger minstrel?' "'Not at all, sir,' replied Polton. "'Neither of those characters would be at all suitable. They would occasion remark, which it is our object to avoid.' and as to a negro minstrel, his presence in chambers would undoubtedly be objected to by the benches. But, I expostulated, why any disguise at all, if I am to be boxed up in these chambers? The chap he isn't likely to come and look through the keyhole. He wouldn't see anything if he did, said Polson. I fitted these locks. But, you see, sir, many strangers come to these chambers, and then, too, you might like to take a little exercise about the inn or the gardens. That would probably be quite safe if you were unrecognisable, but otherwise, I should think, inadmissible. And really, sir, he continued persuasively, if you do a thing at all, you may as well do it thoroughly. The doctor wishes you to disappear. Then disappear completely. Don't do it by halves. I could not but admit to myself that this was reasonable advice. Nevertheless, I grumbled a little sulkily. It seems to me that Dr. Thorndyke is making a lot of unnecessary fuss. It is absurd for an able-bodied man to be sneaking into a hiding-place and disguising himself like a runaway thief. "'I can offer no opinion on that, sir,' said Polton. "'But you're wrong about the doctor. He is a cautious man, but he's not nervous or fussy. You would be wise to act as he thinks best, I'm sure.' "'Very well,' I said. "'I won't be obstinate. When do you want to begin on me?' "'I should like,' replied Polton, brightening up wonderfully at my sudden submission, "'to have you ready for inspection by the time that the doctor returns. "'If agreeable to you, sir, I would proceed immediately.' "'Then in that case,' said I, "'we had better adjourn to the green room forthwith.' "'If you please, sir,' replied Polton. And with this, having opened the door and cautiously inspected the landing, he conducted me up the stairs to the floor above, the rooms of which appeared to be fitted as workshops and laboratories. In one of the former, which appeared to be Polton's own special den, I saw my watch hanging from a nail, with a rating-table pinned above it, 
and proceeded to claim it. "'I suppose, sir,' said Polton, reluctantly taking it from its nail and surrendering it to me, "'as you are going to reside on the premises and I can keep it under observation, you may as well wear it. The present rate is plus one point three seconds daily. And now I will trouble you to sit down on this stool and take off your collar.' I did as he bade me and, meanwhile, he turned up his cuffs and stood a little way off, surveying me as a sculptor might survey a bust on which he was at work. Then he fetched a large cardboard box, the contents of which I could not see, and fell to work. His first proceeding was to oil my hair thoroughly, part it in the middle, and brush it smoothly down either side of my forehead. Next he shaved off the outer third of each eyebrow, and, having applied some sort of varnish or adhesive, he proceeded to build up, with a number of short hairs, a continuation of the eyebrows at a higher level. The result seemed to please him amazingly, for he stepped back and viewed me with an exceedingly self-satisfied smirk. "'It is really surprising, sir,' said he, "'how much expression there is in the corner of an eyebrow. You look a completely different gentleman already.' "'Then,' said I, "'there is no need to do any more. We can leave it at this.' "'Oh, no, we can't, sir.' Polton replied hastily, making a frantic dive into the cardboard box. "'Begging your pardon, sir, it is necessary to attend to the lower part of the face, in case you should wish to wear a hat, which would cover the hair and throw the eyebrows into shadow.' Here he produced from the box an undeniable false beard, of the torpedo type, and approached me, holding it out as if it were a poultice. "'You are not going to stick that beastly thing on my face!' I exclaimed, gazing at it with profound disfavour. "'Now, sir,' protested Polton, "'pray be patient. We will just try it on, and the doctor shall decide if it is necessary.' With this he proceeded to affix the abomination to my jowl with the aid of the same sticky varnish that he had used previously, and, having attached a moustache to my upper lip, worked carefully round the edges of both with a quantity of loose hair, which he stuck on the skin with the adhesive liquid, and afterwards trimmed off with scissors. The process was just completed and he had stepped back once more to admire his work, when an electric bell rang softly in the adjoining room. "'There's the doctor,' he remarked. "'I'm glad we are ready for him. Shall we go down and submit our work for his inspection?' I assented readily, having some hopes that Thorndyke would veto the beard, and we descended together to the sitting-room, where we found that Jervis and his principal had arrived together. As to the former, he greeted my entrance by staggering back several paces with an expression of terror, and then seated himself on the edge of the table, and laughed with an air of enjoyment that was almost offensive, particularly to Polton, who stood by my side, rubbing his hands and smiling with devilish satisfaction. "'I assume,' Thorndyke said gravely, "'that this is our friend Jardine.' "'It isn't,' said Jervis. "'It's a shop-walker from Wallace's.' I recognized him instantly. "'Look here,' I said, with some heat. "'It's all very well for you to make me up like Charlie's aunt, and then jeer at me. But what's the use of it? The 5th of November's past.' "'My dear Jardine,' Thorndyke said, soothingly, "'you are confusing your sensations with your appearance. I dare say that make-up is rather uncomfortable, but it is completely successful.' and I must congratulate Polton, for the highest aim of a disguise is the utterly commonplace, and I assure you that you are now a most ordinary-looking person. Fetch the looking-glass from the office, Polton, and let him see for himself. I gazed into the mirror which Polton held up to me with profound surprise. There was nothing in the least grotesque or unusual in the face that looked out at me, only it was the face of an utter stranger and, as Thorndyke had said, a perfectly commonplace stranger, at whom no one would look twice in the street. Grudgingly, I acknowledged the fact, but still objected to the beard. "'Do you think it is really necessary, sir, in addition to the other disfigurements?' "'Yes, I do,' replied Thorndyke. "'It is only a temporary expedient, because, in a fortnight, your own beard will have grown enough to serve with a little artificial reinforcement and, he continued, as Polton retired with a gratified smile, I am anxious that your disappearance shall be complete. It is not only a question of your safety, although that is very urgent, and I feel myself responsible for you, 
as we are not appealing to the police. There are other issues. Assuming, as we do assume, that some crime has been committed, the lapse of time must inevitably cause some of the consequences of that crime to develop. If the man whose body you saw at Hampstead was really murdered, he must presently be missed and inquired for. Then we shall learn who he was, and perhaps we may gather what was the motive of the crime. Then your secret enemy will be left unemployed, and may produce some fresh evidence, for he can't wait indefinitely for your reappearance, and, finally, certain inquiries which I am making may set us on the right track. And, if they do, you must remember, Jardine, that you are probably the sole witness to certain important items of evidence, so you must be preserved in safety as a matter of public policy, apart from your own prejudices in favour of remaining alive. I didn't know that you were actually working at the case, I said. Have you been following up that man Gill of the Mineral Water Works? I followed him up to the vanishing point. He has gone and left no trace, and I have been unable to get any description of him. Then, said I, if it is allowable to ask the question, in what direction have you been making inquiries? I have been interesting myself, Thorndyke replied, in the other case, that of your patient Mr. Maddock, as the attacks on you seemed to be associated with his neighbourhood rather than with that of Hampstead. I have examined his will at Somerset House, and am collecting information about the persons who benefited by its provisions. Especially, I am making some inquiries about a legatee who lives in New York, and concerning whom I am rather curious. I can't go into further details just now, but you will see that I am keeping the case in hand, and you must remember that, at any moment, fresh information may reach me from other sources. My practice is a very peculiar one, and there are few really obscure cases that are not, sooner or later, brought to me for an opinion. And meanwhile I am to eat the bread of idleness here and wait on events. You won't be entirely idle, Thorndyke replied. We shall find you some work to do, and you will extend your knowledge of medico-legal practice. You write shorthand fairly well, don't you? Yes, and I can draw a little, if that is of any use. Both accomplishments are of use, and, even if they are not, we should have to exercise them for the sake of appearances. It will certainly become known that you are here, so we'd better make no secret of it, but find you such occupation as will account for your presence. And as you will have to meet strangers now and again, we must find you a name. What do you think of William Morgan Howard? It will do as well as any other, I replied. Very well, then. William Morgan Howard, let it be. And, in case you might forget your alias, as the crooks are constantly doing, we will drop the name of Jardine and call you Howard, even when we're alone. It will save us all from an untimely slip. To this arrangement also I agreed with a sour smile, and so, with some physical discomfort in the neighbourhood of the lower jaw, and a certain relish of the novelty and absurdity of my position, I placed myself, under the name of Howard, on the roster of Thorndyke's establishment. End of chapter 15